and Vegeta are gonna get their tails back. Beerus showcased unreal strength and destructive power against Frieza, I mean, it was both fascinating and also a grim reminder. A grim reminder that even if Goku and Vegeta continue on with Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego, they will never reach that level. They just can't defeat Whis and Beerus at their own game. Frieza tried it, but look what happened to him. Even though he was significantly stronger than the both of them, and so, while Beerus had gone to sleep, Goku and Vegeta gathered the Dragon Balls. Hey Kakarot, what is this inspiration you spoke of? Vegeta asked. I'm not so sure myself, but ever since our battle with Broly, then the way I unlocked my own unique Ultra Instinct, and then finally the way Frieza went out, all this time I've been feeling this odd sensation. Listen Vegeta, even though I don't know what it is right now, I can tell that there's another level within ourselves. We don't need to rely on anything other than our Saiyan potential, Goku replies. Hmm. You sure know how to say a lot without actually saying anything. Whatever, I don't need your inspiration anyway, Vegeta grins. And soon after, all the Dragon Balls are gathered and Shinron is summoned. What is it that I can do for you today, Shinron states. He'd been oddly informal recently. Just give us our tails back, Vegeta replies. Hey, come on, Vegeta, not just our tails. We need to bring back the tails of everyone, Goku intervenes. What? Are you serious? Even if Goten and Trunks can manage themselves, what if my daughter or your granddaughter wakes up in the middle of the night and basks in the glory of the full moon? Yeah, I'll never hear the end of that, Vegeta says. Oh, so what? You mean you can't look after an infant child? Is that what you're saying, Vegeta? Besides, you're leaving someone out. I really want Broly to be a part of this too, Goku says. He's gotten used to all Vegeta's smart retorts by now. They go through with a wish and just like that, Goku, Vegeta, Broly, Gohan, Trunks, Goten, Pan, and even Bulla. All the Saiyans, hybrid or not, have regained not only their tails, but reconnected with their natural disposition as well. Oh man, this feels like home, Vegeta says. Damn, right? It's been ages since I last had this thing behind me, Goku replies. Meanwhile, back at Planet Beerus, Whis was observing what Goku and Vegeta would do, considering how it's about time they start figuring things out on their own. He seems pleased with their decision to bring back their tails, though. That's right, Goku. You aren't an angel. You're a Saiyan. Now that you know how to use the Ultra Instinct, it's about time that you start leveraging your Saiyan potential again. And as for you, Vegeta, I truly wonder what path you'll take, Whis states. Even though it's only a nap, Beerus won't wake up for another 5 years or so, which gives Goku and Vegeta a lot of time to not only catch up, but also surpass him once and for all. As we pan back to planet Earth though, we can see that more than a few people are a little bit upset at their new tales. Gohan was giving a major lecture at a public university at the time, Goten was on a date, and well, Pan and Videl, they got invited to a big event as Mr. Satan's daughter and granddaughter. At least Trunks and Bulla didn't have it all that bad, I mean, he was just flying around in a tropical forest trying to cheer her up. All of them have questions, so they try and look for Goku and Vegeta, but the two Saiyans have already left the planet. So how about we go back a few moments ourselves and see where these two headed off to. So what's your plan now, Kakarot? Vegeta asks. I'm thinking of paying Broly a visit. I need a strong partner after all. I mean, the stronger the better, Goku replies. Vegeta doesn't even take that one to heart. I mean, ever since his battle with Black Frieza's Ultra Ego, he's had a lot on his mind. All right, do as you please. I was planning on paying a visit to Planet Sadala anyway, Vegeta states. Aw oh, man, now I want to go there too, Goku says. Nah, you just make sure Broly hasn't been seeing enough moons lately, Vegeta continues. Also, drop me off at Planet Beerus. I'll ask Whis for a ride there. Piccolo would bid the two Saiyans a farewell for the time being as they vanish before him. He's also the one that got stuck explaining the tail situation to everybody. Subsequently at Planet Beerus. Well, that was quick, we states. Oh nah, I just want you to drop me off at Planet Sadala, Vegeta says. Now feels like the right time to fulfill the promise I made to Kaba. Sure enough, Whis would oblige as soon as he saw the extraordinary amount of sweets and chocolates that Vegeta was carrying, it was ready to answer damn near any request they had. 
Well, I guess this is it for right now, Vegeta. I'll see you later, Goku says as he sticks out his hand for a fist bump. Next time I see you, you're not even going to recognize me, Vegeta says as he follows through with the fist bump. And then the two finally split up. Goku would of course use his instant transmission and appear right in front of Broly within seconds. Now for better or worse, Broly had just seen a moon a few instances ago, so he was trying his best to contain himself but his own natural essence was too insane. Goku watches as the beast evolves into a massive Uzaru and he laughs. Not because of the size of Broly right now or anything, but because of the color. You see, the funny thing is, however, Broly has stumbled upon something that this timeline hasn't seen yet. This is a golden Uzaru, and right now, Goku wasn't too sure about the inspiration he had when he decided on wishing their tails back before, but seeing this kind of assures him that he made a good decision. Alright Broly, I'll take you on, Goku declares as he transforms into Super Saiyan Blue. He knows that regardless of the outcome of this abrupt battle, he'll be able to finally grasp the true essence of that inspiration. Broly hardly shares the same sentiment though, I mean he punches a hole straight through the entire planet and slaps a big 2 minute time limit on it. Goku is actually pretty caught off guard by this so he has to grab Chile and Limo pretty quickly and drop them off on a planet almost 3 solar systems away just to keep them outside of any potential blast radius. I see you still don't know how to calm down Broly. That Uzaru transformation is going to bring the worst out of you more than anyone else but I know that the both of us can still go much higher together Goku states and then this unconventional battle would begin. Broly's Uzaru state was ruthlessly unstable I mean he was giving off vibrations so intense the very orbital motion of the nearby planets was starting to get disrupted at consistent intervals. Broly's presence was effectively changing the rhythm of the nearby surroundings in real time. Goku has absolutely no idea how to proceed here, especially since he has to move in coherence with his surroundings as well. Things will only spiral out of control if he ends up having to evolve into an Uzaru as well. Not good. Feels like I'm fighting with my eyes closed, Goku says. So far, he's landed about 10 solid attacks. He's disrupted Broly's balance a couple of times and he's even stepped on his tail once, but even though he hasn't gotten hit himself, Broly's pressure is constantly pushing him away. Goku steps things up further by entering true Ultra Instinct and then following it up with Super Saiyan but it takes far too much concentration. Definitely not effective since he's already trying so hard to steer clear of the moons. As for the time remaining until the planet explodes, all that's left is just about 70 seconds. It's now a race for time because within this next 70 seconds, Goku has to figure something out. Plus, there's also no telling if Broly can even survive in space. Vegeta, on the other hand, has finally arrived on planet Sadala. Whis would pretty much take his leave immediately because he has some sweets and chocolates to attend to, and this is kinda awkward, but luckily, Vegeta would find a familiar Saiyan right away. He doesn't run into Kaba first, though. It's Kale, and something about her just pisses him off. Meanwhile, something clicks with Goku back at the battle with Broly. With less than a minute remaining until the destruction of this planet, he's now realized that choosing to not look at the moon is running away. The whole point of this was harnessing their Saiyan potential, so what was there to be afraid of? And so Goku would turn around, bask in that moonlight as he absorbed every ray with his eyes wide open, but before he knew it his own body would start pulsating uncontrollably as well as a new transformation took place. Goku would then black out, retreating to the furthest subconscious of his mind but on the outside world, another golden Uzaru had just been born, only this one may be able to harness the power of Ultra Instinct, however the question still remains, which one of these Saiyans is actually going to be able to tame the beast and harness that coveted power of Super Saiyan 4? When Goku uses instant transmission to go to Broly's planet, his Uzaru transformation has already begun. Goku watches in anticipation as the beast evolves into a rather uncanny golden Uzaru. The shades of green are imminent and the surge of power is impeccable, but Broly can't contain himself. He punches a hole through the planet which leaves them with about only 2 minutes until it fully explodes. For the most part, Goku couldn't do anything against this raging Uzaru. His Super Saiyan Blue form definitely wasn't enough and even when he tries to mix his true Ultra Instinct with Super Saiyan, he ends up falling short. 
it simply requires way too much concentration to maintain Ultra Instinct together with Super Saiyan. But one thing that doesn't require any concentration at all is hitting that like button down below and subscribing to the channel. So be sure to do that if you guys haven't already and you are enjoying content like this. But this lack of concentration is especially blatant in this case considering how Goku has to watch out for the moon as well. And yet, when the time remaining is less than a minute and Goku's survival instincts have begun to scream, the sheer perplexity of the situation leads him to an obvious yet rough conclusion. If he has already decided to leverage his Saiyan potential, then there's no reason for him to run away from the moon. Exactly. Goku calms down for a moment and witnesses the moon in all of its naked glory and of course, he too would transform into a great ape. Right there, at that very moment, Goku evolves into an Izaru for the first time in over two decades. The entire experience has an odd sense of nostalgia to it. He thought he'd have to use some kind of a gimmick upon himself to not go on a rampage, but he seems surprisingly calm, at least calmer than Broly. Broly doesn't seem pleased though. When he sees another Uzaru, he tries to punch him right in the face, but Goku manages to neatly dodge that attack. The time remaining until the planet's destruction was now only 30 seconds. 29? 28. Goku uses his enhanced spatial awareness to look for a nearby planet where he can just warp together with Broly, but his instincts keep screaming, which hinders his concentration. His body's natural inclination is to survive, and now that he's the closest to his natural disposition, he's getting held back by his own nature. Damn it, just calm down, man. You too, Broly, Goku screams and takes a deep breath finally. With 20 seconds remaining, he's finally calmed down. Goku then goes back to the very basics, task focus. He decides to only focus on making sense of all of this tremendous raw power, and then it finally clicks. The inspiration he had while watching Beerus destroy Frieza, the fascination he had while witnessing Broly's great ape transformation. All of it comes together into a singular, condensed state of mind which gives him the indication of a superior transformation. However, as for the time remaining until the complete destruction of the planet, it's already zero seconds. There's a massive flash of light and the planet then blows into smithereens with nothing left whatsoever. Total mass destruction. Whis was observing the battle while enjoying his sweets and chocolates, and it takes a minute for the bits and pieces of the planet to clear away, but then he notices that neither Goku nor Broly are anywhere to be seen. What exactly happened? In just 20 seconds, Goku managed to condense himself into a more versatile version of the Great Ape. In doing so, he even went further beyond and reached an unprecedented transformation. He then instantly punches Broly senseless until he's knocked out, and then uses his instant transmission to go to a certain planet. Consider me surprised because it's King Kai's planet, and the first thing he does when he sees them is freak out. Oh, hey King Kai, how you doing? Goku says. Not good now that you're here. Yes, why are you here and why did you bring him? King Kai replies. Goku pauses for a minute and then states, I don't know. When I had to instant transmission, my body just instinctively decided on your planet. It wasn't until after we were here that I realized what happened. Well, at least you didn't bring any explosives. Hey Bubbles, get this man a mirror, King Kai replies. Goku looks in the mirror and is stunned by his change in appearance. Stark red fur covering his body, his hairstyle has visibly changed and raw strength seems astronomical. Wow, what the heck do you think this is, King Kai? Goku asks. Another weird transformation? But King Kai first demands a brief explanation on what actually happened here. He explains the things with the tails, Broly's transformation, and everything. He then also asks King Kai to maybe heal Broly since he had to deal with the worst of it. King Kai obliges. Goku then starts wondering about the name of his new transformation. Saiyan Red? Super Monkey Saiyan? Maybe Super Saiyan Grade 8. Why not just name it Super Saiyan 4? It's just a Super Saiyan form, right? King Kai states. You know what? That's actually a pretty great idea. Super Saiyan 4 it is, Goku proudly declares. Meanwhile, on planet Sadala, 
Vegeta orders Kale to go and get him Kaba. She freaks out, but she does as she's told. Kaba is genuinely excited to see Vegeta. It's been a good two years since the day they first met, and now he finally gets to introduce King Sadala to Vegeta. They take off to the king's castle right away. Uh, hey Vegeta, mind if I ask what's up with the tail? I don't recall seeing that at the Tournament of Power, Kaba asks. Yeah, it's new. I'll explain everything when we meet your king, Vegeta states. They would soon enter the capital. Kaba signals to a few nearby Saiyans that a guest is here and so preparations are instantly made. Other Saiyans are gathered outside the castle to welcome him, but Vegeta being Vegeta, he just walks right through them. And there on the throne sits the mighty Saiyan who rules planet Sadala. King Sadala and Prince Vegeta have finally met for the very first time. This is Prince Vegeta, I assume, King Sadala boldly asks. Never mind that, you can just address me as Vegeta. I'm not the prince of your people, Vegeta replies. Very well then, in that case, you are free to address me as Sadala as well, the king replies as he shakes Vegeta's hand. This catches plenty of the royal retainers off guard, some of them even start fuming, but Vegeta remains unfazed by the tension. I see some of your people are rather cautious of my presence here. So, how about it, king? What do you say to having a duel with a Saiyan from another universe? Vegeta makes a very bold request here. Sure enough, the king of planet Sadala is a proud warrior much like Vegeta himself. He agrees to the battle and an arena is prepared. It does take some time to get everything in order though since Vegeta was especially meticulous about having as many Saiyans as spectators as possible. Kaba, Kalifla, Kale, and tens of thousands of other Saiyans gather in the arena even the young Prince Sadala is attending. Now, I'm already aware of your extraordinary might, Vegeta, but in the name of my pride as the king, I will not let my people down by losing to you, King Sadala declares, and then proceeds to transform into a Super Saiyan. Except it doesn't stop there. The king follows it up with a Super Saiyan 2 evolution, and if that wasn't enough, he takes it even further beyond and transform into what can be considered Super Saiyan 3 state, at least on planet Sadala. Seeing this, Vegeta just burst into laughter. Very impressive, King. You managed to come this far in just two years. I'm glad Kaba didn't keep you out of the loop, Vegeta states, but as he said this, he notices a grim vibe overtake the arena. King Sadala then states, Vegeta, it wasn't just training or battles that got me this far. It was the circumstances. These past few months have been somewhat unpleasant. What do you mean, Vegeta asks calmly. We'll talk after this battle. Now, come on. Bring out your best transformation, he demands. Oh, so you want to see my strongest transformation. Suddenly, the entire environment around them begins to crumble as Vegeta almost lets out his ultra ego state. He stops himself, though, because that isn't how he should be going about it. He remembers that just like Kakarot, he needs to go back to his roots as well in order to find the next level. Now in the wake of this realization, how will Vegeta proceed against this battle with King Sadala? He just stopped himself from completing his Ultra Ego transformation. Every Saiyan in the vicinity was surprised, even Prince Sadala couldn't contain his excitement. That was so cool, he shouts. The King hears his son's words and laughs. So why did you stop, Vegeta? What's wrong, he asks. Nah, it's nothing. I'm just trying something new, Vegeta replies. Having said that, he instantly unleashes his own Super Saiyan 2 state and their battle commences. The king has the edge, but Vegeta knows that it can't last. The Super Saiyan 3, that is. It simply expends way too much power for it to be useful against someone who is just simply stronger than you. Sure, Vegeta was only using Super Saiyan 2, but Unlike the king, he had seen way too much war and battles in his own lifetime. Even if Kale and Kalifla shocked everyone with their fusion in the Tournament of Power, right here right now, on planet Sadala, everyone could instinctively feel that this guy Vegeta is transcendent. But the one who could feel it the most weren't Saiyans like Kaba and Kalifla and Kale who had already seen him fight before, no, it was the king. Without even using his God Key or Ultra Ego, Vegeta was still strong enough to overwhelm everyone in his presence. What's wrong, King? 
You seem out of breath, Vegeta ass. Even if Kaba had never told me anything about you, I would have known Vegeta. We have lived very different lives, but I won't concede. If you want to end this battle, you'll just have to knock me out, the king answers. For some reason, the king's answer resonated with Vegeta's very soul. His mind instantly goes back to when he saw Beerus step onto his father's head, when Frieza tormented his entire race, when he first lost to Kakarot. Everything that's happened since then and even what's gonna happen next, how he will soon surpass both Beerus and Frieza. Vegeta would grin. Very well then, you've earned yourself a defeat, he states. Who said anything about defeat? Listen, Vegeta, you are strong. The strongest man I've ever seen, but if I allow myself to give up, even for a mere moment, I will have forsaken my own Saiyan soul, the king declares as he lets out another wave of energy. He wasn't done yet. Vegeta laughs and proceeds to humor the king. Normally, a Super Saiyan 3 gradually starts to wear down as the battle drags on, but somehow King Sadala was different. His tenacity and focus just kept getting sharper and sharper, or to put it in simpler terms, he was still growing throughout the battle. This sort of back and forth fight continues for a few more hours until it's finally dusk out. Vegeta's tail, which was wrapped around his armor until now, suddenly tingles. Everyone else would notice this as well. Damn it, why do you guys have like seven moons, Vegeta screams as he begins to transform into the golden Uzaru. Being completely surrounded by moons with no obstructions in sight, there was almost no way for him to escape this moonlight. Well, whatever, it's not like I can't control this transformation. I'll just explain the situation later. They all begin to step back as they witness the emergence of this massive beast. What is the meaning of this, Prince Vegeta? So you have your tail, the king asks? Wait, what? How do you know about the tails, Vegeta says before his Zaru transformation completes? Now he was a singular monstrosity, standing tall in front of all of these civilized Saiyans, waiting and ready to test King Sadala with the full extent of his own Saiyan powers. Meanwhile, back on King Kai's planet, Broly has just woken up after taking a nice five hour long nap. He looks around all confused, wondering if he's still in some weird dream and that's when Goku appears before him with, of course, a mouthful of food. The only thing increasingly unusual about this is how he's still in his Super Saiyan 4 state. Oh, hey Broly, so what do you think of my Super Saiyan 4, Goku asks, but Broly just wants to know the whereabouts of Chile and Limo. Goku goes completely pale for a minute as he recalls how they still might be on that random planet where he dropped them off on, so he quickly goes to pick them up. One look at these guys and you can tell that they are not in their best condition, probably from the harsh environment of that planet that Goku just dropped them off on, but nonetheless, no one's hurt and Broly is pleased to see his buddies again. While Goku asks King Kai if there's a space or dimension where he and Broly can fight freely, the hell are you asking me for when you have Whis, King Kai sincerely replies, and that's kinda touche, and before Goku could even appropriate his reply, Whis has already appeared before them. Wow, you are speed, Goku says. And you, Goku? You look completely different now, Whis replies. Yeah, I know, right, Goku affirms? Whis then takes them both to the nameless planet where the Tournament of Destroyers took place. It seems like Goku's a fan of this spot considering how he had a great time during the Universe 6 vs Universe 7 tournament, but he still asks, why here? Why not just go to the hyperbolic time chamber where Frieza got to train for 10 years? So Whis replies, Do you remember what happened the last time Broly went all out? Him and Gogeta momentarily shattered the boundaries of the universe. Which means that you guys have already moved past the stage where you could just enter the hyperbolic time chamber and train. If you were to do that now, you'll just permanently mess up that dimension and well, we can't have that. Whis would excuse himself after saying this, leaving both Goku and Broly all alone on the nameless planet with no food whatsoever. Goku looks around, notices the lack of food and life around them, pauses and says, well, can't be all bad, right Broly? At least we got a little bit of moonlight shining. Aw, oh, shit. So while Goku deals with that again, going back to Vegeta, his golden Uzaru transformation was a major surprise to everyone, but 
just like how they were surprised by Vegeta, Vegeta was also taken aback by the king's words. Hey, why do you know about the tales? I thought the universe six Saiyans just didn't have them, Vegeta asks. The king hears this, leaves the ground, and flies up to Vegeta's face. Now that I take a closer look, what happened to your ear, Vegeta, he asks. Forget it, a guy that I hate ripped it off. Anyways, tell me more about the Saiyans of this universe, just what the heck happened, Vegeta states. Never in his wildest dreams could the king have ever imagined that he'd be having this conversation while looking a literal Uzaru in the face, but alas, here we are. Alright, I'll answer your question. But first off, the Saiyans of Universe 6 also used to have tales. It was a long time ago. Long before me or any of the other Saiyans on this planet were even alive. We used to be a ruthless species. Warriors who stopped at nothing to achieve their goals. This ultimately came back to bite us in the back because one day, a wizard who foresaw his death by the hands of a Saiyan beast gathered these magical orbs and wished for all of our tales to be purged away. I wasn't so sure about the authenticity of this story. I thought maybe it was just a legend and Saiyans never really had tales to begin with, but seeing you and your transformation, Vegeta, confirms this. We had tales as well, but we were deprived of them. It may have happened a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. I don't know, but I'm glad that I was able to confirm the authenticity of this legend because now it can be passed down to every Saiyan on this planet, the king states. Vegeta would listen silently and idly, hanging on to every word the king says. Of course the universe six Saiyans have a history as well. That's what he thinks, but then he wonders what would have happened if they still had their tales. Would they have been more like the Saiyans in Universe 7? I mean, who knows? Vegeta notices that the king is already coughing up blood from having used the Super Saiyan 3 transformation for so long, he realizes this has gone on far too long already and that it's time to just end this for good now. He begins by trying to revert himself back to his normal stature, but gets caught off guard by a sudden wave of inspiration. This sensation. What is this? Just how much higher can we get, Kakarot? Vegeta laughs to himself as he also begins to transform. Meanwhile, as Chapter 3 of What If Goku and Vegeta Wish Their Tales Back comes to a close, we would see on a distant planet that an old wizard is awaiting his conjuring to come through, and who could possibly be more optimal of a pick to dispose of a very troublesome Saiyan with a tail now than the most decorated assassin in the entire multiverse? So sure, there's no doubt that the history of Universe 6 is not the same as the history of Universe 7. The contrast can easily be seen in the current states of their respective Earths. Of course, the same can be said about the Saiyans of Universe 6. They neither have their tails, nor are they as ruthless as the ones from Universe 7, but was it always like that? No. A few centuries ago, an old wizard simply gathered the walls and wished for the Saiyan's tails to be purged. He did this in the wake of a certain premonition, a premonition that showed him his own death by the hands of a Saiyan beast. From that point onward, the Saiyan race was never the same. They no longer transformed and wreaked havoc in the middle of the night, and the ones who still sought violence disappeared during these long waves of time. And the ones who remained realized that to preserve the Saiyan race, they knew they had to make sure to go down below this video and hit the like button because we are going to need 4,000 likes for part 4 of what if Goku and Vegeta wish their tails back. And looking at the work you guys put in on the first two videos, well, need I say more. And now back to the present. It's happened again. A Saiyan with a tail has transformed into an Uzaru in the middle of the night, but this one was capable. This one didn't lose himself to his primitive desires for war and chaos. This was Vegeta, a warrior from the seventh universe and as far as the Saiyans of this universe were concerned, he alone was transcendent. When King Sadala tells him about how the Saiyans of this universe lost their tails all those hundreds of years ago, Vegeta was speechless. He had nothing to say in reply. He just listened to this in silence while the king spat out blood because of his serious overuse of the Super Saiyan 3 form. He was still in his Uzaru state, but seeing the king all bent out of shape causes Vegeta to act. 
He wants to finish this fight so that he can go have a long talk with the king about not only their history, but their future as well. Although just then, he receives a call. Not from another person, but from himself. His own instincts call out to him. He would see visions of his own Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Blue, and then Ultra Ego. Vegeta was already too strong. Just like Goku, he had already reached levels of power that are unfathomable to the average Saiyan, and so his own instincts begin to reach out to him and show him a new light. A sudden sensation would begin to overwhelm the prince as he consciously tries to compress his own Uzaru state. He knows exactly what his body wants him to do. He's just answering the call. All of the Saiyans of Universe 6 can only watch in awe and fascination as they witness the massive beast transform into the single coolest thing they had ever seen in their lives. In a matter of moments and in between aggressive illuminating lights, Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta would be born as well. Well, well. I wouldn't say this is stronger than Ultra Ego, but this isn't half bad. It looks better and I get to keep my eyebrows, Vegeta laughs. Absolutely amazing, the king exclaims. So this is the power of the Saiyan tail. But you must be careful, Vegeta. Now that you're here, he'll make a move. Oh, and who might that be, Vegeta asks. That wizard, he's still alive, the king replies. And sure enough, the wizard had already hired a legendary hitman to keep tabs on the situation and who knows, he may already be watching. The battle between Vegeta and the king continues and ends within the next 30 seconds. Against the enhanced agility and destructive power of Super Saiyan 4, the already worn out king didn't stand a chance. And at this point, all it took was a single punch to the gut to knock the king unconscious. Vegeta had gained the respect of the Saiyans who disapproved of him at first, but well, he still remained in battle mode. Maybe it was those same Saiyan instincts, maybe it was just a hunch, but he could feel the presence of danger nearby, but before he could realize what was going on, he had already been hit. What? Vegeta screams. Everyone else had been taken off guard as well. I'm surprised you managed to withstand that. I see. You too have grown hit states as he now enters the battlefield to the shock of all of the Saiyans around here as only Vegeta was able to notice him prior. Now that there were no rules restricting him from killing his opponents, hit was insanely strong. Vegeta thinks on his feet and asks the big question. So just tell me who sent you here and it better not be Kakarot. But Hit chooses to remain silent. As for Vegeta, his instincts were screaming at him right now. He knew that this is not an opponent he can fight in his Super Saiyan 4 state. This is perfect. Now I have someone to gauge the limits of this transformation up against, he exclaims and plunges forward at razor fast speed. Hit stops time and shifts a little bit to the right so that Vegeta misses him, but when he resumes time, Vegeta instantly diverges to the left. Just heads or tails and Vegeta lost. And once again, the moment he readjusts his motion, he's already been hit. The fight's only just begun, but Hit has already landed two deadly blows that were meant to take the kill. This is Hit we're talking about here, and for the past 1000 years, if you guys remember, he's carried out a stupid number of assassinations, never failing once. I mean, he's the greatest assassin you could ask for. And now that same assassin is after Vegeta, but this time he's able to kill him. All right, I see you're not interested in exchanging words. Well, come on, then I'll pay you. Just tell me who hired you before I kill you for good, Vegeta declares, but the only response he would get is silence again. It's the darkest period of the night, and this is when things would get serious. Vegeta instinctively continues to guard his vitals while his arms, legs, and back get absolutely smothered by an insane barrage of punches. Come on, Mr. Vegeta, use all of your power. If this continues, you're going to quite literally die, Kaba shouts, while Vegeta bears the weight of a disgusting blow to his face. Meanwhile, on planet Champa, Vados would contact Whis. Are you sure it was a good idea to let Vegeta roam free in Universe 6, she asks. Well, it was kind of his idea, so I just dropped him off here. Why do you ask, he replies. I'm afraid he's about to get himself killed, Bato says. Oh? I better watch this. Let me switch to my crystal ball, Wee says. 
Vados just face palms and then replies, listen, the worst offender in the history of Universe 6 was a Saiyan. Not even King Sadala is aware of it, but the Saiyan race itself has enemies. They're out to get him. So when Vegeta dies, which is definitely going to happen here, just don't ask me to bring him back to life because if he dies here in Universe 6, you will no longer have the authority to resurrect your precious student, Whis. Whis would think for a moment, pondering everything she had just said to him, but in reply, he would just smirk and say, Oh, you don't have to worry. It's still far too soon for Vegeta to die. I mean, his ascent has only just begun. Going back to the battle, Vegeta continues to withstand lethal blow after lethal blow somehow. How long are you planning on dragging this out? Just give up, Hit says, finally breaking his silence. Come on, dude, Vegeta replies. We've already fought before and you still act like you don't know me? I know. That's why I said just give up and fight me at your best already. I have another job lined up for later today, Hit states. Vegeta would just laugh. Yes, what Hit said was true. Super Saiyan 4 is mad cool and it seems like Vegeta would agree, but it does slightly fall short in the face of what he was prior. Not to mention, Hit is still in the dark about Ultra Ego. You're right, I'm holding back, but it's not because I'm underestimating you. It's only because I wanted to properly feel this transformation out before taking things to the next level, but now, since you're in such a rush, Vegeta declares, then as light spills out all over the horizon, Vegeta's power starts sending ripples of energy in every direction. All this time, he wasn't just letting Hit abuse him as a punching bag, no. You guys probably already have a good idea what this was about. He was trying something. Vegeta wanted to know exactly where the Super Saiyan Force transformation stood. He wanted to gain a more nuanced understanding of his own body so that he can then improve and adapt. The analysis was finally done and so Vegeta was about to go all out. A crippling purple aura emerges within him as his presence itself begins to shine under the radiance of daybreak. As light breaks the darkness, this form is my instrument. I have no limits, Vegeta declares as he finally reveals his strongest state yet. A stark combination of his beastly Super Saiyan 4 form and destructive Ultra Ego state. His fiery purple aura set the entire arena ablaze. The Saiyans had absolute respect and honor for their king. They were always ready to give their lives for the safety of him, but this felt different. Just one look at Vegeta and every Saiyan in the vicinity knew this man needed no protection. If Vegeta was transcendent before, now he had truly become unrivaled. Incredible. Once again, the growth of you Saiyans infatuates me. Or maybe that's just why I was asked to assassinate you in the first place, it says. Honestly, Vegeta says, brushing his shoulders off, I wanted to spend a little bit more time with my Saiyan transformations before going back to the God Key, but I guess I wouldn't be able to do any of that as a dead man now, would I? Very well then. Hit the infallible, huh? Are you prepared, Vegeta declares, and then their battle would begin. From there on out, the fight was so extraordinarily fast that most Saiyans couldn't even see who was getting hit and who was doing the hitting. Not all had an untrained eye though. Kaba, Kalifla, Kale as well as the son of King Sadala remain focused on following the movements of these two legendary forces. The king would finally regain consciousness as well eventually. His personal guards escort him to a temporary throne and then immediately prepare him a drink. I see. So he has already made his move. However, hiring Hit must have cost him a fortune. I wonder what actually happened in the past. Just what did our ancestors do? We pride ourselves on being a peaceful race, so why do we have so many enemies, the king says to himself, slamming his fist into the wall. As for the battle, Hit was still on the offensive for the most part, but Vegeta was growing in real time. With each blow, he was getting faster, stronger, and more resilient. He was improving on the fly at a rate so fast that it actually reminded him of Broly a little bit. You should rejoice, Vegeta. Out of all of the assassinations I've carried out over the past 1,000 years, you're the only one who has survived beyond the one minute point. Even your friend Goku barely lasted after I landed that finishing blow, Hit says. Ha, you say that, but the last time I checked, 
Kakarot survived that encounter with you hit. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that means you no longer have a perfect track record, Vegeta replies and follows it up with a punch so unequivocally fast that not even the time skip could slow it down enough for Hit to dodge or even block it in time. It bypasses all of that and hits Hit like a truck. The sheer weight of this disgusting punch leaves a permanent mark in his gut. Hit tries his hardest to keep himself from budging from the spot where he was standing, but around 3 seconds later, his body finally caught up and realizes just how hard he had been hit. Hit staggers and then collapses to the ground. Vegeta instantly disappears from sight and then reappears to Hit's left to finish this with a deadly kick to the neck, but Hit manages to recover and block it just in time. Yeah, I think it's safe to say Vegeta had gotten exponentially stronger during this fight, but it'll still take a lot more than this for him to completely overpower and kill the strongest assassin in Universe 6. Meanwhile, on the planet where the Tournament of Destroyers took place, Goku's lifeless body is seen lying on the ground while a possessed Broly takes off for someone else. He was dripping with not only blood, but an insane lust for chaos. In the wake of Vegeta's Ozaru transformation in Universe 6, an old wizard sent a certain assassin to kill him because, for what it's worth, he had a premonition a long time ago which told him that he would die by the hands of a Saiyan beast. In fact, he's the one who deprived Universe 6 Saiyans of their tails in the first place. Of course, the assassin, or should I say the hitman he sent to kill Vegeta, is Hit. Hit would arrive right after Vegeta evolved into Super Saiyan 4, and it wasn't until Vegeta figured out how to use Ultra Ego together with Super Saiyan 4 that he finally started to match up to Hit, surprisingly. Right now, they're pretty equal despite the fact that Hit is really out here trying to kill Vegeta. Meanwhile, Whis had dropped off Goku and Broly on a certain planet which had plenty of moonlight, but during the amount of time it took Vegeta to figure out both Super Saiyan 4 and how to use Ultra Ego together, something happened that ended with Goku's demise. He can't move, he can't think, he's barely even conscious. The best he can do is see from the corners of his eyes. That's right, all he really maintains is his vision while he's forced to watch Broly fly off in front of him. Now, if you guys ever heard of chaos, well, this guy Broly right here, he was dripping with it. What led Broly's spirit astray wasn't thirst for battle or thirst for growth. No, it was thirst for absolute pure chaos. Just unadulterated lust that couldn't be controlled. He's now a monstrous force of nature, fully capable of overwhelming people into submission with just the glint in his eyes. He's a beast who can flatten entire planets into wastelands, just by bypassing them. Around 10,000 years from now, he'll be remembered as Broly the Primal Beast. You guys remember that one. So what happened to him during the course of this one night? What exactly happened in these past eight hours that led to such an astonishing finale? Well, let's go back eight hours earlier and see for ourselves. Goku wasn't at all pleased with the obvious lack of food here, but he didn't mind the moonlight. However, it only took him about 10 seconds to realize what this moonlight actually implied here. He may himself have already been in his Super Saiyan 4 form, but Broly was not. Broly's body was still quite unstable because of their earlier night, and the moonlight not only reignited Broly's Wuzaru transformation, it also reminded him of his instincts of sheer turmoil during his most recent monkey evolution. As the saying goes, the beast within definitely awakened. But no, it didn't just awaken here. It was enraged. And so Broly's body was set ablaze. Yes, he evolved into an Uzaru thanks to the moonlight, but unlike last time when he was just mindlessly destroying things, he's a lot more intentional and methodical with his approach now, which is way more scary. There's nothing preventing him from causing an unprecedented level of chaos within the universe, or maybe even beyond this universe. Goku knew that this Broly is dangerous, but still, he also knew that it's his responsibility to set him straight. Listen Broly, you really shouldn't look at your friends with eyes like that, Goku says as he stared right into Broly's killer eyes. Little did he know Broly's vision was red and from where he was standing, Goku looked like an annoyance, a bug even, a strong one though. Broly's primal side would take over and he does exactly what he did the last time he transformed. He punches a hole straight through this planet. Only this time, it doesn't work. 
Despite the fact that he had enough strength to completely destroy this planet with a single blow, he couldn't even put a dent in it somehow. Just, what's with this planet, Broly instinctively thinks. He doesn't understand why his punch didn't just pulverize this whole thing. Goku laughs. Ah, so this is why Whis dropped us here of all places. This really brings back memories, Goku says. Forget it, Broly. This planet wouldn't budge no matter what you do to it. It's impossible because what you're standing on right now is a literal super Dragon Ball. There's no way you're going to be able to shatter this thing. Broly seems confused and scratches his head, but one thing's for sure. He didn't like Goku running his mouth. Instantly, he ignores his massive stature, moves at an almost inconceivable level of speed, practically teleports right above Goku, and then uses the weight of his existence to land a blow from above. Goku saw this coming though, and for a moment, it seemed like he could easily evade it, but just as he tried to get out of the way, he felt himself being sucked back in. So as a last resort, he attempts to just block Broly's attack. Unfortunately, this was probably the worst thing he could have chose to do. Broly's attack defied common sense. Goku bore the full weight of that attack and there was a specific point where it became too much for him. His body lands on the ground and quite literally bounces up and down a few times. Goku's ears would ring really loud. He would fail to notice that his back had been completely crushed, shattered. This sort of one-sided assault continued for a while and every time Goku tried to evade or attack, he'd end up experiencing resistance almost as if existence itself wasn't on his side. But through it all, Goku never lost consciousness somehow. His bones were getting shattered by the second and every fiber of his being was screaming in pain, but he maintained his Super Saiyan 4 state. That was the one thing he wanted to elongate for as long as possible. I guess this is what Whis was talking about. Right now, Broly is bending space and time to his will, or should I say his desire for chaos. It's strong enough to bend the surroundings. What a monster you've become, Broly. I can't fathom how strong you would be as a Super Saiyan God or even a Super Saiyan 4, Goku states. He was basically only running on pure adrenaline at this point, and it wouldn't be strange if he were to pass out at any second right now. Goku knew this more than anybody, and yet, his mind was still focused on that one thing, to find a way to win. His ears may be ringing so hard that he can't hear the sound of his bones crushing, but Goku was still ready. He uses the last of his life fumes to unleash Ultra Instinct on top of Super Saiyan 4. This would allow him to momentarily enter a level beyond what Broly could manipulate. Goku had transcended, and for what it's worth, he wanted to land a few solid blows on Broly as well, so he does just that. He kicks Broly's right foot and makes him stumble. Then, right as Broly is falling down, he kicks his back so hard that Broly's massive body levitates for a couple of seconds before falling down. It doesn't seem like Goku's letting up here though. He keeps kicking and punches all the while actually dodging Broly's attacks. He doesn't have a lot of time left till his body just completely collapses. However, he has enough energy to discipline Broly now that he has the edge. Though it can't last. Broly's lust for chaos had only just begun. He cannot allow the first person who stands in his way to be his end. Or at least that's how the story went in the head of this rampant beast. Goku was drained, tired, and burnt out, but every time he landed an attack of his own, you bet Broly felt it. Still, Goku was unaware of what was about to come. If Broly's unprecedented power allowed him to reach that next level of existence, then there is most definitely a new level to Broly's power that's yet to be revealed. In simpler words, every time Goku was hitting Broly, he was gambling with the possibility that this beast is still dormant. Goku was aware, but he was also curious. He was fascinated by Broly's potential as a Saiyan and curious of what's next in his evolution. Luckily, he didn't have to wait that long because by this point, Broly had had enough. He knew that his Uzaru state was making him an easier target for Goku because of his massive stature and so, in an attempt to create a more agile stature, Broly would accidentally create his own Super Saiyan 4 form. Or did he? Good job, Broly. Now you also must have come back to your senses, right? No, wait, wait a minute. That isn't Super Saiyan 4, Goku states. And he was right. 
Broly didn't transform into a Super Saiyan 4. Why would he? His Uzaru transformation was never the same as Goku and Vegeta's anyway. And so we would come to discover as a testament to just how different and unique Broly is, his ascent to the next level would be different as well. He does resemble Super Saiyan 4 though, but the color is green and the ferociousness is too apparent. It's impossible to miss. Decades, even centuries from now, for generations, the story will be told of the day Broly unlocked his own Super Saiyan form, form known as Super Saiyan 4 Model Primal, completely unique to himself. But for now, we're just gonna call him Primal Broly. And Goku was delighted. The overwhelming presence, the ferociousness, the aura, the glint in his eyes, in every sense of the word, Broly's evolution had shattered his own expectations. Though the scariest thing about Primal Broly right now is that he's still driven by his own lust for chaos. Sadly, when Goku steps up to try and congratulate Broly on his new form, he's met with a punch to the face so hard that it gave him flashbacks to when he fell into his own spirit bomb. This is the level of force Primal Broly has come to possess. He's now consciously able to bend the hyperspace around him to his will, and in more ways than one, he's an anomaly. Goku composes himself and thanks Broly's gesture by punching him right back in the face, but his punch is nowhere near as effective. In fact, Broly bears it and then uses the opportunity to land consecutive punches on Goku. All this time, Goku was still running on tomorrow's strength, but everybody has their limits. As for Goku, after 8 hours of trying to contain a primal beast like Broly, his body had finally given in. He can't go on physically anymore. Every bone in his body is broken, the ringing in his ears hasn't stopped yet, and his vision is fading. All he can see is Broly walking away to take off for somewhere else. He wants to get up. He wants to follow him, but he can't. It's impossible for him right now. Broly has simply become too strong and ferocious. A primal being who desires chaos and war above all things? Meanwhile, back at the battle between Vegeta and Hit, it's clear that both sides are pretty evenly matched, but still, Hit's job is not done unless he actually kills his target. And the target in this case is, of course, Vegeta. So he has his work cut out for him, but does he? You see, Broly's boundless lust for chaos resonated with another individual. The interesting thing about this individual is how the record of his existence has been erased from the annals of history. He's neither alive nor dead. All this time, he was confined in a prison made of hyperspace. As the worst offender of Universe 6, his punishment was non-existence. However, it appears that no cage is sturdy enough to contain another primal Saiyan. It's been said that a legendary Super Saiyan is an extremely powerful and race transformation that happens once every thousand or so years. And of course, this would be just as true for the Universe 6 Saiyans as it was for the Universe 7 Saiyans. Naturally, this means that there was a Saiyan who preceded Kale as the legendary Super Saiyan. The Saiyans of Universe 6 were unaware of this. Even King Sadala had no idea, but he was there. All this time, this Saiyan was there and he was waiting. He was waiting for another legendary Super Saiyan to let him out. Intentionally or not, Primal Broly's emergence disrupted that cage of hyperspace so much that it made it possible for this being to escape. The premonition was now true. The old wizard was definitely about to be hunted down and killed by the hands of a Saiyan beast. Now if only he could have foreseen the fact that the Saiyan wasn't Vegeta, it wasn't Goku, and it's not Broly. That's correct, even unbeknownst to hit himself right now, his client, the one who hired him to go kill Vegeta, is already dead. He was ruthlessly killed by him. This man's name? This abomination of a Saiyan? This diabolical warrior who constantly desires chaotic playfulness? The man named Zykor. The living embodiment of how the Saiyans of Universe 6 were never supposed to be weak has finally been released. For better or worse, the most heinous offender in the entire history of Universe 6 has finally been released. But will his next target be Planet Sadala? Super Dragon Ball where Goku is? Or is he going to head after Primal Broly?
Ever since Beerus went back to sleep, events of historic proportions have started happening not just in Universe 7, but also in Universe 6. For the past 8 hours, Broly destroyed every single bone in Goku's body, absolutely smothered him, and so Goku just couldn't physically go on anymore. His lifeless body is then seen lying on the ground while Broly takes off somewhere else. Goku was using Ultra Instinct together with Super Saiyan 4, but what he was up against was Broly's newfound primal transformation, the Super Saiyan 4 model primal, or in the context of my story, just primal Broly. Broly's unprecedented lust for chaos was so intense and extraordinary that it influenced hyperspace at the universal level and allowed a certain someone to break free of a millennium long curse. As for whether this was coincidence or something that was destined to happen, no one knows for sure, but for better or worse, things are about to change because he is finally free. We're talking about the man whose existence was erased from the annals of history. The personification of desire, the legend, Zykor. Now, if you guys want full context on what's been happening in this what if, I'll make sure to have part one linked up at the top of the screen and down below in the comment section. If you somehow aren't tapped in yet, be sure to click that like button down below. The goal for this video is going to be 3000 once again. And also don't forget to become a subscriber to the channel so you never miss content like this when it goes live. And if you ever want to go above and beyond with your support through the channel, you can always consider becoming a member as well by clicking the join button down below. As for what happens next, well, let's hop right in. So Broly could instinctively sense Zykor's presence. I mean, they were both pretty much cut from the same cloth after all. Just legendary Saiyans who awakened their primal power and gained dominion over the forbidden primal instinct. But unlike Zykor, who seemed almost sadistically calm, Broly was just unstable. He was driven or maybe even consumed by that chaos within him. He gravitated in the direction of Zykor, but his conscience can't see a path to the next universe. He just doesn't know. Zykor was feeling the same gravitational pull towards Broly. I see. So this is how it is. It was Universe 7 again, he laughs hysterically. The man then proceeded to kill that old wizard who had nerfed the Saiyan race. Blink and the wizard was already dead. Zykor then faces in the direction of planet Sadala. Alright, well, let's see how my precious people are holding up, he states, and then he takes off towards planet Sadala. Hit and Vegeta were still in the middle of that battle, but of course, the emergence of Zykor was felt by them as well, and their fight came to a screeching halt. And once Hit realized that his client had been killed, contract is terminated. He now has no reason to continue fighting Vegeta and starts walking away. Hey, what was that? Vegeta asked, referring to the odd presence that they felt earlier. Honestly, I have no idea, but if you'll excuse me, I have another job lined up, Hit replies. Hey, Hit, let's continue this someday. As far as I'm concerned, you're the perfect sparring partner, Vegeta states. Hit would just smirk and disappear from sight. Kaba rushes over to Vegeta and comments how Hit had gotten insanely strong since his loss to Jiren. They couldn't even see most of the battle, just what the heck happened here? Though the Saiyan with the greatest glimmer in his eyes yet was of course Prince Sadala. It's like watching Vegeta's fight invoked a new kind of fire within him. It lit his heart ablaze. Vegeta saw the young man's eyes radiating from amidst the crowd as he glared back and just let out a smile. Meanwhile, on that nameless planet, or should I say the four star Super Dragon Ball, Goku continues to look in the distance through the corner of his eyes. He's in so much pain that his mind has somehow isolated his ability to feel pain. Broly was simply too strong and too unpredictable, and above all else, he was too ruthless. In a few more hours, Goku would run out of the last of his life fumes and kiss the world goodbye yet again. His mind can't think straight, but even so, in his soul, he can still feel Broly's energy and his heart knows that Broly shouldn't be left unchecked. For what is worth, Broly was in his care and now it seemed that the beast is heading towards a more familiar planet. He vaguely wonders if maybe Gohan will be able to pull through. Or somehow Vegeta returns in time, maybe even Beerus wakes up or Whis intervenes, or by the grace of God, maybe Broly will just come to his senses. Goku's mind was in a vegetative state, but it was going at a million miles a minute. He was forsaking himself without even realizing it. Every single moment that went by, 
the last of his life force grows even weaker. However, while his feeble and wobbling mind may not be seeing hope in anything right now, Goku keeps looking through the corner of his eyes. If you were there, you'd think that this man was already dead, but on a closer look, you'd realize that his eyes are still very much alive. Then around two hours later, Gohan would sense an outrageous source of power that stops him in his tracks. Trunks, Goten, Piccolo, and even the others can feel it too, but Gohan was sensing something different. Soon enough, they all would meet up at the lookout. Is this what I think it is, Gohan? Piccolo asks. Yeah, it's Broly, isn't it? Trunks interrupts. But Gohan continues to look in the endlessly vast sky. He hasn't said a word yet. Subsequently, at Planet Sadala, the Saiyans are having sort of a banquet. Right now, there was not even a single Saiyan on this planet who didn't see Vegeta with the utmost respect. Maybe if it was Planet Vegeta and someone similar were to appear, they would have been too brazen, but these Saiyans were institutionalized. Now, you must be wondering why Zykor hasn't appeared even after two whole hours. Well, that's because he was stopped by someone, and it was Vados. Come on now, move. I have no interest in becoming a destroyer, lady, Zykor asserts. You know full well that that's not what I'm here for. Just what are you planning on doing next, Vados asks. Well, I was about to pay my Saiyan brethren a visit, but now you've soiled the mood. So should I kill you first, Zykor replies, and he was dead serious. Vados is already behind him though, and she manages to get a clean hit as well, but by the time her attack connected, Zykor had already dodged, so... What she hit was nothing more than an after image. Zykor laughs. Well, I knew it. Primal Instinct and Ultra Instinct don't really go well together. Conveniently, this is when Champa shows up. He had followed Zykor's energy and basically flew all the way over here the moment he woke up from a quick nap. For some reason, seeing Champa show up startles Vados, but not as much as it startled Champa. To understand more about why Champa and Zykor were never supposed to meet here today, We'll have to go back in time about a thousand years right after Zykor became the worst offender in Universe 6's history. Champa and Bottles were left with no other choice but to personally kill him themselves. However, somehow Champa lost. This wasn't supposed to happen. The battle lasted for weeks and Zykor was almost dead by the end of it. But the Zenkai boost he then received at the verge of death by the hands of a god of destruction was so potent that he was able to elapse the massive gap between a mortal Saiyan and an immortal destroyer. They may have still been able to kill him, but just like how Beerus chose to punish Frieza by confining him into a vortex for all eternity, Bottles had no choice but to intervene and lock Zykor up in something similar. As for Champa, the next time he woke up, he had no recollection of Zykor at all. Nothing. And the same goes for all the other inhabitants of Universe 6 as well, even the Saiyans. It's like any and all records of Zykor's existence had just been snapped away. See, part of the reason why that old wizard messed up and asked Hit to go after Vegeta instead is because it couldn't have foreseen the revival of someone who presumably didn't exist. Only the angels knew of this. But now, thanks to Broly, Zykor has been privileged with the gift of existence yet again. Yo, if it isn't my dear friend Champa, how you been buddy? Zykor sincerely asked. Champa doesn't reply to him. Instead, he asks Vados, What do you think we should do about him? Vados then replies, I'll be honest with you, Lord Champa. Sycor's reemergence was no accident. Fate works in strange ways, and so I'm afraid I, as an angel, am not supposed to stop him. We must let nature take its course. Hearing this, Champa replies, Then what if it's me? I want a piece of this guy. If that's what you wish, then go ahead, Bottles replies. Oh, whatever. I'm not interested in fighting you, dear Lord Champa, so just shut up and piss off, Zykor states. He eclipses past both of them and then dashes straight towards Planet Sadala. As far as he was concerned, both Bottles and Champa were just in the way because his current interest right now was checking out the situation with his fellow Saiyans. And so, three hours after Hit's departure, this individual would finally arrive on planet Sadala himself. The man was genuinely looking forward to a warm welcome by his Saiyan brethren. He doesn't understand how nobody knows anything about him. How was his legend even supposed to be passed down when even those who lived during his prime were made to forget about him? 
So Zykor would arrive and he doesn't like how it's all sunshine and rainbows here, he's more of a night owl himself. Vegeta knows that someone strong has appeared, but he couldn't be bothered to move. At that point, Vegeta may not have realized it yet, but everything from his subtle expressions to his demeanor, even the way he was using his speech, it was all that of a king. He was doing it all subconsciously. King Sadala keeps writing it down. The Saiyans know that someone strong is outside. The king knows, but seeing Vegeta continue to scarf down the food they had made for him calms him down. They don't know that Vegeta is just eating as much as he can to replenish his energy because if another fight takes place, he's gonna need Super Saiyan 4 and Ultra Ego and they require a stupid amount of energy. Zykor on the other hand was wondering what he should do about this sunshine. He'd rather show up in the presence of the moonlight because that's just a little bit cooler so he does something only an insane person would think of. He unleashes a raging fire blast on a nearby star and he wants to push it far enough that it never annoys him ever again. Of course, taking out this star meant that the seven moons of planet Sadala wouldn't be able to shine. And realizing this, Zykor states, Damn it, I messed up. Nah, just kidding. He knew exactly what he was doing. And with that star out of the picture, Zykor maintains a safe distance from the planet and then uses an illicit celestial technique named Infinite Lunar Flare. Now, thanks to this, planet Sadala would forever remain masked by the moonlight. Though Zykor knew something was strange because no one was transforming into an Uzaru. Within a fraction of a second, he was already inside the palace. Everyone was perplexed, including Vegeta, because Vegeta just couldn't have imagined that the extraordinary presence he felt was that of a Saiyan. What the hell is this circus? Why are you all so weak, Zykor says, and then walks up to Vegeta. Are you the current king? And then he tries to land a solid kick on Vegeta, which Vegeta barely manages to block by instinctively using his god key. Very impressive, but I don't understand. Why is everyone else here so weak? Don't tell me you cut off all their tails for some cheap sense of power, Zykor asks. He was jumping to so many conclusions, but he genuinely couldn't understand why his race was so weak out of nowhere. Meanwhile, back on the 4-star Super Dragon Ball, Whis is standing right next to Goku. I don't think I've ever seen someone in such poor state. It's not just your bones, all the stem cells in your body have been destroyed. And this was supposed to be your plan, we states. He's gonna have to use his power to restore Goku for old time's sake, but what he sees next was profound enough to leave him speechless. Whis catches the glimpse of light that was still imminent in Goku's eyes. It was as though the cosmos itself stopped Whis from using his abilities because something unusual was about to happen. Back during the battle with Broly, there was a point when Broly tried to punch a hole through the planet, but it didn't work because it's actually a Super Dragon Ball, remember? However, he did create a crater that allowed for light to seep out, and it finally clicked. Despite not being fully conscious, despite running out of life in real time, something inside of Goku was still waiting. It was waiting for this moment. The orbital motion of the moon finally clicks with the face of the Super Dragon Ball that was now exposed. A glistening moonlight engulfs the scene. It speaks to the Saiyan soul instead of Goku and allows for something else to break. You see, the reason why Gohan didn't answer back when Piccolo and Trunks asked him if this was Broly is because he was also sensing something else. Goten was sensing it as well. They couldn't pinpoint it, but it was the raging life force of their father. It happens. The four star Super Dragon Ball, which saved his life in the past, does so again. Everything Goku has done so far, everything he's achieved, everything he had been born, and more importantly, everything he signifies. Now, it's the pure soul of a Saiyan that gives him a pat on the back and removes his limiters. Goku's eyes would burst open, leaving even Whis confused. He looks like he's seen a ghost or. He doesn't even recognize Goku. But through effort alone, he had pried open the doors of limits and achieved something spectacular here today. Super Saiyan 4 model Sun Wukong Goku has finally been born.
The royal calendar in Dragon Ball is pretty much like an official recording of all of the events that have ever taken place throughout the multiverse, and it recorded the Tournament of Power as one of the greatest events to have ever taken place. Not because of the events that happened during, but more so because of the events that succeeded it. The ever-growing power and adaptability of the warriors from the eight universes pushed the destroyers to finally let go of their complacency. It shook one's understanding of the multiverse, but also created legends. Legends whose names will continue to roar for millions of years to come. One such legend is the man who awakened to emptiness. A man who experienced a beatdown so strong that no life whatsoever was left in his body, his soul fleeting, his bones shattered, and his mind completely numbed. Only his eyes remained. This is the same man who was repeatedly served as the hope of the universe. The man named Son Goku, later recorded with the epitaph, Son Wukong. Having lost every last ounce of strength or life in his body, Goku awakened thanks to the glory of the moonlight. Primal Broly's onslaught destroyed him, but one could also say that it tore him a new one. Now standing in the glory of that humbling moonlight, Goku was in his final limit breaker form. But while Goku has now awakened to the emptiness, Vegeta is in the middle of an interesting situation on planet Sadala. The worst offender aka Zykor, the master of primal instinct, quite literally shoved the star out of the way and then used infinite lunar flare on planet Sadala. He's just awakened from 1000 years of non-existence and so he doesn't want to see any of his Saiyan brethren slacking. He enters the palace when Vegeta, King Sadala, and everyone else are in the middle of a glorious banquet. Immediately, he assumes that Vegeta is the current king because, well, for lack of better words, Vegeta is just kind of giving off that king aura right now. Though, this causes Zykor to get upset. If there's one thing he doesn't like, it's a fully grown, weak Saiyan. He was especially furious because there wasn't a single tail on anyone here besides Vegeta. So he jumps to conclusions and greets Vegeta with a kick to the gut. Vegeta manages to block it, but not without the help of his potent god key. Calm down, first introduce yourself. Tell me your name, Vegeta asks. Well, I'm a Saiyan just like you. But things happened, and I had my existence erased from the multiverse and until a few hours ago actually, when a similar source of energy allowed me to break free of the hyperspace prison. Though, if it's simply a name that you want, they called me Zykor, the conjurer of desire, fame, power, women. I always get whatever I want, Zykor replies. Hearing this, Vegeta pauses for a moment as he knew this man was a Saiyan, but all that stuff about him being from the past and the hyperspace prison kind of confuses Vegeta. Still, he knew exactly what to ask next. Don't beat around the bush, Zykor. I asked for your real Saiyan name. I've never not once called to a Saiyan by anything other than their real birth name, Vegeta asserts. Although this was a lie and Vegeta knows it, we all know it. Truth be told, Vegeta can recall a few times himself when he referred to Goku by Goku and not Kakarot. But hey, Vegeta's point was still made. Well, how royal of you, sire. But forget it. I've already forsaken that weak name. Zykor fits yours truly better anyway, so just shut up and answer my question now that I've answered yours. Besides, you've already addressed me as Zykor in case you haven't noticed, Zykor replies. Okay, you got me. Though I'm afraid you're still mistaken. I'm not the current king. It's this man right here, Vegeta says while pointing at King Sadala. Zykor glared at Vegeta for about half a minute and then erupted into laughter. Good one, he said. No, this is no joke. He's the current king, so pay him some respect, Vegeta replies. Just then, that angry glint returns to Zykor's eyes. He grabs Vegeta by the collar and asks a sincere question. So you're telling me that this joke is the current king when they have someone as strong as you around? He doesn't even have a tail. A Saiyan without a tail is hardly a Saiyan in my eyes, Zykor states. Of course, this blatant disrespect to his face is gonna cause King Sadala to chime in finally. Listen, Zykor, if you have anything to say, say it to my face. My people will not tolerate any more disrespect. And as far as this man Vegeta is concerned, he's from Universe 7. He's not even from here. 
Zykor would finally let go of Vegeta, sit down in Vegeta's seat, and then, seeing all the food that was before him, start stuffing himself. Now things were finally beginning to make sense to him. One of the reasons why Zykor was labeled as a threat to the entire multiverse is because of his disgustingly high intelligence. And we're talking about higher than Piccolo, higher than Gohan, Bulma, Cell, anybody that you can name. He's able to make sense of things in a split second where others would take somewhere near decades. A prodigy in every sense of the word. The current situation of Planet Sadala was pretty easy to understand once he realized that Vegeta is not even from here to begin with. Since his disappearance, more than 1,000 years have passed. There was also that old wizard whom he killed a few hours back, and that doofus had been around for plenty of millennia. And then of course, there's Vegeta who still has a tail. Zykor instantly begins connecting the dots. Something happened after he was punished by non-existence that led to the complete institutionalization of these Saiyans. And if not a single one of them said anything even after hearing the name Zykor, this means that the record of his existence was completely erased. In simpler words, Zykor's non-existence became the very downfall of the Saiyans. Realizing this, he actually started tearing up. Crying in public, how pitiful Vegeta comments. Don't worry, Zykor replies. I'll carry out their salvation right away. Being weak is punishable by death. And sure enough, once Zykor is done finishing all of that food that was still on the table, he lets out a destructive burp and then prepares to destroy the planet in its entirety. Wait, just what the hell do you plan on doing, Vegeta asks? Simple. Weakness is disgusting. It's a sin. I'll destroy all of the evidence so that only me and you remain, Vegeta. We'll travel around Universe 6, meet strong women of other races, and start putting down the foundation for the rebirth of the ultimate Saiyan warrior race. That's right. In the future, we are guaranteed to be the strongest race. Prepare yourself, Vegeta, because we will need our stamina. Once we're done, we'll branch out into other universes. It'll be great. And then eventually, the Saiyans will rule everything, Zyko replies. And... He was 100% serious. He cried not because he was sad at what happened to the Saiyans. He cried because it'll take some time before the universe is once again dripping with strong Saiyan warriors who can't be contained, not even by divine authority. Hey, whoa, calm down, buddy. It's not being patient, Vegeta quickly states. He definitely couldn't keep up with Zykor's wild kind of party boy vibe right now. Meanwhile, Things continue to happen both in Universe 6 and 7. After his contract was terminated thanks to the old wizard's death, Hit would leave planet Sadala and then arrived at a secluded planet in the darkest reaches of Universe 6. This planet is called Moors and it's his birth planet. Hit almost never returns to his home planet. He's always on the clock for something, but something about that energy he experienced on planet Sadala just ticked him the wrong way. So he's now returned to have a dialogue with the Grand Elder of Planet Moors, the Enigma named Thanatos. While he has only been alive for around a thousand years, Thanatos has been here since before six of the 18 universes were even destroyed. He also committed a lot of felonies in his long life, which is why he's basically on house arrest. But Hit knew that it was about time he paid his great-grandfather a visit. Subsequently in Universe 7, it seems Broly's raging aura didn't just disrupt the hyperspace, it also influenced the void of indefinite terror. Beerus imprisoned Frieza in this void because he had simply gone too far. In this void, Frieza's mind was mostly empty. He couldn't think about anything specific, he couldn't even feel anything in particular. He was just kind of floating here, absolving into nothingness for all of eternity. That is until Primal Broly happened, and a new wave emerged in the void. A wave that would constantly remind him of the hatred he had not just for the Saiyan race, but also for Beerus now. Yes, he still can't move a finger, but at least now he has something to think about. The next, we have Primal Broly on his way to Earth, ready to destroy some more Saiyan bones just like he did with Goku. Gohan, Piccolo... Trunks and Goten have all gathered at the lookout as they can feel the presence of this raging beast, but Gohan and Goten could also feel something else. 
Although he was at the very edge of this universe, Goku's sons could feel his emergence. They know that once again, their father will come and so all they have to do is hold down the fort until then, which is of course easier said than done against Primal Broly. Should we fuse Goten Ash Trunks? I'd say that's probably for the best boys, but let's wait until after the sun is set down. There's gonna be a full moon today. And I say it's about time for you two to understand why your dads decided to wish for their tails back, Gohan replies. And Piccolo would agree. 20 minutes later, Broly arrives in space right above the Earth's atmosphere. He instinctively pinpoints Gohan's location and sends an energy blast right at him. Of course, Gohan sees this attack coming from a mile away, but this is primal Broly we're talking about. This is the man who ruthlessly destroyed Goku while he was using both Ultra Instinct and Super Saiyan 4. Simply put, surviving the attack was the best Gohan could do. And he did. Gohan had no other choice but to block the majority of the attack because Broly's energy blast soon started evolving into a planet buster. If Gohan wasn't in the way, their planet would have just been destroyed. Broly then flies at Mach 100 and kicks Gohan in the gut. It was so brutal that Gohan had trouble standing straight up after experiencing the full weight of that kick. He was stumbling, unable to do anything while this embodiment of chaos stood right before him. Primal Broly had arrived and he wasn't going anywhere until he had completely destroyed everything here for whatever reason. Meanwhile, back at the 4 star Super Dragon Ball. <clears throat> well, how do you feel Goku? Should I heal your body or not, Whis asks. Ah, uh, no need Whis. Right now, at this very moment, I feel invincible. Let me go test this out first, Goku replies. All right, I'll leave you to it. Though, just a little heads up, even more unprecedented things are happening in Universe 6. Vegeta has his work cut out for himself. I say he could use a helping hand, wouldn't you say, We states? Mm, nah, no need. Our paths won't need to cross again until both of us have mastered our new strength. I'll take care of Broly. Let Vegeta handle things in Universe 6 on his own. He is the king after all, Goku replies, and with that... He prepares himself to instant transmission all the way to Earth. He arrives less than two seconds later. Unfortunately, Broly had already landed the second blow on Gohan and it wasn't pleasant at all. Dad, you're finally here, Gohan states, but at the same time, he's still taken aback by Goku's new form. You should let this serve as a reminder and a wake-up call to all of you guys that the world needs a hero in times where me or Vegeta aren't here. Aim to be the strongest Saiyan alive, Gohan. Do that, and both Goten and Trunks will follow suit. Goku casually affirms all of this while holding Broly's arm that was about to just deck Gohan. Subsequently, Zykor is about to knock Planet Sadala off of the map also, as Vegeta tries to reason with him, but it just isn't going over well. Which is why, Vegeta has to step it up now too. He unleashes both Super Saiyan 4 and Ultra Ego, and then basically uses Sakai on Zykor's blast. On one hand, you have these two users of Primal Instinct being Broly and Zykor, while on the other hand, you have Goku and Vegeta. And from here on out, the action is only gonna get more intense. For better or worse, these events will be etched in bold in the royal calendar as something truly astounding is gonna happen while Beerus is still asleep. I'm gonna be a lot stronger than I ever was. It won't be the same as last time, Goku tells Primal Broly as he once again steps up to protect the Earth from grave danger. What's happening right now is a tale of extraordinarily historical significance. One day in the future, every single one of these Saiyan warriors is going to be remembered as legendary figures who attain unprecedented levels of power through their might alone. So Goku thrived in the face of death and has now appeared right in front of Primal Broly in order to keep him from toasting his home planet. Vegeta, on the other hand, has met a pretty interesting guy. His real name is unknown, but because of what he stands for and the things that he did, he made a name for himself about a thousand years ago called Zykor. When he learns that the Saiyans of Universe 6 don't have tails, he's pretty disappointed actually. It's like this, Zykor had created his own language rules book in his head, which can be referred to as Zykor. I know, don't kill me for that guys. In Zykorish, weakness means death, and that's what he's about to do. He's gonna destroy planet Sadala so that the Saiyan race can start anew. 
he and Vegeta would spread the new Saiyan race across the universe so that in about a hundred years or so give or take, the Saiyan race is like the strongest race there is. Or at least that was the plan. Vegeta manages to stop him from nuking the whole planet by using Hakai on the blast after using his Ultra Ego together with Super Saiyan 4. Hey, how did you do that? I thought only destroyers can do things like this, Zykor asks. Well, I guess I'm somewhat of a destroyer myself, Vegeta replies. Zykor remains silent for about 20 seconds and then he states this. Listen, Vegeta, he replies. You're smart. You're strong and you definitely have the disposition of a king so why don't you understand the brilliance of my plan he asks. Dude you were literally about to kill tens of thousands of Saiyans. I can't have that. You're just an old relic from the past. You don't own the Saiyan race Vegeta replies. Yeah I know which is why I'm not trying to be a king myself. No that role should be for someone with royal blood. Though try to understand Vegeta death is inevitable for everyone. But while the weak wither away and fade, the strong survive. In fact, they cheat death by creating a legacy. We're a proud warrior race. How can we allow ourselves to be so weak? I could try and maybe whip some of them into shape, but they don't even have tails anymore. They've never experienced what it means to be a true Saiyan. That's right, from where I'm looking, the only Saiyans on this planet are you and myself, Psychor asserts. Vegeta was visibly intrigued, not because of what Zykor said, but the way he said it. Zykor, you say that, but I've lived like half of my life without a tail, just got it back recently. Just admit that you don't know what you're talking about and let me beat you, Vegeta declares. Yes, but you did have it at one point, right? These guys have never had a tail, not even their fathers or grandfathers. I'm 100% sure that the Saiyan race was nerfed because I was banished from existence. But now that I'm back and I've made a great friend like you, we can start fresh. We'll start the strongest Saiyan empire there is. An empire that doesn't know or have to bow to anyone, not even the highest authorities of the multiverse. However, it'll be impossible to achieve something like that when most of the race lacks their defining feature. Think Vegeta, think. I don't want to fight you right now. I'm afraid I might kill you and that would honestly make me cry. Psychor declares back. Do you seriously believe that you can just casually kill me? I feel offended my friend Vegeta states. Well, how about I just show you? Let's have a match. If you win, I'll give up on destroying planet Sadala, but if I win, I'm dragging you around the multiverse with me, Zykor declares. Just the way I like it. What kind of match though, Vegeta asks. Don't worry about it. It's mostly for my own sake because I want you to stay alive. It's very simple. Basically, everything goes except death. We must not kill each other. That's the only rule and trust me, I'll keep my word, Zykor states. Meanwhile in Universe 7, as we switch gears real quick, Goku has just finished telling off Gohan to pay a little bit more attention to his abilities. He hasn't even tried anything since he gained his tail back yet which is weird. Then there is Broly, a monster consumed by chaos and that's a word that you're going to be hearing a lot for the rest of the series. Unlike Zykor who can control his primal instinct, Broly's instincts are just screaming frantically. He's running on all cylinders, a raging beast or even a universal calamity at this point. This Broly is not someone who should be messed with. He's carnage himself and Goku knows this better than anyone. Last time Goku gave it his everything but he was still ruthlessly destroyed. But now that he's ascended to the next level by breaking those limits, he's established himself as the legend who will be talked about for millions of years to come. The Monkey King's Son Wukong. As I said Broly, I'm gonna be a lot stronger than I ever was. It won't be the same as last time, Goku states. Broly gives off an evil grin, bracing himself for impact and then tries landing a solid punch on Goku but he blocks it with his right arm. Gohan, Piccolo, Goten and Trunks can only watch in disbelief as this one punch instantly evolved into a frantic sequence of abnormal martial arts moves. Primal Instinct or not, Broly's movements had so much care and finesse put into him that it would be a massive mistake to call his technique crude. So 
what exactly is primal instinct and why is it so formidable i know a lot of you guys are probably asking that question in simpler words both ultra instinct and ultra ego are powers that are either associated with a certain race or a certain position for lack of better words the individual has to become more or less that being to be a better user of the technique but goku isn't an angel and vegeta isn't a destroyer However, what's different with Primal Instinct is how you don't need to be like someone else or anything else. It's not a technique that can be learned or copied or even referenced. It isn't restricted by a race or position, but still not anyone can learn it, so it does maintain a little bit of exclusivity. To unlock Primal Instinct, one must have enough chaos within themselves, and remember that word. But just like how the number of Ultra Instinct users and Ultra Ego users are almost inconsequential in the face of the actual population of the multiverse, there also isn't that many records of Primal Instinct either. However, Broly, a Saiyan from Universe 7, awakened this ungodly state, if you will, and in doing so, he's become a monster who just can't calm down until the universe itself has been consumed by that chaos within him. A user of Primal Instinct is able to grab hyperspace, and in doing so, they can move at inconceivable levels of speed. They can propel their opponent towards themselves and hit them before they've even realized it, and they can also damage the other guy without making any actual physical contact. The shock can be sent through the hyperspace. Gohan is seeing all of this before his very eyes right now, and he feels almost enlightened at this point. He knows his father is strong, especially after his recent awakening, but Bully is just a different kind of enigma. His is a strength that doesn't make any sense. Goku is keeping up and sometimes almost overpowering Broly, but it's clear that they're both pretty evenly matched. Unless another evolution takes place during this battle or somebody's body completely breaks, there isn't going to be a clear victor anytime soon, I fear. Of course, similar events would be taking place back at Vegeta's battle with Zykor. Impressive. This is awesome, Vegeta. You can use the technique of the Destroyers and your Saiyan transformations in coherence. I applaud you, young man. Please allow me to refer to you as King. You know what, Zykor? You're probably the most insane person I've ever come across. No matter how hard I try, I just can't make sense of you. So tell me, what is it that you see? What is it that you did that earned you that punishment, and why are you so disgusted by weakness?" Vegeta asks as he returns to favor with a kick of his own. As of this point, Vegeta hasn't really had the same kind of awakening as Goku, but thanks to the experience he gained from evading hits refined and enhanced killing techniques, Vegeta has become somewhat of a defensive specialist. It's now hard for him to just completely outright lose. Besides, while Broly was landing punches on Goku with 100% of his power each time, practically knocking the life out of him piece by piece, Zykor is much more level-headed. He's more methodical with his approach, and yet at the same time, he's absolutely confident that he can defeat Vegeta. So, he's taking his time. Anyways, this is what he would go on to reply to Vegeta's previous question. I'll tell you more about this story if you win, Vegeta, but... Since you're such a curious cat, I'll leave you with one piece of the puzzle. The reason I was labeled as the worst offender in the history of the universe is not because I committed some cardinal sin or anything stupid like that. Although I did kill a Supreme Kai of another universe, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Let's just say I was labeled the worst offender because I was too difficult to contain. Not just me, but also my legend. Killing me would have done nothing because my legend would have remained, and the chances of another strong Saiyan showing up and wreaking havoc, pretty damn strong. So they chose the most convenient option. The angels labeled me as the worst offender in history and then locked me up in a cage of hyperspace. They also conjured a spell which made everyone forget about my existence from that moment forth, the past, the present, and the future. The legend died and they won. But I'll be honest with you, my friend, I've never lost a fight since the day I killed my father, Zykor declares. Vegeta had to pause and reflect a little bit over what this man just said. Wait, if you killed a Supreme Kai, doesn't that mean a Destroyer also died? But all of the Destroyers who showed up at the Tournament of Power were like millions of years old, Vegeta goes on as he asks for a further explanation. Would you believe me if I said that a man appeared who stopped the death of that Supreme Kai? I honestly had no idea that such things were possible. Let me tell you, there are some really overpowered beings in the multiverse, Vegeta. 
These people see us as mere ants. We must get stronger than them or we'll be squashed, Psycho replies. Ah, uh, I see. Maybe you do make sense. I say the person who revived the Supreme Kai is the Grand Priest. Interesting. This makes some sense. Especially if only the angels knew about you during the past 1,000 years, Vegeta states. Good, so we finally have an understanding. Well, let's go, Zykor says. No. I understand you, but I don't agree with you on the destruction of the Saiyans of Planet Sadala, so screw you, Vegeta replies. Around a thousand and eighty or so years ago, a frail Saiyan child was born in Universe 6. He was weak, almost crippled, had a small stubby tail and a pale aura. The Saiyans deemed him a runt, unfit to be a warrior and decided to send him off to a distant planet so that he can maybe live a peaceful life from here on out. Well, he wasn't gonna last long anyways, and ordinarily they'd use someone like him as a slave, but because of his bloodline, he's given the gift of a peaceful life. They cut off his tail, put him on a space pod, and sent him to a planet called Magos. What was his real name? Well, no one knows, and none at the time could have foreseen the terrifying monster he was eventually gonna become. When the boy opened his eyes, all he could see was a vague presence of his home planet getting further and further from sight. Eventually, the historic record of the multiverse gave this being the name Zykor, the embodiment of desire and playfulness, but this wasn't his real name. His name was something else. So the previous part would end with Zykor being dead set on destroying planet Sadala, but Vegeta would stop him right in time and now? They're amidst the battle to decide the next course of action for the Saiyan race of Universe 6. Subsequently on planet Earth, awakened Goku is engaged in a battle against primal Broly. Come on Broly, wake up. Bedtime's over, Goku states while landing four consecutive slaps on Broly's face. Gohan and Trunks are left speechless. Goten almost lets out a slight laugh, but Broly shakes it off, clutches Goku's arm and tries to take his revenge, but Considering how many blows Goku has received from Broly ever since he unlocked Primal Instinct though, Goku can now kind of dodge his attacks without even looking. Your unpredictability is becoming more predictable, Broly. As I said, wake up, Goku states and once again slaps him four more times, two on each side of his face. This sort of back and forth clash continues for the next 10 minutes. Broly seems possessed, Gohan mentions. Yeah, but he always seemed possessed. Only this time, it looks like he might actually end the universe if he isn't stopped soon, Piccolo replies. Well, it's a good thing Goku's here to save the day, but I don't understand. Where's my dad, Trunks asks. I wonder where, but I'm sure he isn't in a pleasant situation either, Piccolo replies with a grin. Sure enough, Zykor and Vegeta were exchanging blows at lightning speed. Blink and you missed about half the action. As expected, you're amazing, Vegeta. I would have loved a friend like you back when I was still young and stupid, Zykor states. The feeling is mutual, which is why it's such a shame that I'll have to destroy you today, Vegeta replies. Aw, oh, come on. Why be so mean? I'm just trying to help our blood, Zykor says. And how is killing tens of thousands of Saiyans going to help with anything? Do you have any idea what happened in Universe 7, Vegeta firmly asserts? Zykor instantly dodges his punch and grabs his fist. Ah, <laughs> I knew it. The reason you're so strong right now is because something happened to the Saiyan planet in Universe 7. Tell me. Tell me the truth, Vegeta. I'm your friend after all, Zykor asks. This enrages Vegeta. He breaks free from Zykor's hold and lands a sinister kick on his left ear. But the Primal Instinct does its magic and lands the same attack on Vegeta. This rattles Vegeta's head a little because his ear had already been wrecked by Frieza a few days prior. Vegeta stumbles and it allows Zykor to land the decisive blow. However, just as he's about to knock the life out of Vegeta, King Sadala would jump in between them both and take on the majority of that attack. This would leave the king crippled. His son, Prince Sadala, instinctively tries to run up to his father, but Zykor kicks him like a football and sends him flying meters away. Kalafla would catch the young prince while Kaba appears before the man and blocks him from stepping onto the king. As all of this is happening, Vegeta gets a flashback to the day Beerus stepped onto his father. 
and the powerlessness he felt in that moment. It must be the same for these Saiyans, but rather than giving in to pure power, they're choosing to struggle and act in accordance with their pride. Vegeta gets a hold of himself, walks up to Zykor and grabs his shoulder from behind. Then using every ounce of destructive power in his body, he asserts dominance, a level of dominance that causes Zykor to kneel to his feet. Prince Sadala momentarily opens his eyes and sees this scene where Vegeta caused the Saiyan menace to kneel before him. Though when he sees a glimpse of his father's broken and unconscious body lying next to them, he lets out a tear and closes his eyes. Don't look away, Vegeta calls out to him. If you look away now, you will always remain powerless. Look closely, young man. The only way to not give in to power is to be even stronger. Suddenly, Zykor laughs. Though what's funny about his laugh is that he purposely laughs in rhythms. All of the Saiyans in the vicinity could only hear in terror as Zykor's laughter quickly enveloped the whole castle. And while Vegeta showed his dominance by using physical force, all Zykor had to do was laugh. Now, now, Vegeta. Just because I'm treating you like a friend doesn't mean you should badmouth me in front of all of these wholesome people. That's exactly how toxic friendships start, Zykor states as he lands an elbow in Vegeta's gut. The force was strong enough for Vegeta to lose hold of Zykor, but the battle would resume and it heats up fast. Tell me, Zykor, have you ever conceived a child, Vegeta asks. I did. And how about this, Vegeta? After I destroy this planet, we can have a nice little talk under the moon. I'll tell you all about my own life. It's a ridiculous, crazy, and honestly laughable story after all. I promise you'll have a great time, Zykor replies. But in Vegeta's mind, he's already determined that the only way to get this information out of Zykor is beating him into submission to learn more, as he warns his opponent. And how do you expect to go about doing that, Zykor states as he lands another kick to the gut. Vegeta would cough up blood, but then he smiles. Thanks to the endless lethal blows he evaded while fighting Hit, and now after experiencing the unpredictability of Primal Instinct, Vegeta had been growing stronger this entire time. Not just because of Ultra Ego, but also because of the way Super Saiyan 4 brings out the best in a Saiyan. He steps back a little and for the first time since regaining his tail, Vegeta would let everything go. The air around them breaks, the planet vibrates, and a bolt of lightning strikes Vegeta. Zykor knows something absolutely astounding is about to happen next, and so he takes a little step back and prepares himself to witness his glory. Just like how Goku broke his primal limiters and awakened a form that will later be known as the Monkey King, Sun Wukong, Vegeta was now under a similar metamorphosis. Ultra Ego would run through his veins and proceeds to destroy all of the energy blockages in his system. One could say that this is the moment where Vegeta would finally master Ultra Ego, but the word master just doesn't do this transformation justice. What happened here is a self-realization. Combining Ultra Ego and Super Saiyan 4 in perfect harmony paved the way to the next door of power, the Limit Breaker, a state worthy of the true king. History may remember Goku as the Monkey King, the frail boy as Zykor and Broly as the primal beast? His majesty requires no second name, not even a prefix. No, this was about enlightenment. And it was at this moment that the true heir to the throne was recognized. The royal Super Saiyan King, Vegeta, had finally been awakened. But Vegeta knew that Zykor is the last person he should be underestimating. If he doesn't want to turn this into a battle to the death, he has to knock him out right away. Brace yourself, Zykor. You're on. The moment Vegeta uttered these words, he was already full sent on damn near paralyzing Zykor. He had hit him with a nut shot and also grabbed his tail and is squeezing it as hard as he can. How strange. Why do you not feel any pain when I squeeze your tail, Zykor? What's the meaning of this, he asks. Zykor would let out a blood-curdling roar as he fumes and rages on, he pulls the hyperspace around them and kicks Vegeta in his own face. Oh, I, I, I apologize for my outburst. You see, I'm extremely insecure about my tail, so please don't touch it without my permission, Zykor comments. You got some real problems, man, Vegeta laughs, and then he steps on the Zykor's tail again, just not caring. 
Zykor would turn around to return the favor to Vegeta, but Vegeta was already behind him again. Right then, at that very moment, he unleashes Ultra Flash on Zykor. It was imbued with Hakai, but not enough that it would erase Zykor out of existence. And the king had won. At least in the context of this battle. Zykor was definitely knocked unconscious because of the power of Vegeta's Ultra Flash attack, but it wasn't quite enough to take him out though. Zykor would open his eyes again about 5 minutes later, fully intent on resuming their battle, however Vegeta was no longer interested. You've lost Zykor, let's go. I want to listen to your story now, Vegeta asks. Zykor looks around as the entire palace has been destroyed. Most of the Saiyans nearby have been knocked unconscious because of their life force and Vegeta himself is just sitting in front of him, all relaxed and calm. Fine. You won, Vegeta. I guess I was too impatient. I'm willing to talk, but if you don't have a better alternative to my plan, I might still accidentally destroy this planet. Just saying, Zykor grins, and with that, the two of them walk outside what used to be the palace. Meanwhile, at Zeno's palace, we send Vados greet the Grand Priest. I presume you already know why I called the two of you all the way out here, the Grand Priest states. Indeed, it's about Zykor. He's broken free of hyperspace. Should I intervene and take him out, Vados replies? No need. Now and tomorrow, I just want the two of you to observe. It's not an angel's job to directly intervene with something of this magnitude, so there must be a reason why the multiverse allowed Zykor back into existence. Let's watch and see. Now, on to the actual reason why I called you two here. Whis, it would be heavily advised if you were to wake up Beerus, and Vados, I want you to revive Planet Magos. Unless these two events specifically take place, both universes 6 and 7 will soon enter a period of darkness, the Grand Prix states, and although his tone never changes, the sense of urgency can be felt. We send Vados would nod and then take their lead. Don't you think that's a little strange, Vados says to Whis as they begin flying back to the mortal realm? I'm surprised he didn't mention anything about Primal Instinct. I think he did, Whis replies, in his own sort of roundabout way, I mean. I'm pretty sure that waking up Lord Beerus and reviving Planet Magos are directly linked with Primal Instinct. All we can do for now is follow the orders and let things happen as they should. Subsequently, back at Planet Sadala, Vegeta and Zykor are walking away from the palace, not flying or speeding, just simply walking away. The Infinite Lunar Flare was in full bloom, but since they were the only two Saiyans with tails, there was no need to really worry about any unnecessary Uzaru transformations, as all that was left to do was listen to a straightforward dialogue. Vegeta releases his transformations and goes back to his base state. Zykor knew that Vegeta wanted him to do the same, but for some weird reason, he doesn't oblige right away. Don't worry, strong individuals do not go back on their words, Zykor states, as it seems like maybe he's preparing to show Vegeta something as well. Alright, so just tell me your story so that I can get a better understanding of how or why Planet Sadala is the way it is, Vegeta asks. My real name? My true Saiyan name, that is, Zykor begins, is Cumber. And with that single revelation, Zykor, or Cumber, if you will, braces himself to tell the story to Vegeta of a legendary 1,000 year old Saiyan that was not only shunned by the entire angel realm, but also sealed away by those same impartial angels, Cumber. Vegeta finds this somewhat unusual, so he asks, why have you been hiding it all the way up until now? Well, do not be confused, Vegeta. It's not the name itself that I was hiding, Zykor says. Same goes for my primal Saiyan form. There are implications behind them that I don't really want to acknowledge yet. You're the last person who will ever know the truth about who I am, Zykor continues. Born as a weak and frail kid, honestly, I was an anomaly among all of the Saiyans who were born in that particular decade. My power level was closer to zero than to one. I had a lifeless aura and barely a visible tail. It was honestly a miracle that I was still alive. The only reason I wasn't killed off 
was because of my bloodline. I was the king's son, something I didn't find out about until much later on in life. Was your father weak or ill by any chance, Vegeta asks? Perhaps, but first let's talk about the few years I spent on planet Magos. Maybe it's because the planet is home to the greatest mages in the universe. For some reason, the Saiyans thought I'd live a better life there than on my own planet. I guess it was their way of forsaking me. I was sent to planet Magos where an old mage picked me up. He had called me by the name Cumber and raised me like his own son. Without even realizing it, I grew up to be a strong kid and then at the age of 5 when the old mage who at that time was already well over 400 years old, sat me down next to him and told me a story. Five years ago, there was a weak and pale kid who crash landed on this planet. An old mage picked him up and called him by the name that was embezzled onto his space pod. The infant was surely going to die. The only way to save him was for the old mage to share his own magical life force and he knew it. In fact, that was what he was planning to do. He was fully intent on dying for the sake of this infant to survive. However, when he started sharing his energy, something inside of the infant awakened. His tail sprung out of his back and he slowly opened his eyes. A brutal death glare. This restricts the mage in his tracks as he had given the infant some of his own magical life force but not enough for himself to drop dead. Did he change his mind? No. It was that death glare which gave the mage a bad feeling about giving him even more of his magical life force. Vegeta would then interrupt saying, wait, isn't he just talking about you? What happened next? Stop interrupting, I was getting to that, Psycho replies and then he continues. Of course back then I had no idea that he was talking about me, nor did I know that these were his last moments. He used growth magic to enlarge my tail and then left me with these words. Live, Cumber. Your name symbolizes health and vitality. You must live. And faded away with a smile on his face. I had no concept of death back then. I thought maybe it's just a trick that he'll come back soon, right? Well, days turned into weeks and then months, but nobody returned. We lived alone in a secluded forest, so there was no one I could turn to for help. Then one day, I remembered the mage's love for fish and decided to go get some. Went to the river, had no luck there, then to the lake, but still no luck again until finally while passing by a big tree, I spotted this unusual looking ball. I approached it to take a closer look and then suddenly, it hit me. There was a name written on it, and it was Cumber. I knew nothing about the universe, nothing about my race, not even anything about the planet I was currently living on. The only thing I knew, the only thing I could experience, was pure chaotic rage about it all. I no longer cared about the old mage. The fact that I knew nothing drove me insane. Just what the hell is going on, I screamed and unleashed a sinister pulse that sent a ripple throughout the entire planet. A herd of mages started appearing right in front of me. They kind of sensed the old mage's magical energy within me and automatically assumed that I took his life or something like that. I didn't care either. If they were approaching me with the intention to kill, I simply returned that intent. I killed one mage and then another and then some more. As the kill count continued to increase, so did that magical energy within me. Something inside of me was absorbing their life force and making me stronger, healthier, and definitely more vital. At only age 5, I had killed 2,000 mages on planet Magos. Vegeta then asked, is that supposed to be a big deal or something? Well, yeah. Apparently Universe 6 is very high on the magic rating scale and so every one of those mages is responsible for maintaining the flow. I didn't know this at the time though up until about the age of 13. I continued my killing spree because I enjoyed the boost in magical power I'll be honest. It felt so good. By age 15 I had more magic in my veins than blood. 
but once again, I didn't know. Eventually, when over 90% of the mages were taken out, they initiated a spell which transported me back to the Saiyan planet. Imagine my father's surprise when the newborn he abandoned all those years ago suddenly appeared in his face as a 15-year-old boy. Meanwhile, as Zykor continues to tell his hellish story, Whis and Valos are about to execute on the orders given to them by the Grand Priest. They arrive at the location of Planet Magos and prepare to revive all of its former glory. Whis and Valos are reviving the planet and the magical energy along with it. They both get flashbacks of the events that took place over 1000 years ago. How Zykor essentially tapped into Primal Instinct at the age of 5, not just because of his unusual disposition, but also because of that magical life force he was given. It fueled the primal gene within him. He was still a kid though, so other than the killing of those mages, there wasn't much his body could do. He didn't know how to fly either. However, after he was abruptly transported to the Saiyan planet, Zykor had another awakening. It didn't take him long to realize that the king was his father and that all of these clueless clowns who forsake him are actually several tiers weaker than him. Coincidentally, that was the night of the full moon. Zykor began to transform. He would enter the primal Uzaru state and then jumped back into the cosmos. The beast was driven by pure chaos. Primal Instinct was manipulating the hyperspace and shifting the energy of the universe in real time. And the reason why his impact on the universe was so everlasting is because Zykor also possessed the magical force of the blessed race of mages. The combination of Primal Instinct and the magical flow of the universe enabled him to permanently damage the frequency of the universe, which is a violation worse than killing a Supreme Kai. His Uzaru state continued for 10 years. He did a lot of damage during that time, of course. Those 10 years were marked as the Dark Age. Destroyer Champa was asleep. The Supreme Kai feared him as much as the Supreme Kai of Universe 7 feared Majin Buu. Isn't this kind of the same thing that's happening with Broly right now, Vado Sass? No, Goku managed to help Broly avoid succumbing to his Uzaru state. Broly isn't that far gone, Whis replies. Indeed. Zykor's rage, however, is different. His primal instinct was more raw and random because he hasn't even tapped into the actual transformation yet. It was simply running on all cylinders. At one point, the dark energy itself tried to shove him out of the universe because for what it's worth, he was an impurity. The Supreme Kai capitalized on this idea and used a spell to send Zykor to Universe 7. However, Beerus wasn't asleep unlike Champa. Since the angels can't interfere directly, he was their only hope now. The Grand Priest once said that fate works in strange ways, and what happens next is the perfect example of this analogy. During this time, a Saiyan legend named Yamoshi became the legendary Super Saiyan in a struggle against the evil Saiyans. Zykor was kicked out of Universe 6 right before this. Events aligned in such a way that Yamoshi caught a glimpse of Zykor in the cosmos of Universe 7 before he became the legendary Super Saiyan and just like him, Zykor felt a little calmed down when he sensed another Saiyan awakening. For the first time in 10 years, he had reverted back to his regular size while still in his primal instinct state. He felt strong, he felt ruthless and more importantly, he felt freed of those shackles. Beerus had already been informed of Zykor's arrival as he was there waiting, together with Whis, and saw it all happen. He saw Yamoshi transform into the legendary Super Saiyan, and he saw Zykor revert back. And these events could very well be what sparked those dreams in Beerus that caused him to awaken many years later in search for the Super Saiyan God. The simultaneous happening of those two events fueled Beerus' appetite unlike any food he had ever eaten before. But he decides to be a responsible adult and takes Zykor back to Universe 6 where he then wakes up Champa and tells him to deal with his own situation. When Beerus returns, he takes a few days long nap and plans to go meet Yamoshi after this. Be that as it may, Zykor did almost lose to Champa. He knew that the Destroyer is gonna be a problem and he had also learned about the connection with the Supreme Kai. So, what does Zykor plan to do next? Of course, he actually is gonna go and kill the Supreme Kai. The Grand Priest of course didn't want things to reach the point of no return and so he personally revives the Supreme Kai right at the moment he's killed. 
He's also the one who decided to punish Zykor with the non-existence. And just like that, everyone's memory of him and what he did got erased. Things eventually would go back to normal. Perhaps not because the mages started having premonitions about a tail beast who will eventually kill them and so they took precautions and rid all of the sands of their tails. They may have forgotten about Zykor now, but that sense of danger is still there. And of course, Beerus would also forget. The only thing he could remember now was that faint image of Yamoshi, but he can't quite pinpoint or name what it is, and so he kind of forgets all about it for the time being. Eventually, a thousand years later, this faint image starts appearing in his dream, and of course, this would lead to Super Saiyan God Goku. Right now, Beerus is asleep, but when Whis is going to wake him up, he will instantly remember the actual reason behind those dreams and how he already knew the incoming rival long before the Oracle Fish made that premonition. So going back to Zykor and Vegeta, he's done telling his story now, at least up until the point of non-existence and then how he killed the last mage of Planet Magos out of spite after he broke free. Subsequently, the endless slaps back and forth by Goku finally worked because Broly has now come back to his senses. All thanks to Goku, Universe 7 was able to avoid pretty much all of the destruction that was caused in Universe 6 a millennia ago. Okay Broly, from now on, I want you to meditate with Piccolo every single day for an entire month, Goku asserts. Broly nods as Piccolo looks at Goku like he's lost his damn mind and then just runs away. Then there's the Grand Priest. He would go into his room and take out a scroll. He opens it and wonders, would it be better to just kill the Saiyans, or perhaps there's a way to institutionalize this primal instinct? Shout out to our first ever fan manga ever, our Black Frieza vs. Beerus saga, because a lot spawned from that. Ever since Beerus sentenced Frieza to spin in an infinite vortex for all of the rest of eternity, well, Goku and Vegeta would then go on to wish all of the Saiyans of Universe 7s to get their tails. Vegeta would then go to Universe 6, battle against Hit, and then he would eventually befriend the worst offender in the history of Universe 6, the primal beast Zykor. Meanwhile, Goku would tag along with Broly, get absolutely pulverized when Broly would unlock Primal Instinct, but this ultimately leads to you guys hitting that like button and Goku's own version of Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker called Model Sun Wukong. He manages to help Broly snap out of it, and for more context, trust me because we're on part 11 right now, you're gonna want to at least go back and watch the previous chapter. So chapter 10 along with the entire playlist will be linked down below in the description box as well as pinned in the comments. But as far as our story from here on out, let's hop right in. Zykor has just finished telling Vegeta the story of his past and how he became the worst offender in this universe's history. Vegeta internalizes all of it and tells Zykor the one thing he wasn't ready to hear in that moment. Listen, Zykor, I'll tell you the real reason why you so desperately want to kill all of the Saiyans of Universe 6. It's because they remind you of your weakness, don't they? And it's also because it's your fault that the survivors of Planet Magos used their prowess to rid them of their tails. There's no other way to put it. You don't detest weakness, Zykor. You only detest your own weakness. Now, ordinarily, Zykor would have blasted anyone who dared say anything like that to him, but not in this case. He's already acknowledged Vegeta as a friend, and so, as any sincere friend would, he simply replies, You're absolutely right, Vegeta. Looking back, all my life has been nothing but complete chaos, except those first five years I spent with the old mage, but back when I didn't know about my weakness, I lived in peace. Though, now that I put it into words, it really doesn't make sense, does it? Vegeta lets out a little laugh. Find yourself a woman, Zykor. I was already a little messed up in the head before I found my woman. The right woman is going to heal you, and in your case, I already know the perfect fit. Following this conversation between Vegeta and Zykor, seven days have passed. A lot of things happened in the past week. After reviving Planet Magos together with Vados, Whis went back to Planet Beerus and proceeded to wake Beerus up from his slumber because of the Grand Priest's order. What is it, Whis? Have those two numbskulls finally begun to rival me in strength, Beerus asks? Perhaps. Who knows? Maybe they've already surpassed you, Whis replies. Oh, really? Beerus says while trying to grab the chocolate shake that's always right next to his bed. 
How strange. I'm having trouble finding my protein shake, Whis, Beerus adds, as he still has on his blindfold. Lord Beerus, you lost your arm because of Frieza. Try your left hand, Whis states. Man, now that you mention it, curse Frieza. I can't even eat hamburgers from here on out. How long was I asleep this time, Whis, he asks. Barely a week, I'm afraid, Whis replies. Beerus instantly shoots the chocolate shake in his mouth at Whis. Goku and Vegeta managed to rival me in just a week? You gotta be kidding me. I was planning on sleeping for at least 500 more years, Beerus says. Well, if it makes you feel any better, it wasn't just because of them I woke you up. No, it was the Grand Priest. He ordered me to end your slumber, Whis replies. I see. Well, at least he didn't ask you to end me in my slumber. That would have sucked. Anyways, what's going on with the Grand Priest? He doesn't usually wake people out of their sleep. That's not how he asserts dominance, Beerus asks. He didn't really give me a clear answer either, but I guess it's related to Primal Instinct, Whis replies. This name rings a bell in Beerus' head. Everyone's memories of Zykor were erased after he was punished with non-existence, but now that Zykor has broken free, Beerus suddenly begins to remember it all. How he was supposed to take care of Primal Zykor when he was sent to Universe 7, how he saw Yamoshi become the legendary Super Saiyan, and his plan to meet the Saiyan legend himself. Unfortunately, when his memories were erased, he forgot all about Yamoshi. Until eventually, about a thousand years later, he began to see Yamoshi's spirit in his dreams, and he was also told about the Super Saiyan God prophecy. Beerus would then get up from his bed. Instantly, he puts on his official attire and says, Let's go, Whis. I want to see what Goku and Vegeta have been up to. Looks like interesting things happened while I was asleep. The two of them then teleport back to Earth. In Universe 6, Hit was told by his ancestor that Primal Instinct is an incomplete evolution. It only brings harm and ruin upon not just the universe, but also oneself. His ancestor is the Grand Elder of Planet Moors. His name is Thanatos, and he's been around since before Zeno erased the six universes. He was given a punishment, which is why he can now never leave Planet Moors, but for what it's worth, He's the one of the oldest users of Primal Instinct. Then, there's planet Magos, the epicenter of magic. Its revival allows Universe 6 to heal from all of the damage that was caused by Zykor a thousand years ago. To make it a little bit easier to understand, planet Magos is kind of like that magic bag that big guy had in the Puss in Boots movie. It's pretty much that. As for what's going on right now, well, Piccolo has been helping Broly meditate so that this absolute beast of a Saiyan doesn't just suddenly start causing chaos and disorder in the universe again. As for Goku's request. Goku is training Gohan, just trying to whip him into shape a little bit, while Beerus and Whis have been going from food festival to food festival, just trying to find a suitable hamburger size that can be eaten with one hand. Both of them always stock up on a lot of food and then just watch Goku train Gohan. This is their entertainment for the time being. Trunks and Goten are doing their best as well, seeing Broly's power awaken that innate Saiyan desire to get stronger within them. However, none of them are aware of what's really happening behind the scenes. Dr. Hito from the Red Ribbon Army managed to capture the radiation emitted from Broly's primal instinct, and he's infused Cell Max with it. In a couple of years, perfected Cell Max will awaken and dominate everything. Going back to Universe 6, Vegeta has Caulifla introduce Zykor to Kel. Trust me, Zykor, she is the perfect woman for you, Vegeta says. Uh, just between me and you, Vegeta? I don't like them both. Why limit myself to just one? I mean, they're both Super Saiyans as well, Zykor says, sharing his thoughts. I understand what you mean, but this is about helping you contain your urge to destroy weakness. It's to help you grow. So just get along, see if you're compatible, try to marry this woman, and whatever, Vegeta replies. And just like that, it would take a while, but Zykor would eventually marry Kale, and now it would only be a matter of time before a Saiyan with unprecedented potential is born. The best is still yet to come. Vegeta, on the other hand, starts wondering about a way to give everyone on planet Sadala a tail, kind of like Goku did. Hopefully before Zykor and Kale have their first child as well. Hey Zykor, unleash your primal instinct. Vados will take note and observe the situation here from her crystal orb. I'll use the opportunity to call her here, Vegeta says. Sure enough, 
Zykor goes above the atmosphere, unleashes his primal instinct at full throttle, and Vados would eventually appear. Very shrewd, Vegeta, she says. Yes, I apologize for the inconvenience, but is there any way to give the Saiyans of Universe 6 their tails back, he asks. Yes, I can, but I'm not supposed to get directly involved, so you're better off going to planet Magos and asking the revived inhabitants to remove the curse, she replies. And it looks like Vegeta seems ready to go there, but something interesting would happen. In the next moment, Vegeta, Zykor, Vados, Goku and Broly, Whis and Beerus, and even Champa are suddenly brought to a really familiar place, Zeno's Palace. The Grand Priest welcomes them and asks, what do you two think, Whis? Vados? Should I erase these four Saiyans right here before they continue to change the disposition of the universe, or is there a better way that you might know of? Hey now, Zykor immediately begins to speak, but Vegeta stops him in his tracks. He wants the conversation to play out. In that case, if I may, Grand Priest, Goku and Vegeta have proven themselves capable of harnessing their Saiyan prowess without abusing the chaos of primal instinct. Their recent Limit Breaker transformations are definitely a type of primal instinct, just more dignified. That's why they were able to contain Broly and Zykor respectively. And so, if we just allow Goku and Vegeta to keep an eye on Broly and Zykor for the time being, I believe that not just the Saiyan race, but our understanding of Primal Instinct as a whole will evolve tremendously, we states, and he does that professionally. The Grand Priest nods and then looks towards Vados. It was her turn to speak. I second what we said, and besides, as hard as we try throughout history, we've never been able to fully snuff out the flames of Primal Instinct. It has shown up again now, and it will show up again in the future, I fear. Allowing it to nurture is perhaps the only way forward, and what better race can harness its power than the Saiyan? They are a primal race after all, she finishes. Hearing this, the Grand Priest replies, Excellent. As always, the two of you have brilliant judgment, though I'm not convinced just yet, not fully. I want to hear it from the Saiyans themselves. Saying this, the Grand Priest faces both Goku and Vegeta and then asks, So do you two think you're capable of doing what nobody in the history of the multiverse has ever done? In mastering the legendary Primal Instinct. Both Goku and Vegeta would look at each other, both letting out a grin, and then Goku would say, Super Saiyan 5? Well that's your answer Grand Priest. This transformation is going to be everything Vegeta would finish. Beerus and Champa look at each other in disbelief. They were just chilling a couple of minutes ago and now they have to hold their breath in front of the Grand Priest? As for the Grand Priest himself, he considers the words of Whis and Vados and also considers Goku and Vegeta's confidence. He uses his Omni Premonition to see if allowing these Saiyans to live right here will be the right choice and in the wake of his premonition, the Grand Priest gives the go. I understand. I'll let you guys go for now, but Zykor, if you let your bloodlust out once again, you're going to be upset by the guards, he says. Though before he could transport them back to where they were, Vegeta steps up and asks the Grand Priest for a favor. He gets right to the point. I'd like you to make it so that the scenes of Universe 6 have tales just like how they used to have in the past. Mastering Primal Instinct is directly related to letting the Saiyans go back to their natural disposition. This is my request as the current Saiyan King of Universe 7, Vegeta states. It felt ridiculous. In the past, the Saiyan King of Universe 7 was stepped on by Destroyer Beerus and yet, now Vegeta is asking the Grand Priest for a favor using his Saiyan title. It was kind of poetic a little bit. It makes no sense, but since it was so ridiculous and maybe also because the Grand Priest had already acknowledged him, he obliges. And with that, thanks to Vegeta, every Saiyan alive, whether it be in Universe 6 or Universe 7, now has a tail. Vegeta has steered the future of the Saiyan race in the right direction in my opinion. Now the next goal of the Saiyan race is to finally achieve the ultimate Saiyan evolution, and I hope you guys are ready for the next arc in this what if, because next, the perfect combination of Primal Instinct and Saiyan Blood, or as dubbed by Goku and Vegeta, the transformation called Super Saiyan 5, is on the way. And with part 11 coming to a close, we are finally gonna conclude the first arc of what if Goku and Vegeta wish their tails back. Make sure you guys are subscribed, have those notifications on because the second arc of this what if is going to be twice as crazy as the first.
Following the trip to Zeno's palace, Whis takes everyone to planet Beerus. By everyone, we mean the four Saiyans, Goku, Vegeta, Broly, and Zykor, as well as Beerus, Champa, and Vados. Since parting ways over a week ago, this was the first time Goku and Vegeta had the opportunity to talk to each other again. I see you've also ascended Kakarot. Very impressive, Vegeta states. Yeah, and good going, Vegeta. Lord Beerus was basically withering away when you talked back to the Grand Priest, Goku replies. Vegeta grins and gives him a fist bump. Goku then grabs Broly and instant transmissions all the way back to Earth. Sure, it had been crazy so far, but they know that it was only about to get crazier from here on out. So, was that Kakarot guy like your brother or something? Zykor asks Vegeta, but Vegeta doesn't reply. Instead, he faces Beerus and puts forth a certain proposal. Release Frieza, Lord Beerus. Now that I've acknowledged myself as the king, it's only befitting that I get rid of him for good. Sure, why not? I don't care either way, Beerus obliges. He felt oddly cooperative. You appear to be in an unusually good mood today. Is everything all right, Whis asks. In response to this, Beerus raises his left arm and then his right arm. Whis and Vegeta look at each other all confused. They wonder if this gesture has some special meaning attached to it, and about 20 seconds later, it finally clicks. Frieza ripped off his right arm, so he isn't supposed to have them both right now. When did it respawn, Vegeta asks. So Beerus replies, It's all thanks to you, Vegeta. When the Grand Priest gave the Universe 6 Saiyans tales again, he must have noticed me pondering in the background because the next thing I knew, I had my arm back. Very well then, let's go pulverize Frieza so that I can go to Earth and feast upon some good old hamburgers. Psychor still had no idea what was going on, but at this point, he'd rather just see it for himself than try asking for an explanation. Hold on, Vegeta. You still haven't introduced me to your new friend here, Beerus asks. My apologies, this is Zykor from over 1,000 years ago. You may have heard about him from Champa or Vados, Vegeta replies. Beerus immediately disappears from sight, reappears right in front of Zykor, and looks into his eyes with the intention of taking his soul. But of course, Zykor remains unhinged. Beerus laughs and gives him a thumbs up. I see why you were able to put a beating on Champa, he says. Whis then takes them all to the figment of the universe where Frieza had been swirling around inside an eternal vortex, and well, Beerus would snap his fingers and immediately set him free. Frieza's state of existence inside the vortex was less than desirable. He was always in a half-conscious state, couldn't sleep, couldn't think, just endless epilepsies. This is why it takes Frieza almost 5 minutes before he realizes that he's no longer just swirling around. And then it takes about another 5 minutes before he can clearly see again. What the hell was that? He screams and gasps. Beerus, on the other hand, was still in a very good mood. He approaches Frieza, gently taps him on the shoulder and asks, How you been? This just fills Frieza's head with pure horror. Sorry, that was a strange thing to ask, Beerus states. He was engaging in some like 5D psychological warfare with Frieza right now and Frieza was done. Frieza may have trained his body to survive even on planet X, but it was impossible for anyone to survive something like the infinite vortex. It literally rips your consciousness apart and leaves you in a state of perpetual crippling dread. Wow, I've never seen a more pathetic face in my life, Zygor comments. For real, let's make sure that we never piss off Lord Beerus. This seems insane, Vegeta adds. Vegeta, do you still want to fight Frieza, Whis asks? Vegeta nods, and so... Whis uses his staff to heal Frieza's mind, body, and soul until all that's left is information of what he endured in the vortex. In the wake of this, Frieza immediately calms down. He takes a minute to process what happened and then bursts into hysterical laughter. Time continues to pass, but Frieza's laughter doesn't stop. It's contagious, it's rhythmic. I knew it, Beerus says with a scowl on his face. Everyone watching this video right now has already left a like, so I don't even gotta ask. Frieza's aura felt heavily unstable, but his power level, his heartbeat, and even his laughter, they were all 
oddly rhythmic, almost as if the universe had accepted him back into it. The laughter never stops, but Frieza starts looking around. And the moment he exchanges glances with Beerus, he eclipses right there and unleashes a swirling kick. From Beerus's position, it would seem impossible to block that kick in time, but Beerus was still unafraid. It was all over the place. Conveniently though, Vegeta saw that motion happen, and instead of Beerus having to trouble himself once again with this guy, Vegeta would blitz there and block the kick in Beerus' stead. And nothing quite puts a smirk on Frieza's face like this than the thought of killing a Saiyan like Vegeta. Excuse me, Lord Beerus, leave this one to me, Vegeta requests. Sure enough, Beerus gets out of the way and lets him have a go like he was supposed to. Is it me or has Vegeta been more polite ever since he declared himself the king of Saiyans, Beerus asks. Yeah, it's not just you. Looks like Vegeta has started to change in a way nobody expected, Whis replies. Huh. Let's see whether that'll be a good thing or a bad thing, Beerus says. Meanwhile, at planet Earth, Broly joins Piccolo in his meditation again while Goku continues training Gohan. Not good enough, Gohan. Training alone will not be enough. We'll have to find you a good opponent, Goku states. Goten was observing them with trunks again. He says, well, there aren't really many people in the universe who could really pose a threat to bro. I guess that's a good point, Goten. Luckily, we have someone right here on Earth trying to craft the perfect opponent for Gohan, Goku adds. No way, who, Gohan asks. You aren't there yet, Gohan. I noticed it the moment I returned to Earth. Broly noticed it too, and he wasn't even conscious, Goku replies. Gohan was confused, and same goes for Goten and Trunks and probably everybody else too because Goku is speaking all ominous right now. He notices the curious expressions on all of their faces and decides to act. Relax, boys, you'll know soon enough. For now, how about I teach you boys how Super Saiyan 4 works, he says, and everyone would rejoice. Now, going back to Vegeta versus Frieza, this battle was getting spicier by the minute. Vegeta has already unleashed both Ultra Ego and the Super Saiyan 4 transformation. In theory, he is technically stronger than Frieza, but Frieza seems to be missing something inside of him. Unlike before, he can no longer feel pain. It apparently doesn't matter how many times Vegeta hits him, he just tanks everything and continues to laugh like a maniac. Beerus and Whis notice how despite the fact that Frieza is the underdog here, nature seems to be on his side. The more he endures, the stronger he gets because of Ultra Ego and it's not like he can feel pain right now. So it looks like the current Frieza is like Broly in terms of closing the gap between yourself and your opponent. Impressive, Zykor states. I know, right? He used to be the emperor of the universe and such a good kid, Beerus replies. No, not Frieza, I mean Vegeta. He's still at a disadvantage and has yet to use his full strength, Zykor adds. So you noticed it as well, huh? Very perceptive, Zykor. Yes, Vegeta has yet to use the Limit Breaker state of Super Saiyan 4. I wonder why he's planning on dragging this out. He knows that Frieza is getting stronger by the minute, doesn't he, Whis states? Oh, so there is a Limit Breaker form too. How interesting. These Saiyans just continue to surprise me, Beerus says. Indeed, regardless of the personal history of the emotional baggage, Vegeta was unusually apathetic to Frieza almost as if this is the first time he had ever fought him. Vegeta felt like this. If Frieza can't feel pain during the fight, then Vegeta would make up his mind to not feel anything either. He doesn't want Frieza to get any sort of satisfaction whatsoever from this battle. As much as this is a physical battle, Vegeta has waged a psychological war on the crown. He seeks to make Frieza's death a part of his history. And at the same time, Vegeta was kind of embedding some of the primal instinct from his Limit Breaker into Ultra Ego to reach some sort of equilibrium. The idea is to simultaneously collect ideas on how to make Super Saiyan 5 a reality. This man is multitasking right now. He's indifferent to the past and fully engaged in the present and also keeping an eye out for the future, Beerus declares. What a noble man and leader you are, Vegeta. I want to immigrate to Universe 7 right now, Zykor mentions. Yeah, but what's the point? It's not like Vegeta's winning right now. This fight is going nowhere. 
If he's so strong, he should just end it, Beerus adds. Lord Beerus, I was observing Vegeta's fight with Hit, and he was doing something similar during that fight. Rather than going all out, he was getting himself accustomed to all of Hit's fine-tuned killer techniques. It might not seem like much, but in doing so, Vegeta became immune to attacks that cannot be seen. It was poetic to say the least, Whis replies. And then out of nowhere, Vegeta would stop. He releases all of his transformations and reverts back to his base state. He does this without losing any of the strength and attack potency he had during those forms. Frieza being Frieza, however, would see this as an opportunity to kick Vegeta into the vortex which was still there behind them. However, by this point, Vegeta was so in tune with Frieza's movements that, as far as he was concerned, Frieza had already lost. And there he was, standing in the turbulent cosmos, giving off an aura of invincibility, a true king. Frieza could feel it in his soul that attacking Vegeta right now would be the end of him, yet he does so anyway. He launches himself straight at Vegeta without any regard for what may or may not happen. It would take Frieza about 10 seconds to reach Vegeta and yet, Vegeta is still choosing not to use any transformations. When only about 5 seconds remain, Vegeta would close his eyes and Frieza continues on. At 3 seconds? Vegeta's eyes are still closed. Two seconds, one second. And right when Frieza finally touches Vegeta with the intention to pierce his heart, Vegeta moves for a fraction of a second, but during that instant, he unleashes the absolute pinnacle of what he was capable of. No power-ups required. He would enter the ultimate limit breaker for a mere nanosecond penetrates Frieza's chest and grabs his tail from inside of his chest. This is where he opens his eyes. One look and anyone could tell that Vegeta was giving Frieza an absolutely poisonous gaze. He then signals Whis to heal Frieza, which he does, but it was too late. Frieza's psyche had been damaged beyond repair and his fighting spirit was crushed. He'll never think about crossing a Saiyan ever again. Lord Beerus, I have a present for you, Vegeta says. Oh yeah, what is it, Beerus asks. A slave, Vegeta says, but as he says this, Beerus could tell that this man Vegeta had obtained mastery over himself finally. They say heavy is the head that wears the crown and all you need is one look at Vegeta to see how true that is, but no matter how you may feel about him, Vegeta had become king and finally conquered the Saiyan's biggest enemy. Frieza got his cheeks clapped by Vegeta in the last part of What If Goku and Vegeta Wish Their Tales Back Season 2 and that particular news would travel fast around the universe. Anarchy starts brewing on all of the planets that were victims to Frieza's planet trade organization, feeling the time for rebellion has never been better. By mere word of mouth, Vegeta is soon revered as the new tyrant or warlord of the universe. Frieza's forces are quickly devoured by the very locals they once persecuted. Universe 7 goes through an abrupt and sudden change. Looks like Vegeta just ended everything your family stood for. How are you holding up, Frieza? We sarcastically ask. Well, all good things must eventually come to an end, Beerus states while patting Frieza on the shoulder. He couldn't have asked for a better slave. It seems you're pleased with the way things turned out, huh, Lord Beerus? Vegeta says. Don't flatter yourself, Vegeta. It's because of my infinite vortex that Frieza's conscience crumbled. Wait, how about we send you on that little merry-go-round as well, Beerus asks. Vegeta smirks a little and then faces Zykor. Zykor states, now then, what should we do next? You're forgetting something very important, my friend, Vegeta smugly replies. What? He asks. You have a wife now, and yours is a Saiyan back on our home planet in this universe. You should go back to Sadala to kill for now, Vegeta asserts. Zykor obliges and is taken back to Sadala. The future of the Saiyan race seems bright. Meanwhile on Earth, when night rolls around, Goku teaches the Saiyan hybrids how to transform into Super Saiyan 4. Goten and Trunks aren't quite ready yet, they just simply cause havoc while in their Uzaru state and pass out. But Gohan is different. Having already ascended to his ultimate state several times in the past, 
His instincts have the proclivity to sharpen themselves, only when it counts though. Under the starry full moon, Gohan transforms into a great ape. He isn't the embodiment of chaos like Broly or anything like that, so he somehow manages to retain his consciousness even in the great ape state. Be that as it may, he still requires some sort of a challenge to be able to visualize himself ascending to that next level. Goku was the one training him. Yes, he can punch Gohan really hard, but that won't really be enough. Gohan requires an external stimulus from someone who he genuinely perceives to be dangerous. Alright Broly, you're up I guess. Try to punch Gohan really hard, Goku says. Broly would oblige. He punches Great Ape Gohan almost as hard as he could, but maybe it's the meditation Broly has been doing with Piccolo because Gohan didn't really feel that innate sense of malice or danger from Broly. Conveniently, Vegeta, Beerus, and Whis would show up right on time. Whis has already escorted Zykor back to Sadala and, well, Frieza is at Beerus' planet. Goku was taken aback at how early Vegeta was able to colonize Frieza, so in order to get a better whiff of Vegeta's current might, Goku asks him to do something about Gohan here. What do you mean? He still needs motivation to get even stronger, Vegeta asks? I mean, I guess you could say that. Do something about him, Vegeta. I rough him up a little bit, I guess, Goku replies. And so in the wake of this, Vegeta decides to do the same trick he used against Frieza just absolutely maul him in one move and permanently disrupt the way his body perceives danger. Everyone watches closely, especially Goku and Beerus. They want to know why Vegeta's aura now seems so calm and complete. Not letting anyone know your next move. Pretty sneaky, Vegeta, Goku comments smirking. Gohan greets Vegeta while still in his great ape state, and Vegeta replies, Pay close attention, Gohan. I'm gonna hit you really, really hard. You won't be able to see what hits you, but still, prepare yourself for anything. I believe this will help you though. Gohan knows that Vegeta is dead ass. All right, brace yourself, Gohan, Vegeta states. And so Gohan starts powering up. Of course, he goes with his ultimate state instead of just transforming into Golden Uzaru. At this point, there was still no way to tell where Gohan's potential is gonna take him from here on out, but the ultimate state coupled with his Uzaru transformation shows Vegeta a glimpse of a beastly aura that is unrecognizable in the context of what Gohan is right now. Vegeta grins and just as Gohan reaches his full power, he eclipses from sight and appears right behind him. Once again, he summons the full extent of his power for a tiny, almost insignificant period of time, but it was enough for him to completely destroy Gohan's back. Completely. Gohan fell unconscious the moment Vegeta's punch made contact with his back and a shockwave ripples the air for miles on end. Goku would be taken aback. What was that just now, Vegeta? You felt invincible there for a second, he asks. Strength is fluid. Once you realize this, the universe falls into place, Vegeta replies. When Gohan wakes up, he's in a hospital bed with his entire upper body plastered. Goku visits him soon together with Goten. What happened, Dad? He asks. Vegeta did what he said he would do, Gohan, and then he strictly asked me to let you recover the normal way. No sensu beans or healing whatsoever, Goku replies. Ah, that sucks, and I'm already late for my PhD thesis, Gohan says, but the look on his face felt oddly relieved. Noticing this, Goku sits down right next to him and brings something out of his pocket. See this, Gohan and Goten? Before all of this recent stuff happened, I met a Namekian on Planet Serial, a distant planet far away, who gave me this. He somehow came across my father's scouter, Goku continues. He has Gohan and Goten's complete attention now. You know, I never really thought about the past. What's gone is gone, and I never knew my parents to begin with. But this little thing right here awakened a long lost memory I didn't even know I had. When I heard the audio stored in it, for the first time in my life, I remembered the faces of my mom and dad, as well as the last thing they said to me, telling me to stay alive. Goku's words create this surreal sense of awe and satisfaction in the hearts of Goten and Gohan. They never really thought about it, but they truly are the last remaining survivors of an almost extinct race. Dad, it seems like you've changed, Gohan asks. Yeah, I feel a lot more like a Saiyan, I guess, than I have ever before, Goku replies, and 
and he plays the audio stored in the scouter. It's a brief message of Bardock telling Minato and Granola to stay alive. Listen you two, I'm not gonna live forever. Neither will Vegeta or Piccolo for that matter, but with the way things are, the Earth and the universe are never going to be safe permanently. Whenever we deal with something, a new threat spawns right away. Even now as I speak, I can feel the tiny presence of something, not human. I'm not too sure what's going on right away, but if this thing is allowed to awaken in our universe, well, I'm tired of all of this constant havoc. You should always keep training, Gohan. You too, Goten. So that when you're strong, you can use your powers to help and protect others, Goku asserts. Goten nods while Gohan starts staring at the ceiling. Having listened to Goku for the past few minutes, he starts thinking about Pan. One day, he'll be gone too, and so he has to be a beacon of hope until then so that his daughter is well equipped to carry on the family's legacy. Guess I can kiss that PhD goodbye then, Gohan laughs a little. Oh yeah, about that. Here you go, Goku says as he just straight up hands him his diploma. Wait, what? How did- He asked. Chi Chi started nagging me about how you missed your thesis or something, so I asked Boma to do something about it, and she handed me this two days later. Look, I even got one for myself, Goku says while flexing his own diploma. Dad, you know that's illegal, right? Gohan says as he busts out laughing, but Goku completely ignores him as he's too focused on that shiny gold star that they put on his diploma. By the way, how long have I been out? I thought it had only been one night, but you said Boma got my diploma two days after you asked her, Gohan asks. This is when Goku looks at him sternly right in his eye. Gohan, you've been out cold for over half a year. For the first three months, you were placed in a medical machine and then shifted to this newly constructed hospital which Bulma created for you. For real, it was like you were almost dead until this morning, Goten adds. Those words strike a chord with him. He immediately gets up and asks Goku to take him back home. Goku obliges. He uses instant transmission and takes him back to the house. Videl and Pan would of course rejoice. As for all of the events that happened in the past 9 or so months, Broly learned how to control his power thanks to his meditation with Piccolo pretty much all day every day, Vegeta personally trained Trunks for the entire time, then recently decided to visit Planet Sadala together with him. This is his way of making Trunks feel a little bit closer to the Saiyan lineage as well. However, during these past 9 months, something else was going on in the background as well. You see, Dr. Hito had been creating a few ultimate androids for his own amusement. His project wasn't going to be realized until about two more years from now, but things changed after his radars picked up the chaotic aura about nine months ago when Primal Broly stepped foot on this planet. Fearing that the end of the world is in sight, and after getting fed some blatant lies from the Red Ribbon Army, Dr. Hito escalates the development of Gamma 1 and Gamma 2, and especially Cell Max. Goku knew this was going on even back then, so after Gohan was pulverized by Vegeta, he sought out Dr. Hito's lab and offered to lend him his own power for whatever reason. In his mind, if Gohan is to overcome Cell Max completely on his own, then the universe and the future is in good hands. But something in me just screams that this is like a thousand times worse than just throwing Cell a sensu bean, so Goku just never learns it seems like. Goku would also ask Android 17 to help Dr. Hito with the leg work as well. Are you sure about this Goku? Android 17 asks. This could get ugly. But I can't think of a better challenge for Gohan to overcome. He needs this fight, Goku replies. Dr. Hito has no clue what these two are on about, but if it helps him with the completion of the ultimate android, well, honestly, who cares? In the doctor's head, if Cell Max is born, the future will be in good hands. And now that nine months have passed, Cell Max is going to be born any minute now. Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 are already a thing. At Gohan's residence, Chi Chi soon arrives and starts pestering Goku about this, that, and the third. Then out of curiosity, Gohan asks Goku, what have you been up to these past nine months, Dad? Goku explains how he actually picked up Oob and started training him alongside Goten. Those two have gotten really strong together. But this is when Gohan asks, well, what else? And Goku would simply reply, well, that's a secret. Gohan had just recovered, so he still has no idea about Cell Max and the other two androids. And he also doesn't know that the time until he confronts the most brutal adversary he's ever faced 
It's less than seven days away. Meanwhile, at Planet Sadala, a Saiyan prodigy unlike anything Vegeta has ever seen before has been born. It's Zykor and Kale's son, and for some reason his hair has been crimson colored ever since birth. Right now, he's in the infirmary pod so that his body can adjust to the gravity of the planet. Vegeta is seen standing in front of it alongside Zykor. Does he really need to be in this pod? I mean, no offense Vegeta, but he's stronger than your fully grown son. He should be out conquering the universe right now, not sleeping in some pod, Zykor asserts. Alright, calm down. It hasn't even been a day since he was born. Let his body acclimate to the surroundings a little bit, Vegeta replies. And back on Earth, Gohan just couldn't get any sleep. His heart constantly reminding him of that danger that was lurking right around the corner. He goes outside to a wasteland and reminds himself of Vegeta's hit, and this time he actually succeeds in transforming into a Super Saiyan 4 for the first time ever. But Gohan could tell right away that this wasn't enough for whatever danger he could feel in his heart. Gohan is up and he's completely sane now. He's even become able to finally attain the Super Saiyan 4 transformation, but something still wasn't right. He can't really pinpoint it, but there's this empty feeling of insecurity deep inside Gohan's heart. When he begins to think about it a little more, his mind instantly goes back to how Goku wanted him to face a real adversary sooner than later. Yeah, that ought to be it. Dad is out there finding someone who will really give me a difficult time. Ah, this kind of reminds me of the Cell games, Gohan reminisces. Uh, hopefully nobody has to explode this time though. Little did he know his greatest adversary yet has not only already been chosen, it was also on the verge of awakening. A little less than seven days until Gohan faces his toughest opponent yet. The reason he can't calm down isn't because he's scared, it's because of this itch. Having regained his tail, Gohan is now closer to the beast whose potential was unleashed during the Buu Saga. That's right, he can't calm down because he knows. He knows that his mystic form or even his newly attained Super Saiyan 4 state aren't going to be enough for whatever is coming. Therefore. It's about time that Gohan embraces his own primal instinct. Then there's Planet Sadala, Kale, and Zykor who are in conflict over what their son's name should be. As you could probably imagine, Zykor wants to name him after the personification of violence. He wants his son to be named something like Keras. Kale liked it at first, I mean it had a nice ring to it and she also admits that it's going to be difficult to come up with a better name. but. Nah, she doesn't really want her son to be named after the goddess of violence. Vegeta is seen standing there with Kalifla and Kaba and then he takes his leave as there's definitely a better usage of his time. He goes to check up on Trunks and Prince Sadala. King Sadala is observing them as well. Hello King Sadala, Vegeta says. Hello to you too Vegeta, or should I say King Vegeta. You know, Zykor told me what you did to that Frieza guy. Guess we should be treating you as royalty from here on out, the king replies. Vegeta grins a little and then states, sure, suit yourselves. As for Trunks and Prince Sadala, it's more like an older brother tutoring a younger brother, except being careful is the last thing on Trunks' head. A couple of seconds after Vegeta joins, the prince passes out from exhaustion. Trunks gets a little worried and he wonders if he went too far. Seeing this, Vegeta walks up to them and slaps the prince into waking him up. King Sadala gets taken off guard, but he laughs it off. Good, that's how Saiyan warriors should be. When the prince is finally awake again, Vegeta gives him a few words of advice. Young man, power comes in response to a need, not a desire. You must need it like oxygen, I'm afraid that's the only way. Prince Sadala is absolutely mesmerized by Vegeta's words. The memories of Vegeta confronting Hit and then Zykor are still imminent in his head. He holds Vegeta in a higher regard at this point than his own father. To him, Vegeta is the pinnacle of Saiyanhood, the peak itself. For some reason, Vegeta could see it in his eyes. He slaps the prince again. Put no one on a pedestal, boy. Either surpass me or perish with the weak, Vegeta asserts. He then walks back inside and asks King Sadala to join him. Trunks knows exactly what his dad's up to and therefore, he also prepares his mind to teach the prince how to become a Super Saiyan, no matter how rough it's gonna be. Trunks turns his head back to see how the prince is holding up and he doesn't dislike what he sees. The prince's eyes were still the same, though they were still relaxed and kind, but his aura was fuming. 
Nice. Now let's try this again, Trunks says. Back on Earth, Broly asks Piccolo if there's any way to bring his friends Chile and Limo from King Kai's planet, as it had been a while since he last saw their faces. I'm not the right guy for that, Broly. Go ask Goku, Piccolo says. And well, this is how Piccolo finally catches a break to meditate alone. As for Goku, he's overseeing Goten and Oob at the moment. He's been training them for quite a few months now. It takes Broly less than a minute to find Goku though. What's up Broly? Goku asks. And so Broly explains how he'd like to see his friends. No way, it's really been 9 months? Oh, you should have asked me sooner, man. How can someone even survive that long on King Kai's tiny little planet? Goku replies. Broly then takes a moment to explain how he didn't want his friends to get hurt by him just because he couldn't control the primal instinct. But now that he's been meditating regularly for 9 months, he's confident enough in containing himself. Hearing this, Goku gives Broly a pat on the shoulder and says, You, my friend, never cease to amaze me. Hold on, I'll go get your friends right now. Broly smiles a little and takes a step back. Goku then uses instant transmission to fade away and then suddenly pops up on King Kai's planet. I heard you trash talking my planet, Goku. Do you have any shame? It's been decades and you still haven't revived me or my planet. Like, come on, he says. Sorry, King Kai, I'll get back to you later, Goku replies as he grabs Shile and Limo and immediately gets out of there. Here you go, Broly, I got your friends, Goku says. Broly gives them a huge thumbs up and then sets out with his friends to just go explore a little bit. These past nine months have been really hard for all three of them. And then there's the topic of this entire arc, Gohan. Every night he goes out into the wild and tries to understand his Super Saiyan 4 state. Dad and Broly were significantly stronger than me, and Vegeta was absolutely unbelievable. I have to figure out a new level of strength on my own, otherwise I'm of no use, Gohan says to himself. The time left until the emergence of the perfect primal android is only three more days. Going back to Goku and the boys, Dad, do you think it's about time we tell Gohan about Cell Max? It won't really be that funny if he just goes haywire and not even Gohan can stop him. We need to give him time to mentally prepare, Goten says. Well, that's where you're wrong, Goten. Your greatest enemy will never give you a warning in advance, and by the way, Gohan is already prepared. I experience his power level increase every night, Goku replies. Yeah, I'm not too sure what to think of that, Goten says. Subsequently, the Grand Priest has gone and visited the forbidden section of Universe 6. He arrived here using the traditional route so as to not alarm Vados and Champa. It took him two whole days, but he's finally here at Planet Moors. The Grand Elder greets him. My, it has been forever, hasn't it? How have you been, Lord Thanatos? First ever God of Destruction, the Grand Priest asks. I've been well, but I would feel better if you lift the curse off of me. I too crave the vastness of the multiverse, Grand Elder Thanatos replies. The Grand Priest laughs. That's exactly what I'm here for, my old friend. I've lifted off the curse, and you are now free to leave this planet, he says. Wait, what? Are you serious? Thanatos freaks out. You bet. I do need you to do a little something for me, though, and I believe you already know what this is going to be about, the Grand Prix states. I will happily oblige. Just say the words. My freedom is worth everything, he says. Young warriors from Universe 7 are finally showing some promise. The time when Primal Instinct will be completed is much closer than you think. So I want you to personally show these young ones the way, even if it means destroying them, the Grand Priest declares. <laughs> Thanatos would simply reply with a smirk. Long before the age of the 12 universes or even the original 18 universe, the multiverse was one and the same. Moors is a planet that has existed since the beginning, and Lord Thanatos is the progenitor of a race of which Hit is a part of. He currently acts like Hit's great-grandfather, I guess, but truth be told, he's much older than anything Hit can even imagine, and for better or worse, he is the most proficient user of the incomplete primal instinct. He was confined to this planet because his powers became too much for the multiverse to handle, but now that he's out again, how will our Saiyans handle the man whose power is chaos itself? The Grand Priest takes his leave. He has decided that the final obstacle that Goku and Vegeta will have to overcome in order to achieve Super Saiyan 5 is the first ever God of Destruction, Lord Thanatos. 
Days continue to pass, and finally, only one night remains until the emergence of Cell Max. Gohan goes out into the wild and gazes at the full moon. He can feel it in his soul that it's only a matter of time now. Goku, on the other hand, goes up to Piccolo and explains everything to him at this point. How he helped Dr. Hito with the creation of the ultimate primal android. Piccolo isn't too sure what to think of this. I mean, this whole idea is very worrisome at the least, but he's used to Goku's thinking process at this point. Fast forward to a few hours later, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 are already up and ready. Now, all that's left is for Cell Max to complete his synthesis. Piccolo and Goku are still at the lookout. He can't help but ask Goku, will everything really be okay? He might just nuke Earth right away and then go on some uncontrollable rampage. Don't even worry about it. He's been programmed to only go after Gohan and Gohan alone, but I'm afraid he's not gonna stop until Gohan's blood is completely dead, Goku replies. You know, Goku, you can really be insane sometimes, Piccolo comments. Then, right as the sun begins to come out from across the horizon, Cell Max's pod would explode. His aura is so overwhelming from the very beginning that Goku and Piccolo can notice him from the other side of the world. Broly actually gets a little startled by this as well, and even the Grand Priest who had been observing everything up until this point isn't quite sure what to think of where this might go for everyone. And well, as for Gohan, whoever this is, he knows that this is it. But what he doesn't know is that his greatest nemesis ever who had finally been born is gonna look a lot more familiar than what he might realize. Ma or excuse me, perfect Cell Max broke out of his pod as a newly born sentient being. His unusual and disruptive aura sent a wave of discomfort throughout the entire universe. Goku and Piccolo immediately realized that something is about to happen. Broly, who was chilling with his friends at the time, felt a little agitated because it looked like someone was about to get in the way of his free time once again. Naturally, Beerus and Whis are doing their due diligence and watching over the warriors. The Grand Priest does have high hopes for them to complete and master Primal Instinct, and he also kind of just sat there and watched Cell Max be born as well, so there's that. Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 go over and greet him. Where's Gohan, he asks, but follows it up with, sorry, that was a strange thing to ask. The thing is, he already knows where Gohan is. He already knows about all of the challenges he's overcome so far, and on Goku's request, Cell Max was exclusively designed and built to fight and destroy Gohan. And while it may be true that Gohan had no idea what Goku was up to, his adversary knew everything. Cell Max steps outside the facility, and Dr. Hito is just too scared to say a word. Only after his project was complete did he realize what he had truly done. It'd be one thing if Cell Max were to stop after destroying Gohan, but it isn't really that simple. As smart as he is, Dr. Hito was just unable to understand the natural proclivity of Primal Instinct. In a way, it was the most unpredictable power in the world. Something Zykor can definitely understand, and speaking of Zykor, it looks like he finally won the war against his wife Kale, and they're about to name their son. She definitely didn't want Zykor to name him after the goddess of violence, but it had been decided. Zykor and Kale's son will be named Kares. When Vegeta returns and asks Kalifla about how it was decided, she explains that from now on, they've agreed that it doesn't matter how many children they have, Kale will always be the one responsible for the names from here on out. Well, it's not like it was any of Vegeta's business to begin with. He was more interested in the child than the child's name. On one hand, you have Zykor, the first Saiyan to achieve primal instinct, and on the other hand, you have Kale, basically the female Broly. Vegeta picks up the baby, and for the most part, he's just like a normal Saiyan baby. However, as he's looking into the baby's eyes, giving his best smile, he notices a subtle disturbance in his power level. Coincidentally, it happens at the exact moment Cell Max is born. This makes him recall how Zykor mentioned that his newborn son is already stronger than Trunks. Nah, that's ridiculous, Vegeta says to himself and heads to the Great Hall. To celebrate Kari's birth, it was time for a feast. Now, going back to Cell Max, Gohan had already transformed into Super Saiyan 4 and is currently racing to his target's location. If it's gonna be going down either way, he'd rather have the battle take place far away from his own home and family. Cell Max catches this and chooses to wait outside the laboratory. Within the next two minutes, 
Gohan is already here, standing in front of Cell Max with his jaw dropped and his transformation undone. Seriously, he says? What's wrong, Gohan? Why did you undo your transformation, Cell asks. I was just taken off guard. I knew that Dad wanted me to fight someone strong soon, but who could have guessed that it'd be another Cell? This is crazy, Dad. But I'm not sure an android can handle any of the current Saiyans, Gohan declares. He was feeling oddly confident all of a sudden with this new power. Well, I do know what you're talking about, but comparing myself to the old Cell is foolish, Gohan. I mean, honestly, what are you wearing those big-ass glasses for? Can't you tell from what I did earlier? As far as the previous Cell is concerned, he is no different from a mere bug to me. I could squash him just like I could squash a roach. Now, hurry up and transform, Cell Max replies. Interesting. So do you actually believe that you're stronger than me? I mean, I am a potential Unleashed Saiyan and now a Super Saiyan 4 on top of it. Do you honestly have any chance, Gohan asks? Hearing this, Cell Max just laughs. I see what you're doing, Gohan. Very clever. You just tried to talk me into revealing my current power level, right? <laughs> Relax, you should have just asked. I don't need to hide anything. I mean, if you want to know how strong I am, let's just say that I am the strongest individual on this planet right now, Cell Max declares. This causes Gohan to pause and reflect. He also transforms again just in case. You gotta be kidding me. You mean to tell me you're stronger than my father and Broly? Wait, isn't Lord Beerus and we still on the planet as well? Are you stronger than them too, Gohan asks? Perhaps, Cell Max replies with a smirk. Subsequently, we would see Beerus and Whis visiting the sacred planet of the Kais at this moment, so at the very least, these two aren't on Earth, so that doesn't count. Of course, Gohan anticipates that, but even so, is this guy for real? Maybe Lord Beerus and Whis have already gone back, but is he really stronger than Dad and Broly? How is that even supposed to make any sense, Gohan thinks to himself. He releases the full extent of Super Saiyan 4 and proceeds to land a solid kick to Cell's neck. The result? Cell remained unhinged. Listen, Gohan, you'll have to try a lot harder than this if you want to hurt me, Cell says. It was no use. Gohan tried several different attack patterns, but he was just unable to hurt Cell Max. Goku and Piccolo are watching this battle take place from the lookout. Come on, Gohan. What are you gonna do, son? It's looking hopeless out there. How are you gonna defeat an enemy stronger than myself, Goku states? It's a little too late to play the sophisticated dad, Goku. Friendly reminder, it was you who pitched this monstrosity of an idea against Gohan. At least tell me that, if worse comes to pass, you're willing to step in, Piccolo asks. Listen, Piccolo. You're not gonna like what I'm about to say next. It's like this, Cell Max is modeled after universal elements. Maybe I can find a way to defeat him, but I won't be able to kill or erase him. It's impossible. As long as it's not Gohan who defeats him, this guy will keep coming back for all eternity. Much like Boo, if you will, but far more fearsome. Ironically, the most dangerous thing about this guy is his composure. You can never really tell what he's going to say or do next. I mean, look. Nothing phases him, does it? Goku replies. Going back to the battlefield, Gohan's anxiety is through the roof. What's ticking him off right now isn't Cell Max's defense as much as it is his own lack of desire to counter. From the moment the battle began till when Gohan landed the first hit, up until just now, Cell Max had made sure to not attack Gohan at all, countering not even a single time. He just yawns and says, You know, Gohan, Go back home for today and come back when you're stronger. This is a waste of time. No, no way you're actually saying this right now, Gohan says. Yes, I'll wait, my friend. Killing you right now would be such a waste. Go home and come back when you're well rested and maybe a bit stronger than your father at least, Cell Max replies. All right, so hypothetically, let's say I don't come back for a million years. Will you spend that entire time waiting here, Gohan asks? Once again, Cell Max just erupts in laughter. <laughs> Come on, Gohan, don't be silly. I'll be going around amusing myself. Maybe kill a few here and there so that you can finally start taking this seriously. Oh, I know. How about I go kill that pretty little wife and 
Well, Cell wasn't given the opportunity to finish that sentence. As he was listening to this, Gohan was explicitly shown a future where Videl, Pan, Chi Chi, and pretty much everyone else he had ever known or loved was dead. Almost as if a spell was placed on his head, he was deliberately forced into experiencing this. Naturally, when a Saiyan's emotions are blown out of proportion, their power level is the first thing that usually follows. Recently, the Saiyans have been tapping into Primal Instinct and this would be a catalyst. It's also what Vegeta used to knock Gohan out for months so he was familiar with it. So in response to the dark reality Cell showed him using some form of mind control, Gohan's body awakens the Primal Instinct and lands upon Cell Max a blow that sends his head flying. His head flies so fast that it travels the entire globe and comes back to this exact location. And ironically, he just catches it with his left hand and places it right back on his neck. Well, this is more like it. Let me make it clear for you, Gohan. If you failed to kill me, that is exactly what I'm going to do to your fan. Yet again, Gohan doesn't give him the opportunity to finish that sentence. He speed blitz his cell and kicks him right in the gut. In this case, it wasn't about where the kick landed as much as it was about the angle at which it did. Gohan made sure that the impact of that attack doesn't cause any unnecessary damage. All it does is that it leaves a massive crater where they were standing in, well, about 50 to 60 million kilometers away was Mars's moon Phobos, and it was instantly destroyed. See, this Gohan, this is exactly what makes Primal Instinct so dangerous. You're learning. Good, Selmax says. He was still unaffected for the most part, but unlike before, these last two attacks definitely did plenty of damage. At the lookout, Goku observes how Gohan is still not quite there yet. Don't lose yourself now, Gohan. There must be a limit breaker state exclusively only to you. You gotta find it. Harness it, that's the only way to fight and win against Cell Max, he says. You know, Goku, this Cell Max guy shouldn't be this strong. Just what kind of raw materials were used to make him this overpowered, Piccolo asks. Goku thinks about it a little and then says, I'm glad you asked. Well, you see, prior to meeting Dr. Hito, the little guy had already used Broly's primal energy and Golden Freeze's DNA. All I did was help him escalate the process by lending a little bit of my own life force as well. Maybe I'm biased, but I don't think it's me or Vegeta who will master primal instinct. No, I think it'll be Gohan. Now, Gohan is in his Super Saiyan 4 state. He's subconsciously adapting between primal instinct and mystic power to attain some sort of harmony or at least stability between the two. And while that isn't working, he's definitely getting stronger. Okay, so what's Super Saiyan 5 and why can't you or Vegeta do it, Piccolo asks. Honestly, it's just a name we came up with for a Saiyan transformation that successfully masters primal instinct. I don't know, maybe Gohan can come up with a better name. But because this is what we told the Grand Priest when we swore to be the ones to complete the Primal Instinct, I'm gonna stick with it, Goku replies. I guess that makes sense. Wait, so if Gohan is the one who becomes Super Saiyan 5 first, doesn't that go against your vow to the Grand Priest? You know, cause it won't be you or Vegeta, Piccolo asks. Nah, it's just like how I first became a Super Saiyan. Soon, everybody was able to do it. I'm sure that's also what it's gonna be like with Super Saiyan 5, it's just the next level after all, Goku states. The fight between Cell Max and Gohan on the other hand has reached a breaking point. Come on Gohan, I'm still alive and well. You know you can't have that. Use tomorrow's strength if you have to, but right now, right here, you must kill me, he says. Cell was able to forcefully make Gohan stronger using mind control, but as expected, it was unfair to assume that the current Gohan can just magically grow strong enough to defeat a being who not even the current Goku and Broly can defeat. A few months ago, he got one shot by Vegeta. In this fight, he'll break before he can handle any more mental illusions. Gohan is going to die. Ah, uh, this is painful to watch. It's bringing back old memories, Piccolo says. I know, but I have faith in him. He's always come through when it counts. Gohan will get through this. Besides, Goku pauses for a second and continues. Besides, the intention behind Cell Max is to make Gohan stronger. Even if Broly or I can manage to defeat him, it also defeats the purpose. That day, Gohan exhausted all of his life fumes 
and fell on the ground, completely and utterly defeated. Goku and Piccolo are watching this all from the lookout when suddenly he stares right back at them. I know you're up there, Goku. Come and pick up your son before my instincts decide to kill him, he says. The next moment, Goku was already there thanks to his instant transmission. Are you sure? If you kill Gohan, you're free to do whatever you want. Otherwise, you'll be bound to him for all eternity, Goku asks. Yeah, yeah, I know, but that'll be such a hollow existence. I'd rather not lose my only purpose in life so early in the game. Maybe I'll kill Gohan, or maybe Gohan will kill me, but... It seems the decisive day isn't today, so Max states. And just in case, this is when he triggers another horrifying mind illusion within Gohan's subconsciousness so that when he does wake up again, he has all the motivation in the world to quickly come after him. This one is super elaborate to say the least. Gohan and Cell Max are fighting in some other dimension. For every minute he fails to kill Cell, someone close to him is killed off and Gohan can see it happen on the wide screens all around him. First is Goku, Gohan knows his father will be alright, but who wants to be the reason for their father's death? So for the next 60 seconds, he tries to do whatever he can to kill Cell, but he fails. And then would follow Goten, and then Piccolo. Every time someone dies, Gohan seethes and rages. He goes after Cell Max with a newfound strength, but time and time again, the people closest to him keep dying and it's all because he's too powerless to defeat the one opponent in front of him. Meanwhile, in the real world, as Goku tries to pick up Gohan, he can feel his body trembling, though he's literally unconscious. The bouts in the other dimension continue. Chi Chi would fall next, then Videl, and most horrifyingly yet, Pan. For a moment, Gohan's heart shatters into a thousand pieces. He lets out a cry unlike anything Goku had ever heard before. Goku immediately turns around and sees Cell Max, with a slick grin on his face. What did you do? What are you doing to him? Stop it, Goku screams. Seeing Gohan in so much pain was enough to make Goku change his usual confident tune. The second time Gohan lets out that same cry while being in the state of temporary unconsciousness, Goku immediately lands a brutal kick on Cell Max. I asked you to stop, Goku says in Ultra Instinct now. What gives, Goku? Let me do my job. I mean, look, Cell Max replies while pointing towards Gohan. Overwhelmed by grief and still trying to process the idea that he had lost everyone at this point, Gohan's eyes were completely blank. Neither Goku or Cell Max, with all of their sixth sense, could tell if Gohan was even unconscious still or not. Piccolo, on the other hand, was still at the lookout, but seeing Gohan in such a state, he flew all the way there in a matter of seconds, leaving a blazing trail. He used the ocean route to try and not to disturb the climate too much, but all of the media outlets immediately start talking about how at this rate, if nothing is done about this random climate change, Asia is going to be underwater by 2030. Goku, for God's sake, he's your son. Just let him live a normal life. Why can't just you or Vegeta be the strongest? I mean, just look at him. He looks like a dead man walking. Piccolo tries to talk some sense into Goku, and of course, Goku has nothing to say in reply. He's not sure about what's going on right now either. But one thing is for sure, what Piccolo said is true. Gohan right now is a dead man walking. Consumed by regret as he realized that his own weakness was the basis for all of those tragic deaths. Gohan loses himself and lets himself be consumed by the primal energy. Yeah, he was a dead man walking, but he'd also become the greatest power on this planet. The Grand Priest watching all of this happen from Zeno's palace clenches his fist. Another failure he comments, while recalling what happened when he fought and defeated Lord Thanatos in the past. He was about to tell Thanatos to leave Planet Sadala for now and immediately go to Planet Earth of Universe 7. He won't get physically involved, but if this is how things are, Thanatos should kill Gohan as soon as possible. But before he could make that call, heck, before he could even finish that thought, Universe 7 would tremble. Gohan's black hair all of a sudden gets all spiky and turns gray. He unleashes a reddish inner aura which quickly shrouds his entire being. And finally, life returns to his eyes that had before been completely blank. 
They spiral from black to red before fully manifesting the form, in which his eyes become fully red with black pupils. Uh, Gohan, you there, Goku asks? Though it seems he still hadn't completed his new transformation yet, it was the night of the full moon. Gohan's body that now instinctually desired more and more power couldn't pass on this opportunity. Vegeta could feel it all the way from Universe 6. Ha, <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Although the color may have changed, Goku notices that Gohan's eyes now look the same as how they did during the Cell games. Though, there's more. The transformation continues and now it's Primal Instinct plus Super Saiyan 4 plus Beast. If history is going to remember Broly as Primal Broly and Goku as the Sun Wukong, then Gohan won't be remembered as a person. He'll be remembered as a mythological creature, the Primal Beast. Cell Max was ecstatic. He thought today would end without either of them killing each other, but now it seems like the battle was finally going to get resumed. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Gohan, he shouts as he plunges forward to land a kick, but Gohan counters it with a kick of his own and it sends Cell's leg flying away. And unlike before, when he could instantly whip out another one, he seems to be unable to regenerate. What the? Cell remarks while still confused at what happened, but Gohan would go ahead and butcher everything about him. He just completely ripped him apart way worse than he did any of the Cell Juniors. And before Cell Max could say another word, Gohan blasts him off the face of the earth using a primal Kamehameha. From start to finish, all it took was about 20 seconds. Gohan undoes his transformation and would simply fall to the ground. Piccolo and Goku run up to him. Are you okay? What's two plus two? Piccolo asks desperately. Y yeah, yeah, I'm fine, Gohan replies while giving him a thumbs up. They take Gohan back to the lookout where Dende would heal him and then they begin to talk. Listen, Gohan, I'm sorry. I don't know what Cell Max put you through, but it pained me to see you like that, Goku says, sincerely apologizing. Hey, it's fine. You made me realize how weak I was, Dad. Now, thanks to you, I'll never lose again. Not even to you, Gohan replies. They both laugh. He then gets up and faces Piccolo. Back then, if I hadn't heard your voice when I did, well, I'm scared to think of what may have happened. Thank you, Piccolo, for helping me differentiate between reality and that dream. You saved me, Gohan states. Piccolo sighs and reminds him to just brace himself because they have to take Pan to an amusement park later today. It was about 5 a.m. in the morning back at Gohan's house, so he excuses himself and goes back. Once he leaves, Piccolo couldn't help his curiosity. So, Goku, care to tell me why you didn't mention Super Saiyan 5 in the conversation with Gohan? He did master Primal Instinct, didn't he, Piccolo asks? No, that wasn't the Super Saiyan 5 I had imagined. It was something different. Gohan is now in the same tier as me, Broly, Vegeta, and Zykor. He might even be a bit stronger than me, but I still don't think it's enough. Super Saiyan 5 isn't just some combination of Super Saiyan 4 and Primal Instinct. It's the very pinnacle. Well, Gohan did give me a few ideas at least, so let's see, Goku replies. Subsequently at Planet Sadala, Lord Thanatos has arrived. Looks like we have a visitor. Care to introduce yourself, sir, Vegeta says. He saw him coming. No, I'm just an old ghost from the past. Don't mind me. By the way, how many Saiyans on this planet can use primal instinct, Thanatos asks. Two. It's me and another guy. Why, Vegeta asks. Not much. I was asked by someone to test your skills. So, what do you say? Interested in having a duel with me, young man, he replies. The Grand Priest is the one who sent you here, isn't he? Vegeta asks, but continues. Whatever, it doesn't matter either way. If it's a fight you want, then be my guest. Next time, it's gonna be a battle between the current King of the Saiyans and the first ever God of Destruction. Now it's a face-off between the King of all Saiyans and the first ever God of Destruction. There wasn't any doubt about it. If Vegeta fights him the way he is now, he was gonna lose, miserably. After all, Vegeta hasn't even defeated Beerus yet. They're currently on planet Sadala, but Vegeta doesn't want to ruin the positive vibes created thanks to the birth of Zykor and Kefla's son. So he says, how about we take this somewhere else? You know, somewhere empty. Fine by me, what do you suggest? 
You see, I've been shut in for millions of years. I don't know the best place to engage in a duel with someone, Thanatos replies, which was fair. Well, I mean, I'm from another universe too, so whatever. We can just fight at the nearest planet. There doesn't seem to be any traces of life force, Vegeta says. This takes us to an unnamed planet in Universe 6. It was really nothing there. It's all just empty, a plain, barren wasteland everywhere you see. And here on this planet, Vegeta stands face to face with the first ever God of Destruction. The only problem is that he himself is actually unaware of this detail. After all, Thanatos never introduced himself as such. Still, when he looked at Thanatos in his eye, every bone in Vegeta's body trembled. All the battles Vegeta has been in over the decades, all the blows he's tanked, all the punches, everything, blowing himself up even. His body immediately processed all those experiences and he learned, but he couldn't sense anything at all from this situation. He didn't know how to read this. But still, as the man who has sworn to perform the impossible feat of gaining mastery over Ultra Instinct, running away or even stepping back from this challenge was completely out of the question. It didn't matter who the Grand Priest sent. Vegeta's aura would flare up, and he would take a deep breath and then look at Thanatos. His eyes were blazing with this steely result. Interesting. Let's see if you're actually worth the Grand Priest's time, Thanatos taunts. He had this smirk on his face, and Vegeta knew that it was just taunt, it was all a bait, but he still chose to make the first move anyway. With a speed rivaling almost instant transmission, his fist landed swiftly and firmly across Thanatos' face. And just as it comes into contact with Thanatos, Vegeta summons up the greatest attack potency he was capable of at that moment. At that very instant when his fist touched that man's face, Vegeta transforms into not only Super Saiyan 4, but his Ultra Ego aura would flare up as well. He had learned how to combine Primal Instinct into his attacks too. This same attack one-shotted Gohan and put him to sleep for 9 months. It was no joke and Thanatos clearly didn't see it coming. Vegeta answered to his taunt, but he did so in a way Thanatos simply just couldn't foresee. However, once all that dust settled, Thanatos was still standing there, actually in the same position with the same smirk on his face. <laughs> You're gonna have to do better than that, he states, and flicks a sphere of destruction towards Vegeta. The purple orb tears through the air with a destructive hum and gradually gains momentum. Vegeta had his own suspicions about this individual, but this cleared everything up for him. He had to be a destroyer. Vegeta reverts to his Ultra Ego state and tanks that purple orb of destruction with Beerus' signature sphere of destruction. The purple orb and the sphere collide and the impact was just phenomenal. If there was anyone else on the planet, they would have instantly died. Unfazed by the impact though, Vegeta would just sigh. Now then, what to do? He could tell that this destroyer was almost on par with Lord Beerus, otherwise that sphere of destruction would have easily enveloped that purple orb. Vegeta decides to permanently cloak himself in Ultra Ego. He'll switch between Super Saiyan 4 and Primal Instinct depending on which direction this battle goes, but as expected, he just can't help his curiosity. How about an introduction? At least tell me your name. This is a battle of pride, it'd be silly for it to end without even knowing the opponent's name, Vegeta asks. What? I, I could have sworn I already introduced myself. Apologies, looks like this old age is getting to me. My name is Thanatos. I'm the Grand Elder of Planet Moors, and I guess I also used to be a god of destruction, but that probably isn't relevant, Thanatos laughs. Which universe, and what happened? What do you mean used to be? You seem completely competent to me, Vegeta asks. Nah, this was a long time ago, back when the multiverse and the universe were one and the same. There was only one god of destruction and that was me, but things happened. I tried learning Primal Instinct, but unfortunately the power was too much for me to control. In the end, I permanently altered the state of the universe because I couldn't master this power. I was punished. Ever since then, this is the first time I've been allowed to leave my planet. As for the multiverse, I guess the Grand Priest recreated it from scratch. You said that you're not from this universe. Does that mean that there are multiple universes right now, Thanatos asks? Vegeta had so many questions, but he first explains how there used to be 18 universes until 6 of them got eliminated by Zeno and everything else that happened. He also goes on to explain the recent Tournament of Power. 
How very mighty of you, Vegeta. I didn't expect you to be this sincere, Thanatos replies. Actually, Thanatos already knew everything, but he was just playing along because it had been so long since he had a conversation with a stranger, but it was now time to kick things into gear. The entire cosmos trembles as Thanatos braces himself. Destructive resonance echoes all around them, and it's as if the entire universe just started vibrating. Can you feel it, Saiyan? This is the dark reality of Primal Instinct. I'm using it cautiously, but imagine what would happen if I were to go all out. You may have had your own taste of this ability, but you are still a baby as a Primal Instinct user. Just to give up. Ask Super Shinron to erase all traces of this ability from your bodies. Otherwise, self-destruction is the least of your concerns, Thanatos warns Vegeta. Well, well, thank you for your concern, but I'm afraid I vowed in front of the Grand Priest that I will master this ability. I'll surpass you, Lord Thanatos. That is my pride as a Saiyan warrior, Vegeta declares. Though this just kind of leaves a bad taste in Thanatos' mouth. He summons a terrific ball of energy and sends it straight in Vegeta's direction. It wasn't just destruction, this was something, this was something different. Even though Vegeta can see it coming to him in slow motion, he was still stunned. It was almost like he didn't have time to react. Vegeta would smile. <laughs> Primal Instinct isn't like Ultra Ego or Ultra Instinct, I see. It gives you the power to rewrite the laws of physics in any given situation. As he said this, that ball of energy struck full force. Exhausted and beaten, Vegeta lies in the rubble, gasping for breath. Donatos lands effortlessly nearby. I respect your determination, Saiyan King. I really do, but it's just not up to you. Personally, I was going to kill you, but that is outside the scope of this mission. Maybe next time. Wait, where do you think you're going, Vegeta asks. His entire body was shaking. He was in so much pain. He couldn't even stand to his feet, but somehow Vegeta was eventually able to get up. I remember you saying that there were two people on planet Sadala who can use primal instinct. I'm off to hunt the second one, Thanatos replies. Don't. Your opponent is me, Vegeta asserts. When Bulla was born, Vegeta had to immediately head off to the Tournament of Power, but times are different now. Zykor is a changed man, and Vegeta knows that better than anyone. That's why, for the sake of his friend, he wants to keep this fight far away from Planet Sadala. Meanwhile, back on Planet Earth, Goku has gone back to training Ub and Goten for the time being. He wasn't in any rush to master Primal Instinct, which is why he just kind of does whatever and thinks about mastery in his spare time. Broly was pretty much the same. Thanks to his meditation training with Piccolo, he had attained unnerved tranquility, but it's almost like learning how to walk again for him because he also lost that source of power that made him so strong in the first place. His pure, just undeniable rage. Well, these two were minding their business when an electrifying sensation runs down their spines. Both Goku and Broly look towards the sky from their respective whereabouts. Gohan was even giving an important lecture, but he also had to leave his seminar and ran to the roof. Vegeta, Gohan says, and dashes straight towards the lookout. Suddenly, Goku appears in front of him and grabs his arm. He uses instant transmission again, grabs Broly, and then prepares to go all the way to Universe 6. So what the hell happened to Vegeta? As for Zykor, he felt the same sensation. He was going to step outside to see what's going on when the ceiling breaks and Vegeta's body falls to the ground in front of him. Vegeta, what's going on, Zykor asked, but there was no response. Zykor even slaps Vegeta a couple of times, but Vegeta still hasn't moved. He wasn't dead, but it didn't really look like he was alive either. Suddenly, Goku, Broly, and Gohan also pop up inside King Sadala's castle on planet Sadala. All right, it took a few tries, but I was finally able to locate Vegeta's key and instant transmission actually worked. He's not dead yet, is he, Goku says? Trunks was there as well, and he was teaching Prince Sadala how to fight. Though, as expected, there was a clear difference between the Saiyans who had awakened Primal Instinct and those who haven't. As for Trunks, he entered the main hall after Goku, Gohan, and Broly had appeared. Dad's key just disappeared. What happened? Trunks slowly approaches them. At this point, all he could think about was if it's possible to maybe bring Vegeta back with the Dragon Balls again. Gohan grabs his shoulder, looks him in his eyes, and says, Relax, Trunks. Vegeta is still alive. 
We don't know what happened yet, but that's why we all came here, he says, trying to calm Trunks down. Look, there he is, Goku says, as Thanatos walks in from the entrance of the castle. He was clapping for them. He was actually pretty satisfied with his luck here. I mean, all Primal Instinct users in the same room for him. Oh yes, the one that did that to your king would be me. Try if you wish, Saiyans, Thanatos declares. This was pretty much it. Either the Saiyans are gonna achieve Super Saiyan 5 and pull off what no one in history has ever done, or they'll just die. Outside of Vegeta and Thanatos, Goku, Broly, Zykor, and Gohan are the only users of Primal Instinct. They felt it in their souls when Vegeta was defeated. Zykor was already on planet Sadala celebrating his child's birth with everyone while Goku grabs Broly and Gohan and then uses instant transmission to pull up right to King Sadala's throne room. Vegeta's body was in an unusual state and he didn't seem to be alive, but he wasn't necessarily dead either. And right then, Thanatos casually walks into the palace. His fight with Vegeta was his first battle in billions of years and he honestly enjoyed it. He ended up enjoying it so much that he just declared war on the Saiyans right there. He was doing way more than what the Grand Priest asked him to, but the Grand Priest honestly saw all of this coming. After all, there is a reason why Thanatos was on house arrest for such a long time. How should we go about this, Dad? I mean, he defeated Vegeta without breaking a sweat, Gohan asks. We'll do what we're supposed to do. Right now, right here in this fight, one of us is gonna unlock Super Saiyan 5. Either that, or this will just be the end of us, Goku replies. Hearing this, Gohan immediately starts thinking about Videl and Pan. Zykor looks at his newborn son, Karius. Trunks starts thinking about Bulma and Bola, and all the Saiyans who were celebrating Karius' birth in the throne room a few moments ago just look around at each other. Everyone's fate rests on the tiny possibility that a Saiyan in this room will finally manage to do what no one in universal history has done. That a Saiyan will complete Primal Instinct and unlock the legendary state which Goku and Vegeta have already dubbed Super Saiyan 5. Goku and Thanatos exchange glares. Are you the leader here or something? Tell me your name, Thanatos asks Goku. The name's Goku, but you can call me Kakarot. And who are you, Goku replies. Thanatos properly introduces himself with his former title, and despite being billions of years old, he's yet to master Primal Instinct himself. Goku, Gohan, and Zykor are left speechless. Just how deep does the Primal Instinct rabbit hole really go? Broly doesn't care at all though, he was totally calm. A little too calm in fact. Just like how the universe as a whole is totally silent, Broly was giving off no malice or bloodlust. He wasn't enraged in the slightest. He actually felt completely empty. Goku would look at Broly and grin. He then looks at Zykor, but by the time he turns his head, Zykor had already rushed ahead. He uses Primal Instinct to warp the reality between them and then lands a kick strong enough to rip apart an entire planet. Anatos didn't even feel the need to dodge it though. He actually tanked it with his head and then grabbed Zykor's leg. Now he was about to slam Zykor onto the ground, but with enough force that this entire planet was going to explode. Without thinking, Gohan and Goku have to move. Goku grabs his arm while Gohan frees up Zykor. They knew that if Zykor wasn't freed in time, something truly tragic was gonna happen. Splendid. This is what I'm talking about. You guys are brimming with life now, Thanatos comments. I don't get it. What did you even do to Vegeta? He's not dead or alive. What happened to him, Gohan asks. Vegeta, so that's his name. He was a clever guy. I've never seen anyone use their powers the way he did. Unfortunately, that was the problem. One wrong move and he would have done some irreparable damage to the universe. That's why I ruptured his core, Thanatos states. Ruptured his core, Gohan thinks. He immediately puts two and two together and realizes that Vegeta is no longer capable of channeling the three different types of energies he was using to be so strong. Somewhere in his body, Vegeta lost the connection keeping it all together and so, when the flow stagnated, his existence pretty much self-destructed. Primal Instinct can cause some irreparable damage to anything. In Vegeta's case, his Primal Instinct backfired. We may have to summon Super Shinron, Dad, Gohan says. Relax, Gohan. I can tell Vegeta isn't done yet. Broly and Zykor aren't done either. Now tell me, Gohan. Are you done? 
Have you already given up on becoming a Super Saiyan 5, Goku asks? Suddenly, Gohan puts his serious face back on and whips out Super Saiyan 4 Beast and braces himself for the coming war. Meanwhile, in a higher dimension where energies exist in their truest forms, Vegeta opens his eyes. Where am I, he thinks. What are you even saying, Vegeta? You brought yourself here, someone says in Vegeta's voice. Who is it, he asks. It's you, the voice replies. Look, just send me back. I was fighting someone, Vegeta says. Are you sure, Vegeta? What is your true goal? Is it merely to fight that man, or is it to be the first Saiyan to achieve Super Saiyan 5? Come on, be honest. It's just you and you here, I guess. I am you after all, and you are me, the voice says. In response to this, Vegeta looks around. All there exists is total darkness, but when he puts a bit more effort into looking around, the entire space begins to light up. See what I mean? This place is a projection of your internal state. This place itself is you. Hearing this, Vegeta gets up. No, you're wrong. I finally remember what this place is, Vegeta says, looking around in awe. This is the Shadow Realm, isn't it? No, enough with the jokes, too, the voice replies, and then it begins to transform into Vegeta. What Vegeta said was kind of true, though. This is indeed the Shadow Realm the portion of the multiverse where energies exist in their purest, rawest forms. If someone were to give the true definition of primal instinct, then it'd be a power that allows one to hijack the shadow realm. Doing so subconsciously means imperfect primal instinct, but if by some chance an individual finds a way to hijack the shadow realm consciously, then that individual would have achieved the impossible. Donatos can pretty much do anything, but his primal instinct is still not complete because he's never actually become one with the instinct. The Grand Priest may have learned the secret, but because he belongs to the Angel Race, he lacks the natural proclivity to intervene with the mechanics of the multiverse. But Saiyans, by their very nature, are free to pursue whatever kind of strength they want. They learn, they lose, but through it all, they never stop getting stronger. And right now, Vegeta is at the core of the multiverse itself. Now, he didn't actually plan for this to happen. Vegeta didn't even know that this is the Shadow Realm until the multiverse plugged the information into his head. It was just an accident. Vegeta's primal instinct backfired and banished him to the Shadow Realm. From the moment he was born to the day he will inevitably die, nothing in Vegeta's life has ever worked or is ever going to work as perfectly as this turn of events. All he needs is to actualize this experience and he'll be able to become a Super Saiyan 5. But will it really be that simple? After all, Vegeta is about to face his most difficult opponent yet, himself. That voice isn't an external entity. It was an amalgamation of Vegeta's insecurities. Tell me, how do I leave this place, Vegeta asks. I don't know, but I'm not letting you leave. Not yet. Not until you promise to kill Beerus and Kakarot. And why did you let Frieza live, the voice asks. No way. I'm not going to kill Kakarot. I don't have anything personal against Lord Beerus either, and to be honest, seeing Frieza as a slave is better than seeing him dead. At least agree on that, Vegeta replies. There was no other way to go about it. They're gonna have to fight. And so Vegeta's true self, illuminated with light, faces off against all of the darkness that's always existed in the back of his heart. The Shadow Realm is a space where nothing remains hidden. Vegeta will have to overcome it all, or he won't be making it out of here, let alone become a Super Saiyan 5. Subsequently, Thanatos was getting bored after fighting Goku, Gohan, and Zykor for a while. He needed a better challenge. Apparently, Broly was still choosing to just watch. He was completely detached, yet he had been paying attention to everything that happened in the fight. Looks like Piccolo's meditation training was working a little too well. Thanatos approaches Broly out of pure curiosity at this point. He tries throwing a punch, and Broly casually dodges it. He tries throwing a kick, and Broly casually blocks it. There was still no bloodlust in him at all. You know what's going on, Dad? Gohan asks. Nah, but I can tell that by the time Broly engages with Donatos in a fight, he's gonna be much stronger than any of us. Maybe Broly will be the first Super Saiyan 5, who knows, Goku replies. Still, he should at least lend us a hand. We're all fighting for our existence here and that dude is just chilling. And I hate how much he looks like my wife. What the hell, Zykor adds? They're in the middle of this conversation when something all of a sudden catches them all off guard. 
Thanatos would use his Primal Instinct to do some fatal damage to Broly, but for some reason, his Primal Instinct just doesn't work against Broly. It gets canceled. Or to be more exact, Broly's subconscious is sharp enough to actually counter anything Thanatos tried to pull off. What the? Incredible. He's like a totally different person now. Good job, Piccolo, Gohan states. However, this still wasn't enough. Since the beginning, Thanatos never needed Primal Instinct to win battles. He prepares himself for an all-out brawl against Broly, but that's when Vegeta's lifeless body would start coughing. Vegeta had overcome everything in that amount of time. He was completely detached from the past and therefore ready to finally pull off what no one in Universal history had ever done before. Goku, Gohan, Zykor, Thanatos, Trunks, and everyone else, they all wanted to say something but words just weren't coming out of their mouths. It was like standing in the presence of an otherworldly being. Vegeta was free of everything, even of strength. He clenches his fist and a power surges within him. A primal scream pierces the cosmos and his aura flares in a majestic light. A beautiful red and white key swirls around Vegeta as his hair lengthens and his eyes start to burn. By freeing himself of the very conception of strength, Vegeta has achieved the embodiment of pure, unadulterated power. He has completed Primal Instinct and attained the mystical Super Saiyan 5 state. Goku can't help but clap in awe at Vegeta who without a doubt had surpassed all of them at this point. Everyone else begins to follow suit. Impossible, Thanato says. Hey old man, it's about time you stop bullying the Saiyans, Vegeta declares as he warps the space between them and grabs Thanatos by his throat. And he did this so quick and casually that no one was able to follow his movements. Thanatos didn't even know if Vegeta came towards him or if he was pulled towards Vegeta. Right when Vegeta overcame this little alter ego he had and came out of the Shadow Realm, he proceeded to wrap the space between him and Thanatos and then grabbed him by the neck. It's actually so simple. I can't believe you old fools spent billions of years without understanding the truth of Primal Instinct. It's pathetic. I'm not even joking, Vegeta says. His expression was completely blank. He had no emotion, nothing. He was simply looking down on Thanatos and considering the laid back look in his eyes. Wow, Vegeta's really coming into this power all his own, Goku says. It's even amplifying that personality and attitude of it. Vegeta releases the hold on Thanatos' neck and allows him to regain his impure primal aura. His eyes are radiating with this intimidating purple glow and the space around them starts to crackle with energy and his aura fluctuates wildly. Immediately he charges at Vegeta and for what it's worth, Vegeta allows him to close the gap. Thanatos' speed is no joke, I mean the only one who could see him right now was Vegeta. Goku sighs and Broly goes back to his base state. Zykor releases his forms as well and Gohan puts back his glasses. From this point onward, these four Saiyans knew that they wouldn't have a single thing to do during the course of this battle. For the first time ever, if Goku were to interfere, he would be getting in Vegeta's way. When Thanatos is face to face with Vegeta, ready to deliver a decisive blow, Vegeta's galaxy shattering punch lands on Thanatos. Believe it or not, the reason Vegeta allowed Thanatos to close the gap because he had already released his punch into the metaphysical. All that was left was for Thanatos to be at the right place at the right time. But this is Thanatos we're talking about. He was able to block it. Is that all you've got, Saiyan King, he asks? Come on, your entire body is shivering. Old men like you should be sipping tea somewhere in a garden, not terrorizing a planet after a baby's birth, Vegeta says, and then his eyes would flash. He channels his energy into the Shadow Realm and creates a spatial rift around Thanatos. Naturally, this would catch him off guard. And Vegeta is very calculated with every move he makes. He knew Thanatos would get distracted enough to try and combat the spatial rift. This leaves him vulnerable and wide open to Vegeta's attacks. Suddenly, it's not very funny anymore. Thanatos is inside a tiny universe created by Vegeta's will. And no, he can't just brute force his way out of there. It was literally impossible. This was almost the equivalent to the prison realm in Jujutsu Kaisen. Vegeta releases a burst of energy and leaps forward. All of the nearby celestial bodies tremble and Thanatos is hit with a volley of powerful energy blasts. The first one is mid, he doesn't even feel that one. 
The second one was more annoying. Third one hurt a little bit, but not that much. And the fourth one felt like slamming your toe in the door. This is where Thanatos begins to realize what's really going on here. Each energy blast is twice as powerful as the previous one, and it seems that Vegeta has started an infinite loop. By the 70th energy blast, Thanatos starts showing major signs of fatigue. This is the first time we've seen him actually tired and exhausted. How did you learn such pinpoint precision, mortal, he asks. From a friend named Hit, Vegeta replies. We fought not too terribly long ago. I awakened my primal instinct during the fight with Hit. He may not be as strong as Jiren, but honestly, if he's allowed to kill, he's an extremely difficult opponent to fight, Vegeta states. He didn't reveal that for Thanatos, though. He revealed that for Goku, who was clearly paying a lot of attention to this fight. Hit, huh? I see. Honestly, I'm glad. If you're this capable, I can finally let loose. If things go south, feel free to kill me or whatever, Thanatos declares, and suddenly, the light in his eyes fades away. The Grand Priest and the Dragon God Zalama were both observing this fight from different regions of the multiverse when all of a sudden, they make their appearance on the battlefield as well. The Grand Priest grabbing Thanatos' right shoulder while Zalama grabs his left. Now, now, just what were you planning on doing? The last time you went all out, if you remember, the universe was divided into 18 parts, the Grand Priest says. That's right, control yourself, Thanatos, or we'll have no choice but to kill you, Zalama adds. What gives? Why did you two decide to intervene now of all times? Let the guy go all out. I'll handle it, Vegeta says. I forbid. Congratulations for keeping your promise, Vegeta, but the multiverse is a little more important than your singular fight. The only reason I even had him come after you was to make sure the primal instinct doesn't go south, the Grand Priest replies. Meanwhile, Beerus, who was watching this entire thing play out on Lisa's orb, actually faints. This was too much for his heart to handle. Primal Instinct, Super Saiyan 5, the Grand Priest, and Zalama all in the same place, and it was because of his universe? Oh, Beerus was freaking out. Dragon God Zalama, Lord Grand Priest, please do not interrupt our fight anymore. You guys don't understand the true nature of Primal Instinct either, but this man, the Saiyan King right here, he does. Allow me to die by his hand, Thanatos declares. This would be a befitting end to my long and unnatural and exhausting life. Let me die by the hands of someone like the Saiyan King. The Grand Priest and Zalama obviously aren't buying it, but Vegeta would step up next. He distorts the space around Thanatos and separates him from the two gods. Vegeta would then enforce his own domain onto the multiverse from where he stood. A tiny realm where anything can happen and the rest of the multiverse wouldn't be affected. This development was brazen enough to shut up both the Grand Priest and Zalama, and while they're both capable of such feats as well, to do so so casually and without any gimmicks or forewarning, this is what it looks like to be one with the multiverse, to truly be infinite. Now then, Mr. Lord Thanatos, feel free to go all out. This is our own private little server here, Vegeta says. Thanatos would laugh hysterically. After this, Thanatos would do the same thing he did in the early days of the universe, let his incomplete primal instinct go buck wild. He gives up his own will and lets the energy itself take over his body. He was now more like primal instinct Broly, but a hundred times more dangerous. This is the very first god of destruction ever. Vegeta feels the intensity and decides to check up on the situation in the shadow room. What would have happened if he hadn't contained Thanatos in the domain? Vegeta sees it. Universe 6 and 7 would have collapsed completely. They would have experienced a hypothetical event called the Big Freeze, or I guess you could call it the death of the universe. Vegeta and Thanatos would have survived. The Grand Priest and Zalama would have survived as well, but as far as everyone else, well, it would have been turned into nothing. While no one else can really see it, the Shadow Realm has been going absolutely bonkers since these two started. Not good, Vegeta thinks to himself. I can't relax knowing this can happen. Kakarot and the others must master this instinct as soon as possible as well. Vegeta's mind gets swayed. He begins to consider the possibility that he could lose his firm control over the primal instinct as well. This disturbance in his mind causes a hole in the domain. A burst of primal energy deadly enough to kill all of the Saiyans comes out, but fortunately the Grand Priest easily manages to stop it thanks to his mastery of the infinity. 
Vegeta realizes that he was a fool for thinking that he'd be able to contain something and someone so dangerous in a domain. Without the Grand Priest or Zalama there, even that small leak of primal instinct could have wiped out the majority of a single universe. So this is when he decides to force Thanatos into the Shadow Realm as well. What is this? Unconscious once again, Thanatos asks? He had lost consciousness when he went all out. This is what we call the Shadow Realm, and to tell you the truth, Primal Instinct is nothing more than awareness of this part of the universe. So, what will you do next, Vegeta? Will you kill me? Thanatos asked. He was oddly excited about being killed by Vegeta. No, that'd be a waste. I can tell that one day an even stronger user of Primal Instinct will appear. So I'm going to make sure to put your energy to good use, Vegeta replies. What the hell does that mean, he asks. Tonight, my friend Zykor's baby was born. He will go on to become much stronger than me, Kakarot, or any other Saiyan that we know, Vegeta says. He's been birthed with the name Carries after the personification of violence, but honestly, I couldn't feel a single speck of danger coming from that kid. But his power level at birth is the most stable out of all of the Saiyans we're familiar with. So how does that relate to this situation? Well, Vegeta would take Thanatos' incomplete primal instinct and redirect it towards the baby. Now, thanks to this, Zykor and Kale's son Carries now has somewhat of a natural affinity or proclivity for primal instinct as Thanatos. As for Thanatos, he had finally been freed of this billions years old curse. Shortly after, both Vegeta and Thanatos would come out of the Shadow Realm. Everyone is surprised by the calm look on both of their faces. Looks like I'm finally ready to retire, Grand Priest, Thanatos says. I can see that, but what happened? And why is my Omni Precognition faltering all of a sudden? What did you do, Vegeta? The Grand Priest asks. Vegeta grins. I guess only time will tell. For now, though, I'd appreciate it if you and Lord Zalama leave together with Mr. Thanatos. We were in the middle of a celebration here. The Grand Priest could see that there was no more cause for concern for the time being, so he and Zalama actually leave. Goku gives Vegeta a round of applause because what they just witnessed, you had to be there to believe it. Whoa, that was amazing, Vegeta. You seem like enlightened now or something, Goku says. Vegeta would just smirk. Whatever, since everyone is here now, let's finish celebrating Carrie's birthday the right way. The right as Vegeta says this, Zykor firmly grabs his shoulder. Vegeta, you did something to my son, didn't you? Don't forget, I endured non-existence for 1,000 years. Such subtlety cannot escape me. What did you do, Zykor asks. He was kind of scared, but he also trusts Vegeta. Vegeta pauses and looks around. He sees Goku, Gohan, Broly, Trunks, even King and Prince Sadala. He sees all the Saiyans, and naturally among them, there is Kale holding her newborn baby carries. Vegeta takes a deep breath and says, all right, listen well, everyone. Lord Thanatos is the first god of destruction. He has been around since pretty much the beginning of the multiverse. All of his prowess, his proclivity for primal instinct, his instability and natural knack for destruction. I took on all of that and transferred it into our newborn Saiyan prodigy here, Vegeta declares. And with that, all of the Saiyans present here are left utterly shocked. At this point, there was only one person left in this party that didn't have their jaw on the ground and showed genuine excitement for the future to come. And you guessed it, it was of course Goku. So albeit for better or worse, after the recent developments and Vegeta being the only known user of Super Saiyan 5 at this point and master of Primal Instinct, I'm gonna assure you guys that this story hasn't- In this story, things have changed in the multiverse. Vegeta has become the first person in history to master Primal Instinct. Even though he may not be more powerful than them, he can now be counted in the same tier as the Lama and even the Grand Priest. But what makes him even more dangerous is the fluid nature of his power. He has absolute control over all the primal forces of the multiverse, he could bend fabric of reality to his will, and he can't be influenced by Zeno or the Grand Priest either. A completely free individual with the power to hijack the multiverse. Sounds a little dangerous to me. The one and only King of the Shadows. Now, the previous part of what if Goku and Vegeta wish their tails back ended with Vegeta redirecting the primal instinct of the first god of destruction to Zykor and Kale's baby boy. 
Goku is the only one who feels kind of positive about this. Everybody else, especially Zykor, is at a loss for words. Why would you do that, Vegeta? Zykor says while getting flashbacks of the 1,000 years he spent in the realm of Void. As for the baby himself, Carries was crying because of all the havoc that was going on and everybody making a fuss, but the moment he inherited the first destroyer's incomplete primal instinct, he stopped crying completely and entered a state of tranquility almost. The Grand Priest and Zalama have already excused themselves, but Thanatos was still here. Are you serious, Saiyan King? I've been around for billions of years and yet I was never able to master the primal instinct. This could get really ugly, you know, Thanatos states. Relax, didn't you just learn that one should never underestimate the Saiyans, Vegeta declares, and then he begins laughing. Kale was silently furious because, well, that is their child, and what kind of mother wants their newborn baby to inherit the most ridiculous power in existence that he might not even be able to control? She grabs him by the collar and threatens Vegeta. You take that back. Return carries back to normal now. Too late, it's already been done, Vegeta replies. And while Vegeta may be coming off as kind of a jackass right now, what no one else really realizes is that his whole perspective on existence has changed now. He understands and can foresee things that they just can't fathom. Zykor already had an incomplete primal instinct and Kale is basically just a female Broly. Ares is their son, plus he's been named after the goddess of violence. At this rate, the same things that happened to Zykor will happen to Ares, but it'll be much worse. But now that Vegeta had bestowed the curse of primal instinct on Ares, his mind and body would be forced into adapting to the change and just like that, a new ruler of the multiverse has kind of been born. Of course the plan isn't perfect, but this gives Ares and the Saiyan race a fighting chance because the curse of primal instinct is inevitable. The rest of the night carries on with a slightly awkward tone to it, but Ares' birthday party ends and the Universe 7 gang returns to Earth. Alright Vegeta, so tell me, how do I do it? How do I become Super Saiyan 5, Goku asks. No way, figure it out on your own, Vegeta replies. Broly was content for the time being. During the battle with Thanatos, he learned a very important life lesson. It's like, not everything needs a reaction. He learned to sit back and observe. While Gohan has come to realize that he isn't really built for something like Super Saiyan 5. It sounds way more risky than it's worth. Plus, is there really even a need to worry about enemies anymore considering how Vegeta is pretty much the literal king of the realms now? He excuses himself and actually goes on a trip to Palu with Pan and Videl. Everything that's happened recently has left him completely burnt out and I get you. Then there was Trunks. He was in deep thought. Vegeta had been an absolute unit lately, but Trunks feels as though he's been giving Prince Sadala and Carries more attention than him and so, without saying anything out loud, Trunks vows to himself that he'll become strong enough that Vegeta actually starts acknowledging him again and maybe even looks at him as a potential rival and not just his kid. For now, Trunks has set his goal on mastering Super Saiyan 4. He gets both Goten and Oob on the grind with him and the three of them start training tirelessly. Then, after spending some time with their wives on Earth, both Goku and Vegeta return to planet Beerus. And remember, this entire journey started because Beerus told Goku and Vegeta to grow stronger on their own, to discover their true Saiyan potential. So tell us, Vegeta, how does it feel to master Primal Instinct? You must be many times stronger than both me and Lord Beerus by now, Whis asks. Beerus was visibly annoyed by this, but it's not like there's anything he could do about it. Vegeta spent the last 20 parts of this what if putting in work and at this point, it's true. It actually seems pretty boring, you know? I won't be able to experience the same thrill of battle when I can just manipulate the rules of reality to my will, Vegeta replies. He actually looked oddly serious. Then there's Goku. He was nudging at Frieza telling him to have a battle with Vegeta again. Nine months ago, Vegeta fought Ultra Ego Frieza with his newly awakened Incomplete Primal Instinct and he absolutely destroyed any kind of confidence Frieza had whatsoever. He actually gave him permanent anxiety from that. Ever since then, Frieza has been working as a full-time slave on Planet Beerus. Finally, Vegeta had had his revenge and he's now at the pinnacle of the multiverse. But where should he go from here on out? Who knew that the top would feel so empty, I guess? On their way here, he thought that he would love a friendly battle with Beerus and Whis, but what's the point? He'd probably win. 
it's like he can already imagine exactly how the fight is going to play out. Vegeta kind of spaces out as he's envisioning all of that when he sees a silhouette of an unreasonably strong individual giving off the same kind of energy as him. There was no doubt about it. It was Carrie's, but it seemed like it was from years in the future somehow. This causes Vegeta to question his own intentions. Did he do all of this because deep down he wanted to fight Carrie's in the future? Is this situation similar to Goku's relationship with Oob kinda? Beerus notices his sense facial expressions and says, Alright, let's do it. Do what, Vegeta asks. A battle, come on, I'll humor you, Beerus replies. It may seem like Beerus was onto something, but not really. He just knows what it feels like to be that bored. And so, I guess it's about time Vegeta and Beerus face off again. Vegeta grins. He was ready. However, from the minute it began until it ends, the fight between Beerus and Super Saiyan 5 Vegeta lasts only 3 minutes. It took 3 minutes until Beerus finally realized that they can fight for all eternity and he still won't be able to land a blow on Vegeta. As for Vegeta, deep inside of him there was a part of him that wanted to pin Beerus' head down with his foot just like he did his father but of course, Vegeta was mature enough to ignore those thoughts. The only reason he was able to rise to this level in the multiverse is because of his association with Beerus and Whis. No wait, it strikes Vegeta. He'd been focusing on all the wrong things this whole time. It's not because of Beerus and Whis that he'd gotten so strong. It wasn't the primal instinct either. No, it's Kakarot. It's because he stuck around Goku that Vegeta was able to get so strong as well. Yeah, for the majority of his life, he couldn't surpass him, but now that he's done it, why is his mind acting like it's over? To begin with, why didn't he redirect Thanatos' primal instinct to Goku? Considering Goku's current mastery of this technique, he may have been able to figure it out almost immediately, but Vegeta didn't. Instead, he gave the power to a newborn baby. Realizing this, Vegeta just starts laughing. It's because he knows that even if no one else catches up to him, Kakarot will. He can master it all on his own. He doesn't need a primal instinct injection. As Vegeta is having all of these mental dilemmas, Goku succeeded in forcing Frieza to fight him. Frieza enters his Black Frieza form and then unleashes Ultra Ego again. Goku uses his Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker, but it seems the current Frieza has no faith left in his abilities. Even when Goku returns to base form, he can still somehow overpower Frieza. It was like they had broken his entire ego and he was now just surrounded by people that wanted to use him as a punching bag. This is actually pretty painful to watch, Vegeta says. Hey Kakarot, quit wasting your time. We'll return with Lord Beerus by evening. Boma is preparing a feast. Who would have ever thought that one day the mighty Frieza would be reduced to this, Beerus adds. Well, if you ask me, the reason he is like this now is because Vegeta used Primal Instinct in his fight against him. He probably messed up the balance of Frieza's psyche, Whis replies. No way I'm responsible for this pathetic situation, Vegeta says. His consciousness immediately travels to the Shadow Realm to examine the actions he took that time and realizes that he actually did attack Frieza's psyche. At that time, Vegeta was still unable to use Primal Instinct consciously, but now that he knows what he did, he actually decides to fix it. Vegeta returns Frieza's psyche to normal, but he makes sure that Frieza still keeps all of the memories of the recent events here. This ends up being even more painful for Frieza because he'd rather be burning in hell again than experience any of that. He falls to his knees and starts punching the ground in rage, but there isn't a thing he can say. He looks at Vegeta and everyone else with a death glare and then just takes off somewhere into space. Are you fine with just letting him go like that? He is your slave after all, Vegeta replies. No, I don't really care. I'm sure it'll be more interesting when he returns again anyway, Beerus replies. The four of them then return to Earth and enjoy a feast with the rest of their friends and family. However, Gohan was still on vacation with Videl and Pan. Everything is good and that's about where the current arc ends, but trust me guys, this story is still going to continue. In the future, 16 years from now, the multiverse as we know it comes to an end. Everything ceases to exist. Everything except one person, Carries. All right, now what, he says as he looks at the infinite nothingness around him. He knows it's his fault, but he doesn't even know how he did it. All he has now are his memories. In order to keep himself from taking his own life, Carries enters the world of his memories. 
He knows that something in the past triggered the end of the multiverse, but he can't quite pinpoint it. But after an entire year of revisiting his memories, Harry stumbles upon a scene where someone is carrying him while he was still an infant. Vegeta, Harry says. I have to go back and fix this. What exactly happened? How did the multiverse end? Is it really Carrie's fault? And where were Goku and Vegeta when all of this happened? The current arc may be ending, but trust me guys, the end itself has only just begun. Goku and Vegeta are busy eating away right now when suddenly Vegeta asks him, so when are you planning on mastering Primal Instinct? I'm itching for a rematch, Kakarot. Unlike you, I'm in no rush, but just you wait, Vegeta. I'll surpass you again, Goku declares. And honestly, neither one of them had a doubt in their mind that that day would come. Vegeta wants Goku to master Primal Instinct as well so that he can finally have a rematch, but Goku isn't really in a hurry for some reason. He wants to take his time figuring out what can be considered the most broken power-up in multiversal history. Keep it in mind that Primal Instinct was illegal for a long time. Zykor spent 1000 years in non-existence just because he went a little too wild with his immature Primal Instinct, but now that the Grand Priest has seen the completed form of this technique, thanks to Vegeta, it's a little bit more laid back. The multiverse is on the verge of evolution, or so the Grand Priest believes. Then there was Frieza. He was enslaved by Beerus after his rematch against Vegeta around 9 months ago and getting one shot by him with Primal Instinct. Vegeta has recently freed Frieza from his mental slavery though, so now Frieza is out and about around the universe again. Unfortunately, it's near impossible for him to reach the same level as Vegeta and this is exactly what's hindering Frieza from making progress. He's experienced Vegeta's strength firsthand. His own body and soul knows that it's impossible to win against him. Frieza may consciously try to evade those fearful instincts, but he can't get rid of them and because he can't do that, he's unable to make the same kind of exponential progress as he used to. Yeah, he's been freed from his mental shackles, but from now on, his dynamic with Vegeta is always going to be that of a king and a slave for lack of better words. Goku soon leaves on a journey across the multiverse as well to figure out Primal Instinct himself. Vegeta stays behind on Earth as it's about time he starts spending some time with his family, especially since Trunks wants his dad to train him. Now, during Goku's adventures in other universes, he meets all kinds of warriors. None are strong enough to be an actual challenge, not even Jiren in case you were wondering, but he still somehow ends up having a good experience every once in a while. And every time Goku uses his imperfect primal instinct, he starts developing a conscious feel for it. If there is one advantage he has, then it's the fact that he's already seen Vegeta do it, so now all he has to do is get to the same level, and we already know that Goku really only has to watch somebody do a technique to kinda more or less learn it himself. When Goku started this journey, he moved from the 7th universe to the 8th, and then the 9th, and so on and so forth. He keeps moving forward until finally, he completes a full circle by reaching universe 6. Of course, he makes sure to pay a visit to planet Sadala along the way where Karis is now 1 year old. Yeah, Goku has been traveling around the multiverse for an entire year at this point. He's quick to sense a sinister aura oozing off of Karis though, so he asks Zykor and Kel about it, but they aren't too sure what he's talking about, so this leads Goku to believe that maybe he's the only one that can sense this. This means he's getting closer and closer to actually achieving mastery over Primal Instinct, and it also means that if left to go on a rampage, Karis could do some serious damage. If there was some sinister aura oozing off of him, then that means he's been unable to consciously control the Primal Instinct. I mean, well, there's not really much you can expect from a one-year-old, but remember, this one-year-old has primal instinct of a destroyer who spent an insane amount of time in exile because of this ability. Upon sensing this, Goku uses instant transmission to go and get Vegeta just to make sure there's nothing weird going on here, but there definitely is. Whenever someone normal holds carries, he makes regular baby sounds, but whenever Vegeta tries to hold him, the child stays completely silent. I'm not too sure about this, Vegeta. Why did you put such a heavy burden on my child? You could have just redirected it to me or even Goku, Zykor asks. Relax. From what I see, I can tell Karis is going to be just fine. That strange aura that he's oozing off is a result of his body trying to adjust to the primal power. Soon, he'll become a person who isn't bound to anything. A being that surpasses even myself. A truly free individual, Vegeta declares. 
Zycor and Kale are still kind of upset with him, but there's not really much they can do at this point. Vegeta sticks around on planet Sadala for a little while while Goku continues his travels, where he would eventually reach planet Morgs, Hit's homeland, as well as the origin of the first destroyer Thanatos. During the conclusion of their battle a few chapters ago, Vegeta didn't kill Thanatos, he was still alive, but Goku hasn't come here for advice or mentorship or anything like that. What he's come here for is a friendly sparring match between him and Thanatos, the first god of destruction. Unfortunately for Goku, Thanatos has better things to do, so he says no. He's fully retired since his fight with Vegeta, but he also wants that fight with Vegeta to be his last fight ever. Goku tries pestering him into it, but of course, just considering his age and everything like that, Thanatos is not going to be that easy to persuade. So after getting rejected and obviously his persuasion not working, Goku just has to give up. But right when he was about to leave Planet Moors, Hit shows up. Goku just grins. He starts to approach Hit and ask for a rematch, but he can tell that Goku got stronger, just like how Vegeta did when he fought him last year. Hit had been away from home for the past few months, and he definitely doesn't want Goku ruining his peace. Ironically, the fastest way would have been for him to just fight Goku, and so with that, what happens next is a rematch between Goku and Hit. Don't write this off as an easy battle though because Hit had learned from his fight against Vegeta and he was much stronger now and so this obviously wasn't going to be a cakewalk for Goku. However, Goku's inhuman adaptability thanks to all of the fighters he's fought across the 12 universes, he's easily able to counter all of Hit's deadliest one-hit assassination attacks. Even if he doesn't have access to Super Saiyan 5 or mastery over Primal Instinct like Vegeta, Goku's Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker seems to be getting the job done. The one who gets tired first is Hit, not Goku. Goku ends up excusing himself in the middle of the fight because he can see that he wasn't being a good sport for Hit. So for the time being, he returns back to Planet Sadala. Yo Vegeta, I just had a rematch with Hit, Goku says. Must have been completely unproductive because you're still the same as before, Vegeta replies. Hinting at how Goku still hasn't mastered a primal instinct or transformed into a Super Saiyan 5. Ah, uh, come on, you know it's eventually gonna happen, right? What's the rush, Goku asks. Vegeta thinks about how if anything goes wrong, he'd need Goku to revert the situation back to normal again, but then again, it's not like he can actually say this out loud. Meanwhile, back in a certain future timeline, while Goku and Vegeta are chilling with baby Carries in the present, Carries is looking at them from the future. He can't ignore the strong sensations that this is the point in history where things go all wrong. Something is going to happen in the next few months that eventually result in him erasing the multiverse. Carries wants to come to this point, but he can't find a route that takes him to the past. So not only is he alone in infinite nothingness, he also can't find a way to return to the past, so he's just kind of sitting here like when Zeno erased the future timeline. Still, Carries continues observing. Last time, he remembered Vegeta. This time, he remembers Goku as well. He doesn't remember him as Goku, though. He remembers him as the Super Saiyan 5. Chills run down his spine the moment he recalls this. Then there was the Grand Priest. His Omni Precognition stopped working when Vegeta became Super Saiyan 5, but now Carries is peeking at his memories from the future. There was enough of a link between the present and the future for the Grand Priest to use his own foresight. It is his job to make sure everything is going well in the multiverse, so when he looks into the future and finds out how everything has ceased to exist, you can probably imagine the shocked expression on the Grand Prix's face. An ominous future. I knew it. There shouldn't be exceptions for Primal Instinct. The Saiyans must be taken care of right now or else it'll be too late, the Grand Priest declares. He goes to consult Zalama on the matter and then prepares to leave. Though, thanks to his Omni Precognition, a path has opened up between the present and the future. Carries can now use this path to come to the present, so he tries but fails again. The path is there, but it's a one-way trip. Someone like Vegeta can come to the future through this path, but until Vegeta or perhaps Goku transform into Super Saiyan 5, there won't be a source for Carries to reach for. He'll continue to drift into more and more emptiness while spending time with the only form of entertainment he has, which is watching his own memories. Goku and Vegeta take Carries outside back in the present. They throw him up high in the air, but rather than falling down, 
This kid just started flying and immediately flies towards the moon. No sense of danger whatsoever. When Goku flies to stop him, Goku notices that for some reason, he simply can't get closer to the kid. The distance between them remains the same no matter how fast he flies. Primal Instinct already, Vegeta says? He couldn't contain his excitement. But even Vegeta had to pause and bring the baby back down from the skies when he saw a vision of the future. He sees the same thing we all saw. Vegeta sees the 16-year-old Carries just floating around in the infinite emptiness left behind by the death of the multiverse. Yo, Kakarot, I've got some bad news, Vegeta says, but before he could finish his sentence, the Grand Priest and Zalama show up. Indeed, the worst is yet to come. I'm afraid I can't allow you Saiyans any more autonomy, the Grand Priest declares. Now, Carries is rewatching his memories, but all he sees are memories of him playing around with Goku and Vegeta and Zykor watching them. However, things were a little different this time. The Grand Priest doesn't appear in his memories, but he's here and he plans on extinguishing Primal Instinct for good. Vegeta understands the Grand Priest's position, but he is way too prideful to just talk things out after what the Grand Priest just said. So now, as hopeless as it may seem, there's no other way around it. Vegeta has now found himself in a battle against the Grand Priest, but he takes that leap of faith and before we know it, Vegeta has transformed into the legendary Super Saiyan 5 again. And just like that, one of those paths that we mentioned earlier emerges for Carries to come to the present day. Unaware of the fact that the Grand Priest is on Sadala, Carries takes the path and pulls up to the scene. Now, neither Vegeta nor Goku, not even the Grand Priest, could have imagined what's about to happen next. The moment Carries steps into the present, the multiverse around them begins glitching. Just like how the multiverse got erased in the future, the same thing was about to happen in the present. The question is, will Vegeta or even the Grand Priest be able to stop the destruction of the multiverse in time? Or will it open up another wormhole of alternate timelines and universes? But maybe the most important question that I'm sure all of you guys have at this point in the story, what happened to future Goku and Vegeta? Incidentally, Carries have been looking into the past through his memories at this moment as well. When Vegeta decides to be difficult and transforms into Super Saiyan 5 to challenge the Grand Priest, a path emerges for the future carries to come to the present. He takes that plunge and with that, the same carries that had erased the multiverse in the future arrives in the present. And immediately, the entire multiverse starts to glitch. The same thing that happened in the future is about to happen in the present if nobody does something. Carries' very existence is a threat to the multiverse. Fortunately, the Grand Priest and Vegeta had already seen the worst of Primal Instinct thanks to the vision they had of the future. The moment Carries arrives, they immediately act. The Grand Priest traps him in a domain and detaches him from the multiverse while Vegeta enters his Primal Domain to help. That was a bit too close, Vegeta says as he exits the seal. See what I'm getting at, Vegeta? For this Saiyan, erasing the multiverse is as natural as breathing. We simply can't allow him to exist, the Grand Priest states. Vegeta stays quiet. He just looks at Carrie, not the one trapped in the domain, but the one he had been holding. He looks at baby Carries, and then he looks at the Carries trapped in the domain. It's small, minute even, but Vegeta notices a strange disconnect between these two. It's in the eyes. While baby Carries' eyes are just black, future Carries' eyes are void. They aren't just black, they were every color but almost no color at the same time. He hands the baby over to Goku, who then goes inside and hands him over to his dad, Zykor. Vegeta then asks the Grand Priest to allow him to enter the domain again. The Grand Priest obliges because he can just keep them trapped inside for all eternity if he wants. I mean, the problem will just solve itself. Heck, he even invites Goku to enter the domain along with Vegeta. I mean, that just knocks out half of these Saiyans. Vegeta wasn't so sure about this though, but it was too late. Goku had already made up his mind. Both Goku and Vegeta are teleported inside the domain where they meet and greet Carries. Vegeta and Super Saiyan 5 Goku, it's you guys, Carrie states. He was ecstatic. Who knows how long it had been since Carrie saw anyone, let alone another Saiyan with the same powers as him. We're talking about unimaginable, incomprehensible levels of loneliness. Tell us, Carries, what happened? How did you erase the multiverse, Vegeta asks. Honestly, I don't know. 
I'm not even sure if I was the one that did that. Everything was going fine. I was just exploring the universe. Then suddenly, poof, everything disappeared, Carrie's replies. Vegeta seems puzzled by this response. What's wrong, Vegeta? Goku asks. Nothing, just that unless I'm missing something, this just isn't how Primal Instinct works. You can mold anything however you want, bend reality even, but you can't erase anything. Therefore, this response doesn't really make sense to me, Vegeta replies. Hey, what if the multiverse didn't disappear after all? What if Carrie's accidentally created a new one where only he exists and nothing else, Goku sort of jokes around. Goku didn't think he'd take him serious at all, but his words leave Vegeta speechless. The Grand Priest and Zalama who were listening from outside were stunned as well. Yeah, but you saw the same thing happen just now, didn't you? If the Grand Priest hadn't trapped Carries when he did, the same thing surely would have happened to this multiverse, Vegeta argues. He was trying to see the logic in what Goku was saying. As for Carries, he was deep in thought, trying desperately to see if this is in fact what happened. The Grand Priest, on the other hand, approaches them along with Zalama. Goku, you've in fact made a good point, but what about the vision I experienced of the future? Why would it show me Carries' new multiverse and not the regular one, the Grand Priest asks. Well, maybe it's because of me. Thinking about it now, isn't the reason Carries came here also because I transformed? There's a direct path or link to the future, but it goes in two directions. Carries' his multiverse and the regular multiverse is like a fork in the road, Vegeta replies. You guys are forgetting that this is still all just speculation. Unless it's proven otherwise, Carries erased the multiverse, and we need to do something about this, Zalama adds. Meanwhile, Zykor and Kale are just trying not to panic. Their infant baby has been deemed a threat to the entire multiverse by the Grand Priest and Zalama. I don't know guys, I highly doubt Carries erased the multiverse by accident, Vegeta stresses. Don't forget Thanatos did something similar back during the early stages of the multiverse. He is the reason there ended up being 18 universes instead of just one universe like it was supposed to be, the Grand Prix states. I know, but that and this are different, and let's get one thing out of the way, Grand Priest. I'm not letting you kill Carries, Vegeta declares. Oh, killing him wouldn't be enough. I'll have to eliminate him from every timeline to ever exist. You don't understand the position you guys are in, Vegeta. I've decided to thoroughly cleanse the multiverse of any and all traces of Primal Instinct. We simply don't need that, the Grand Prix states. Well, how about asking Super Shinron to do that? I assure you, he can definitely make it impossible for any sentient being to ever use Primal Instinct, Zalama suggests. A rare suggestion indeed that probably could have stopped all of this when Thanatos did it the first time, the Grand Priest declares. But that's in the past now. Vegeta just stares at them both with a deadly look in his eyes, waiting for them to make whatever move they were going to make, while Goku is just a few meters away, chilling and kind of just looking at everybody confused. Why have you suddenly started looking so reassured, Grand Priest? I'm not letting Super Shenron do anything. It's Saiyan family business, so just buzz off, Vegeta states. I'm amazed you've managed to survive this long with such a big mouth, Vegeta. You truly are one of a kind, the Grand Priest adds. Whatever. You and your incompetence have never succeeded in mastering Primal Instinct, so don't talk to me like you're suddenly in charge here. The Saiyans are the first race in history to ever awaken the completed form, so just relax and let us figure this out, Vegeta replies. You guys think he's right about that or not? Vegeta's sounding a little unhinged here, I'm not gonna lie, but I mean, he's standing on business. Subsequently, Carries whispers in Goku's ear and asks him who this guy is arguing with Vegeta. Goku explains that he is an angel who serves the Omni King and he also happens to be one of the top 5 strongest fighters in the entire multiverse. Then he points to Zalama and mentions that that's the dragon god whose creations can grant just about anything you wish for. Carries was a little confused by this explanation as they just kinda sounded like fairy tale characters but I mean I guess at this point anything is possible. He interrupts Vegeta's arguing with the Grand Priest by using some really straightforward logic. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but if I really erase the multiverse, doesn't that mean I erased Mr. Grand Priest and the Omni King guy and also Mr. Zalama right here? Primal Instinct or not, think about it. Is it really possible for a 16 year old kid to just erase the primary authorities of the multiverse without even realizing it, Carrie states? The Grand Priest couldn't argue with that logic because doing that would mean accepting Carries as his superior. And if he does that, 
He would have no authority to tell Vegeta what to do. Vegeta, on the other hand, just laughs because he knows the Grand Prix will never accept being erased by a 16-year-old. Vegeta was damn near acting like Carries was his son at this point. All right, so let's just say Carries and Goku are right. There's still always the risk of primal instinct, and to be fair, I'd rather have a 16-year-old not have it just to be safe, Zalama adds. Vegeta goes up and pats him on the shoulder. I think you're forgetting somebody, Lord Zalama. It's not just a 16-year-old. There's also a one-year-old infant with the same powers as the first god of destruction who divided the multiverse into 18 different parts. So what are you suggesting now, the Grand Priest asks. If anything random were to happen, it would have already happened. Infants with infinite power are more dangerous than teenagers with infinite power. I'd say the multiverse is now a much safer place than before, considering how Primal Instinct is now complete, he says. Vegeta then walks up to Carries, looks him in the eye, and asks, Alright kid, tell me, what do you desire? You must have some strange, twisted wish in your heart that resulted in the creation of that other multiverse. Tell me about it. Carries is taken aback. He isn't sure how to answer at first. He even turns towards Goku, thinking that he may be able to give him some ideas, but one look at Goku's face and he knows he's all on his own. I think it's because I've never been able to go all out. The last time I sparred with you was five years ago, Vegeta. We couldn't go all out because I hadn't figured out how to master the primal instinct yet. Since then, there's always been this empty feeling of insecurity, I guess, in me. I want to go all out, but I'm always afraid that my powers would destroy the universe or something, and the way you guys are acting now, I'm even more scared. I even stopped turning into a Super Saiyan because of that fear, but I guess it makes sense now, right? My subconscious desire to go all out ended up creating a new multiverse where I can do that. I need not be afraid of anything, and thinking about it now, the reason I was able to come here is because I know that you would be the perfect opponent, Carries explains. There's nothing too fancy about his explanation, but it made sense. It makes perfect sense to everyone. The dots click within Vegeta's mind, and he rationalizes that the glitch they experienced must have been because Carries' multiverse was connecting to another multiverse. The Grand Priest was lost for words. This is preposterous, Zalama speaks. I, that might be an understatement. Either. Vegeta just grins and tells Carries that it's fine, he'll fight him, but Goku stops him and then does the unexplainable. During his travels, Goku continued gaining a better and more thorough understanding of his primal instinct while also using unusual techniques. One of these techniques is called Forced Energy Acquisition. This is when Goku asserts his own primal instinct upon something and then uses Forced Spirit Vision to acquire it. He does exactly that with Carries and uses Forced Energy Acquisition on it. Now, if they weren't in a domain completely detached from the rest of the multiverse, Universe 6 and the nearby universes would have trembled under this. But here, Goku would just casually transform into a Super Saiyan 5 and acquires all the primal instinct Vegeta injected carries with. What the heck just happened, Vegeta asks. The Grand Priest and Zalama just look at each other, just as confused as everyone else. While carries, on the other hand, had never felt more alive than right now. That weight, that curse had finally been lifted off of his shoulders, and he can now challenge just about anyone and get stronger the normal way. Meanwhile, Goku? You see, Vegeta? You were wrong. By giving Carries that much power, you stole his birthright, that of growth. I've been a Super Saiyan 5 for a while now, too, and freeing Carries was my plan all along. We shouldn't want this for him, Goku says, while signaling the Grand Priest to undo the domain. All right, Vegeta. How about it? Go and use the same technique I used, but on baby carries. Get those chaotic powers away from him. Do that, and I'll take you on. Let's do it, Vegeta. You and me, one on one, just like old times, Goku declares. Vegeta couldn't believe what he was hearing. He just burst into laughter. You are honestly the best, Kakarot. This is gonna be the greatest fight in history. Let's do it. Vegeta heard Goku just challenge him to a one-on-one -on -one after absorbing future carries as primal powers, he starts laughing. You're the best, Kakarot. This is gonna be the greatest fight in the history of the multiverse, he says. Yeah, but don't call it the best. I'm sure there will still be bigger and better fights in the future. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it, Goku replies. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, whatever. Let me just go and free the baby, Vegeta says. 
He then goes inside the domain, casually uses forced energy acquisition on baby carries, and with that, there are no more babies or teenagers running around with the most chaotic power in the universe. Zykor just burst out crying because his child can now live a normal life. Vegeta realizes that he probably shouldn't mention future carries. He lets the family be and comes back outside. It's only been a year or two since he became friends with Zykor. Thinking back, Zykor had to deal with non-existence for over 1,000 years also because of primal instinct. Goku is in the right. It would have been cruel to let Carries continue on with primal instinct. After all, if he wants, he can always just learn it himself in the future. Future Carries then begins to disappear and the multiverse he had created begins to disappear as well. He was now going to go back to his timeline and just continue with his life. Only this time, he can challenge whomever he wants and whenever he wants without the fear of wiping out the whole multiverse. Goku and Vegeta bid him farewell. The Grand Priest and Zalama were still there, ready to continue the discussion about removing all traces of Primal Instinct by asking Super Shenron, but Goku and Vegeta were clear as day not in the mood right now. They ignore the Grand Priest and just casually enter that Shadow Realm-like domain. For the sake of context, the Shadow Realm that I keep talking about is the Shadow of the Multiverse. It can only be accessed by those who have fully mastered Primal Instinct and throughout the entire history of the multiverse and beyond, the only two men who have successfully done that are Goku and Vegeta at this point. Both of them know that this battle is going to be unlike anything that has ever happened before. I've been waiting for this, Kakarot. It was getting lonely out here in the Shadow Realm, Vegeta says as he plunges forward to throw the first punch, but Goku dodges it effortlessly by manipulating gravity. Wow, this is really amazing. There really is no limit to how we can fight, Goku states. He then imagines a thousand clones of himself and in an instant, they materialize in front of Vegeta. Every single one of them is about as powerful as he is. They all rush towards Vegeta. It is no longer a one-on-one, -on -one. it was almost like a 1,000 on one right now. Still, Vegeta just grins and accepts the challenge. With a wave of his hand, he reverses time for the clones and reduces them to mere after images that fade away while attempting to get closer to him. He then jumps forward and lands a powerful blow that sends him spiraling through the distorted space. Come on, is that the best you can do, Vegeta adds? Goku stabilizes himself and grins. Well, let's see you handle this then, he states before imagining a literal black hole in the palm of his hand. He then makes it start spinning rapidly in multiple directions in order to contain the black hole into this raging, spherical, shuriken-like shape. Alright, you guys caught me. I like Naruto, okay? Sue me, sorry. But what does Vegeta do now? He counters it by manifesting a barrier of pure energy. It not only stops the raging black hole Rasengan thing, but also gets his pull reversed, which sends it right back at Goku. Really thought you did something there, huh, Kakarot? Vegeta laughs. Now the black hole Rasengan Spear of Destruction thing was flying right at him. Goku would never back down, not even from an attack like this though, as he concentrates all the forces of the multiverse that he has control over onto the black hole. It inadvertently turns it into a supernova and just implodes in on itself. The explosion was intense, it lit up the entire outer multiverse. But Goku and Vegeta were still just floating there laughing. As expected, I guess we're still evenly matched, Vegeta says. Yeah, but I still don't plan on losing, Vegeta, so give me your worst, Goku replies. Alright, you asked for it, Vegeta states as he cracks his knuckles. He prepares an energy blast made from the very core of a dying star. Vegeta smirks as he just hurls it towards Goku. From the looks of it, it appears to be a normal energy blast, but Goku then finds himself being pulled in by his gravitational force. He tries to get away, but it's honestly still a struggle even for him. A uh, nice one, Vegeta, he says. He then tries to come up with some kind of way to get away from this gravitational pull. Now, I'm not going to BS you guys and make it seem like Goku knows the first thing about science, so we're just going to say he uses his key to construct strings and then crafts them into a fishnet to catch the approaching energy blast. He catches them and then just swings it back at Vegeta. Vegeta creates a shield of his own though made up of his condensed key and then blocks the energy blast with it. The moment it comes into contact with the shield, the energy blast dissolves and turns into stardust sparkles. He then looks at Goku, but he was no longer in front of him. Vegeta turns around. It was Goku. 
He throws a punch intended to hit his face but just before it lands. Goku would almost construct a time loop and this causes his punch to land infinite amount of times in just a fraction of a second. Unfortunately for Vegeta, the impact is magnified with every punch landed. Vegeta would then instinctively do the only thing he can do in this situation and that's warp the reality around himself into infinity. This causes each punch that gets launched at Vegeta to slow down the more they approach him until finally they all become so slow that they may as well just never reach him and if you guys watch JJK then you know how this works. Goku's movements had slowed down and so Vegeta used this opportunity to land a kick of his own to Goku's gut. It gives him an instant yet destructive shock to his entire system. Well, you really made that one count, huh? Goku says as he grabs his stomach. Try not to shit yourself in my presence, Kakarot. It's pretty unbecoming of you, Vegeta says laughing. Meanwhile, Trunks and Goten are seen training with Oob on a remote island in the Pacific and they were hard at work. Especially Trunks, he had been hard at training for like a year straight now. Unlike Goten, Trunks had seen baby carries. He knows that if he slacks off and gives an inch, he's gonna get surpassed. Later, all three of them challenge Broly who beats them to smithereens but also gives them practical advice on how to get stronger. Gohan was still with his family but every night before going to bed he did image training on what he would do and how he would fight if an enemy even stronger than a completed Cell Max were to appear. He may be just relaxing with his family and focusing on his career but this isn't GT Gohan at all, he is not slacking off here. And about 15 years into the future, 16 year old Carries would visit Earth after returning from the past. He's come to challenge Goku or Vegeta or any of the other Z fighters for that matter. The first one to notice him is actually Trunks. Hey, you're Carries, right? Welcome to Earth, Trunks says, and he was now a married man. Hey, thanks, it's good to be here, Carries replies. Trunks then takes him to the lookout where he introduces him to Piccolo as Kale and Zykor's son. When Carries asks about Goku or Vegeta, Trunks explains that they've been in Universe 1 for the past two years. Carries realizes that his dad is there too, so he replies, guess we should also go there. Easy for you to say, I don't know instant transmission, Trunks replies. Alright, forget about them. What do you say to a fight, Carries asks. Of course, I was wondering when you'd mention something like that, let's do it, Trunks states. Carries and Trunks find somewhere empty and they both transform into Super Saiyans, then engage in an epic duel of their own. After they're done with their sparring, Trunks would ask him about Prince Sadala. Oh, he's a king now, you know? He's also a Super Saiyan 4, Carries replies. Well, I'm a Super Saiyan 4 too, Trunks smirks. Ah, uh, whatever, I'll get there eventually, Carries replies. By the way, where's Broly? Honestly, I don't know. He said something about going on a journey of enlightenment and left like three or so years ago. He's probably out there somewhere doing something silly. It's not like there's too many people out there that can actually fight him, Trunks replies. They continue their chit chat, but when Goten hears about Carrie's arrival, he gets Oob and they come straight over. They were working on Oob's farm at the time. Trunks introduces Carrie's to Goten and Oob and all four of them spend the rest of the day just laughing and hanging out. Now going back 15 years into the past, let's kind of resume Goku and Vegeta's fight in the Outer Shadow Realm Multiverse. By this point in the battle, they both ditched the gimmicks and have gone back to just exchanging blows. Their energy has charged up to unimaginable levels and their auras are intense enough to constantly change the visible appearance of the Shadow Realm. They release their energy and charge straight at each other and then finally, as their fists meet, a light envelops the Shadow Realm and beyond, almost as if that punch shattered the boundaries of the universe. Before they realize it, they're already back outside. The Grand Priest and Zalama were still there for some reason though. Excuse me, can I do something for you, Vegeta asks. Come on Vegeta, don't be such a bad sport, Goku says. The Grand Priest notices how laid back the two of them are despite fighting each other in the outer multiverse nicknamed the Shadow Realm, so he decides to finally just take his lead. As long as Primal Instinct is under control, the Grand Priest will concede that maybe there is nothing to worry about anymore. Though on their way back to Zeno's palace, Zalama does ask the Grand Priest why he's been so lenient with the Saiyans. I guess you could say they've grown on me. I don't mind competence and Vegeta is the most competent mortal I've seen in an absurdly long time, the Grand Priest replies. As for Goku and Vegeta themselves though, well let's go back to them. I see we both had the same idea, Vegeta says. 
Yeah, it's better this way. Let's not get too many people involved, Goku replies. During their last clash, which resulted in them returning back outside, both Goku and Vegeta decided to just seal Primal Instinct within the Shadow Realm. Now, even though they can enter the Shadow Realm whenever they want, they can't use Primal Instinct unless they are physically in the outer layer of the multiverse, and this rule applies to everyone, not just them. From this point on, Primal Instinct stopped being a threat and only existed in the Shadow Realm. Now it's just another form of universal martial arts for these two. What should we do next, Vegeta? Goku asks. I think I'm just gonna go home and take a shower, honestly, Vegeta replies. Yeah, good idea. Oh, I got it. Let's gather up everyone and do a barbecue. These past couple of years have been intense for everyone, Goku suggests. Well, it is my daughter's birthday in three days, so let's just do it then, Vegeta replies. Goku gives him a big thumbs up, and the two of them then use instant transmission to get back home. It's been two years since Goku came up with the idea of wishing their tails back, and two years is all it took these Saiyans to achieve the most impossible feats in multiversal history. And nobody can take that away from Goku and Vegeta. 